good morning to all of you good morning to arnold professor good morning good morning okay thank you good morning again sir good morning ah uh, okay thank you thank you good morning Good morning, Barry. Morning. <coughs> morning, Professor Thomas. Yes, thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good mo good morning Professor. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Satish. Good morning. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning to all. Yes, now, good morning. Yeah. Now let us start the session. Anjana, yes, sir. Yeah, please introduce the chair and uh, thereby support him for further uh, process of the session. Sure, sir. Good day to all. We shall move on to the eleventh technical session of WSTA twenty twenty three. That will be chaired by Professor P. Yagin Thomas. Now, Professor Yagin Thomas is a distinguished faculty member at the Department of Statistics, a University of Kerala, who has been recognized for his remarkable contributions to the field. He was honored with the prestigious title of Emata Scientist by the Kerala State Council for Science, Technology and Environment from 2016 to 2019 and Professor Emata in 2013. Yagin Sir has amassed over 1,000 citations and 350 research publications to his credit including estimation of a parameter of Morgenstern type by varied exponential distribution by ranked set sampling and estimation of a location and scale parameters of a U-shaped distribution. In all our pursuits, Yakin Sir has offered his unwavering support and so it is my utmost delight and honor to extend a warm invitation to your professor to chair the session. So without further ado, over to you, sir. Welcome, professor. Good morning to all of you. We are uh, entering into uh, session number uh, five of the invited uh, uh, keynote address. And uh, we are having today a universal leader in statistical research, especially distribution theory, Professor Barry C. Arnold of University of California Riverside, USA. We have constant uh, association with the Professor B uh, Arnold in terms of, uh, uh, say, his association with our conferences as well as academic, uh, uh, say, uh, interaction with uh, his books and his communications in various contributions. So, I invite Professor Paris Arnold to deliver his keynote address and he will be talking on bivariate distributions with equidispersed normal conditionals and related models. It will be an interesting topic. I request Professor Paris Arnold to present his talk. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Satish, to, for inviting me. I, I was I always enjoy uh, visiting Kerala, even if it's only uh, online. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be. Uh, I, it occurred to me when I wrote down my address here 
I always think people know what UC stands for, and fortunately, uh, who's read out as University of California, but I should spell it out because there are lots of UCs around the world. Uh, but my hometown is, uh, or my home university is in Riverside, California. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of things that uh, may, be, uh, may be new to you, uh, and, but they may not be. We're going to talk about uh, equ equidispersed distributions. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm also going to talk about distributions which are conditionally specified, and I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. Uh, and uh, so let's let's get in there, and we'll start out with a review of the idea of this is uh, your campus, I believe, if I, unless I messed up. Uh, since I didn't give credit to the person who took the picture, I, I can't I can't really be sure that I have the right one. This is a, a view of my home from my hometown to show you that even in the summer you can see snow-capped mountains on on the right day. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, if we disperse variables and. Uh, uh, it just means that the mean is equal to the variance. Uh, the one that you all know about the most of this type is the uh, Poisson distribution. Uh, same thing happens for uh, an exponential distribution. Uh, however, there's a, a, a less known uh, collection of uh, equidispersed models that consist of normal densities, which have means equal to their variances. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, that forms a nice one parameter exponential family it's one of the things that people use as examples in their lectures when they're introducing exponential families as sort of a surprise uh, of uh, putting a restraint on, a, on the usual normal model and coming up with an, a nice exponential family as a consequence. Professor? We'll talk about that one. Yeah. Uh, whether the, we have moved the uh, slides? Pardon? Probably you are moving, but it is not moving slides, uh, which is the first slide itself. Your slides are not moving, Barry. Your not moving, I'm moving them back. Moving. Yeah, well, I don't know what to do about that. You are still uh, on the very first slide, not on the picture that you showed us. It's only appearing in the panel. Yeah. Now you're, yeah, now we're getting the second slide. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now it is fine. Will that work? That, that'll work it's better for you. Okay. I, it okay. It's not the best, but it'll work, right? Okay, so I was halfway through this one, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, distributional features of uh, models, which ex ex equidispersed models. We're also going to talk about uh, conditionally specified models. And I, I'll start off by asking you, uh, why am I the person consider conditional specification? And, and here's the little storyline. Suppose that you were trying to model the joint distribution of heights and weights of students in your university. Well, you might very well think that for a given uh, weight, the distribution of height should be more or less bell-shaped, and you also might even think that it might be normal with a mean and variance that might depend upon the weight. Also, the weights for given heights, they should be bell-shaped and probably uh, maybe normal, approximately normal with, with the means and variances that depend upon uh, the particular height. Uh, but what about the distribution of height plus weight? Well, that's hard to figure out. But remember, if you were to, to assume a classical bivariate normal model for this thing, you would have a couple of things going. You'd have normal marginals. You'd have normal conditionals. And the next thing that you would have is that you would have uh, linear combinations of the coordinates would be normally distributed. And that's hard to figure out. Do you really think that if you took your students and measured their height in centimeters and added to that their weight in kilograms, that those numbers would be normally distributed or that you even have any idea what they should look like. So maybe you should just stick with making assumptions about the conditional distributions. Okay. And so uh, um, the, uh, what we're going to do is review conditional specification results and, uh, um, and they're going to be models which are based solely upon the assumption that you n know something about the conditional distribution of X given Y for every Y and the distribution of y given x for every x, okay? Now, the first example of this is essentially was given by Anil Bhattacharya in 1943. And, and Bhattacharya is an interesting person. I'm sure a lot of you uh, probably now, uh, the number of people who interacted with him is, is getting smaller because he was a, a famous teacher 
at Calcutta University, I think, and maybe at Presidential College for many, many years. He started off as a hotshot researcher in, in the early 40s and produced some very creative uh, contributions. Uh, and, uh, and then suddenly he sort of turned off and became a teacher. And he only occasionally published papers after that. But he was in, active as a teacher for decades afterwards and was very well respected. But he, he actually came up with a distribution which actually was the normal conditionals distribution, but he was actually looking, trying to find out what conditions in addition to normal conditionals would you, must you add in order to make sure you have a classical normal model. And she, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested just in, this, in the case that we should ask for normal conditionals and no, nothing else. Okay, here's a picture of Anil, okay? And if you want to know more about conditional specification, uh, I'm a book salesman. Here's a book you should buy, should buy published in 1999 uh, by, by my co-authors Enrique Castillo and Jose Maria Sarabia. And uh, it has uh, uh, more, I mean, more information than you probably want. Uh, it's getting a little old now. It's, it's uh, probably 24 years old, but it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of important results in there. Okay, now... One of the things you have to ask before you start modeling things by just looking at conditionals, you have to add, face up with the question, suppose that I give you the density f of x given y and also of y given x, you have to ask yourself, are they compatible? Does there really exist any joint density that will have them as, their, as its conditionals? Well, it turns out that uh, it's certainly not always true, okay? And uh, it's... Uh, this is kind of awkward here. The key question is effectively, you can show that this will work if and only if you can take the ratio of those two conditional densities, and if it factors into a function of x and a function of y, then they are compatible and there will be a joint density function uh, with them as its conditionals. And in fact, one of these marginals, one of these gx's or h of y's will be one of the appropriate marginals. Uh, I guess it would be h of y would be the appropriate marginal. But... Uh, um, the, uh, and there, there's uh, technical details, and some people think that you need some more assumptions, but the basic idea is that if you have this thing, this ratio factoring for all X's and Y's that are in the, the joint support set, uh, then this is the condition that you need. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, what about uniqueness? Okay, well, okay, so we've decided we looked at these two conditional densities or two families of conditional densities. We've decided by looking at their ratio that, yes, indeed, there will be a distribution with them as its conditionals. Uh, could there be different distributions that have the same conditionals? Well, it can happen. And there's a famous example, which I'll draw a picture of here, that's due to uh, two economists, I believe they're economists, Guerrero and Montfort. And you're looking at a picture of the density function, but it's sort of sticking out at you. Uh, it's a density function that's defined on the on the full uh, two-dimensional plane, and it takes on the value one half in this u in this square, and takes on the value one half in this square. This square has coordinates minus one to zero, etc. And you can see by the area of these two that the integral of this function is going to be one. It's a valid joint density function. Let's look at this and see what kind of conditional distributions we have. If we choose a value of x that's between 0 and 1 right here, the conditional distribution of y is going to be uniform, okay, between 0 and 1. If you choose an x that's between minus 1 and 0, then the distribution of y is going to be uniform, but now between minus 1 and 0, okay? And the other di distributions go that way. Okay, so this thing has uniform conditionals of a special kind. But... Look at that picture and change it a little bit. Replace the one half by a number alpha that's between zero and one. And the half one here has to be replaced by a one minus alpha. And after you've done that, the integral of this joint density remains one. It's a valid density. And it's different from the one we have here. But lo and behold, because this thing is constant throughout the square being equal to alpha, the conditional densities are just exactly the same as they were before. And the same thing happens down here. So, in fact, what we have is an index family of joint density functions indexed by the choice of alpha, and they all have the same family of, of conditionals. Now, it turns out that the, the trick for, for making this work 
is thinking about a related Markov chain. If you think about the way that people sometimes simulate uh, observations from a joint density by taking a, va a value of x and then simulating a y given x and then an x given y, that develops a Markov chain. And if that Markov chain is irreducible, then indeed we, we have uh, a, a uniqueness situation. And you can see in this picture that if you started out with x's that are, that are positive, the y would be positive, and then the next x you generate would be positive. You always have positive values. Whereas if you started with a negative x, the corresponding y would be negative, and the next x would be negative. So this kind of give sampler result uh, would effectively it would converge, but it's, it gives you, but it's not a, not a it's a it's a reducible Markov chain, and so that's why there's more than one answer to that question. The, you need to think about that for a little while to make sure that uh, you understand. The relationship it has with with the Gibbs sampler, but it's it's pretty straightforward. Okay, well let's look at the uh, uh, normal conditional density, uh, and as it's as it turns out, and this really is the density that that Bhattacharya came up with, although his notation was different, uh, and uh, it's written this way. These are, this is a matrix of constants, which are the parameters, except the a zero zero here is a normalizing constant that's chosen, that's a function of all the other AIJs chosen to make sure that this thing integrates to one. So it's actually an eight parameter family of joint densities of X and Y. And you can figure out what the minimal sufficient statistics are. They're the sum of the X's, the sum of the X squareds, the sum of the X Y's, the sum of the X squared Y's, the whole bunch of those minimal, so there's eight of those things. Now. You can prove using functional equations that this is the only collection of joint density functions which have all their conditionals normal. It turns out that that family has very restricted forms for the conditional means and variances. We said that we knew that we were going to have the distribution of X given Y would have a variance and a mean that depends upon the value of Y. Well, this is the formulas. Now, that's a little more complicated. And I wish I had this picture uh, larger, uh, I guess I can, so you can see it all uh, from the current slide. Uh, and let's just see what, there, now you can see the whole thing, okay? And then we'll escape and go back down to that. Okay, well, you can see now, I, while I have this up here, let's think about the situation where we want to have these conditional distributions to, to be equivariant. In other words, to have the <laughs> conditional mean of X given Y the same as the conditional variance. So these two things must be equal. As you can see, for those two to be equal, A12 must be 0, A11 must be 0, and A10 must be 1. That's three constraints on the A's. And down here, for the uh, Y and X, the variance of the mean of Y given X and the mean of and the variance of Y given X, for them to be equal, we now have a constraint that says A21 and A11 must be 0 and A10 must be one. And it turns out there are five constraints that must be satisfied uh, in order to have the kind of uh, condition, the equivariant conditionals, okay? Now, the, the, the full normal conditionals density can have uh, eight parameters, but they do have to satisfy some constraints here. There are two of them, and they're, they're different. Model B, which corresponds to the case where A22 is zero. A22 is the coefficient of the term x squared, y squared, and that doesn't appear in a bivariate normal, a classical bivariate normal. So so this, these constraints, these four AIs, or these three AIs do not appear in a classical normal model. Uh, the variances have to be positive, et cetera. So well, included in here is the classical bivariate normal model. But up here, if H22 happens to be positive, you get a different kind of distribution, which is different from the normal. It does have normal conditionals, but is not the same as the classical normal model. Okay, so let's uh, uh, go down here a little bit and see what some of these things look like. Uh, this is uh, an example of a distribution which has uh, normal conditionals, but is not a classical or normal. Look at these uh, contours, and they don't look elliptical at all. Uh, they look kind of strange shaped. Uh, uh, look kind of like an axe head or something, but uh, definitely not normal. And then uh, looking further over here, uh, here's another family. 
Uh, no, okay, here's another family that, that's a surprise. Uh, with these normal conditionals, their regression functions are no longer straight lines. In fact, uh, Bhattacharya noted that if you had normal conditionals and if you had linear regressions, then you had a classical normal model. Okay, so that was one of the observations that he made back in 1943. Uh, but in, in the more general model, Model A, remember, uh, we're going to have a situation where uh, the, the regression lines are curved, and as a consequence, they can cross more than once. And when they cross, that's going to be a location of a mode. And so what we have here is a situation where we have a bimodal density function. You can see it over in this side picture. It looks kind of like a, 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 a Halloween mask or something, uh, or a pair of sunglasses with, uh, with light shades or something. But definitely not, but bimodal, okay? Now, it turns out you can actually have three modes, uh, but it's hard to draw pictures of them because when that happens, two of the modes are big and one of them is tiny. So it's like two mountains and a molehill. And uh, that's, you know, that's, the, in general, most data sets will be modeled by a, normal conditional distribution with it that is indeed unimodal. Okay, now I'll just mention the fact that uh, you can also look, you don't just have to look at distributions which have normal conditionals. Uh, in a little paper that uh, David Strauss and I wrote a long time ago, uh, we can do the same kind of thing and can identify all families of bivariate densities that have conditional densities of Y given X in a particular exponential family and the conditional densities of X given Y in a different, probably, exponential family. So I could look at situations where I had uh, uh, normal marginals of Y given X, and the distribution of X given Y could be multinomial, okay? Because they're both exponential families. And, uh, and in fact, I can uh, find some examples in the literature uh, where people have studied those things. Even find some examples in the literature where people have studied things that where they assumed that kind of thing, but didn't check on compatibility, and yet managed to to get results and publish papers on on models that don't exist. I always found that as one of the fascinating stories in in statistical history. Uh, now let's switch over. Then we won't. We we certainly could. We could directly look at the family since we know that the family of equidispersed normal distributions is a one parameter exponential family. We could use this result to write down the joint density, which would be a, a three-parameter exponential family. But we'll do it another way. What we're going to do, first of all, is re regress and, and think a little bit again about the uh, uh, equidispersion, okay, and what it means uh, effectively. Okay, the, the idea of equidispersion is the mean must be equal to the variance, okay? And uh, in the case of normal densities, if you have a normal density and you want it to be equidispersed, then the mean must be equal to the variance. Let, we'll use tau to denote the common value, which is, has a positive quantity, it must be. And the density, of course, is obtained by just replacing the mu by tau and replacing it sigma squared by tau also. And you look at this, it does not look necessarily like a, an exponential family or one parameter exponential family, but all you've got to do is expand this quadratic and it comes down to this expression and you can see in this expression, there's a function of tau alone, which is all of this, times a function of x alone, and then exponential, a function of x times a function of tau. That's a perfect description of a one parameter exponential family. And in this particular case, you can identify what the uh, minimum sufficient statistic is. If you had a sample from it, it would just be the sum of the xi squareds. Okay, so that's uh, a, uh, a result that we have. Uh, now, since equidispersion is a submodel of the classical normal model, it's natural to suggest to test for its applicability before using it. There is a standard testing procedure that you can apply uh, uh, where you just estimate mu and sigma squared in for the normal sample with the usual estimates x bar and s squared, basically. And then for the equidis equidispersed model, uh, we're going to have. Uh, the likelihood function looks like this, which is, you know, obtained by just differentiating with respect to tau the sample, the, the likelihood function of a sample. And that's equivalent to a nice little quadratic equation. And as a consequence, you can actually write down an analytic expression for the maximum likelihood estimate of this equidispersed normal uh, sample. So 
You have to look at that for a second. You have to squint at that for a second to make sure that you believe this expression uh, is bigger than a half. And of course it is because it's one quarter plus a positive term. And you take the square root of something bigger than a quarter, it's bigger than a half. So yes, this does give us t tau is t tau hat is taking on a value that's appropriate for this parameter. <clears throat> okay, and of course, what we will do then to check for equidispersion, we'll just look at the uh, uh, the ratio here, a standard likelihood ratio test, rejecting the hypothesis if it's small. So that's standard stuff. Uh, the uh, now. Let's go back to consider bivariate distributions, which have equidispersed normal conditionals. What we could do is we could use the Arnold Strauss result and, and say that it's a three parameter exponential family of densities. And I could write down what it was very easily. But instead of going that route, we're going to look at what we did before. We're just going to look at this family with its conditional densities given by this. Okay. And we saw the conditions that we must have in order to this to be equidispersed, you know, A12 must be zero because this has to be equal to this one. So we had five constraints. And when we were finished, we ended up with uh, uh, these five conditions that must be satisfied by the AIJs in order to have an equidispersed, a distribution with equidispersed normal conditions. Okay. Now, what we're going to do with that is we're going to change uh, the parameters and replace them by uh, the remaining parameters are, uh, uh, you can just see them there here. I'm gonna have to go to, um, I wanna look at this one. And I'm gonna do a, from the current slide. And you can see the three parameters are we introduce parameters alpha, beta, and gamma to be the parameters. Oh, I did that. You can't see that because I can't move it here. Escape. This is frustrating. Uh, anyway, after we reparameterize, our X -S equidispersed model looks like this. Okay, it's the joint density function. This is equidispersed normal conditional density. It's got three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma. Turns out alpha must be positive, beta must be positive, and gamma can be must be non-negative. If gamma is equal to zero, then this becomes just a classical normal distribution, equidispersed normal distributions with, that are independent. So that's not a very interesting one. But we can write down what the mean, what the means and the variances, uh, conditional means and variances of this of this uh, uh, distribution uh, without any trouble. Okay. Now. Uh, Okay, we mentioned the parametric constraints. Here's a picture of a density which has uh, a dependent density which has uh, equidispersed normal conditionals. And then uh, one thing that, and if this, if we look at the contours of it, you can see that these are not. It's not elliptical. Uh, you have to look at it a session, but it's kind of this tails off a little further on the to the right than to the left. So it's asymmetric. Okay, uh, as we explained because it was only if gamma was equal to zero. Gamma in this case is five. If gamma was zero, it would be independent. And here is the uh, uh, the independent normal. And this is just a bivariate normal distribution with equidispersed marginals that are independent. That's not very interesting. Uh, but uh, there's a possibility we saw that the full mo uh, normal conditional density can have more than one mo mode now, although the single mode is most common, well, the same thing can happen with these equidispersed normal conditional densities. You can get one more than one mode, and here's an example. So just as in the case of the more general model, they can be bimodal. But notice, to get bimodality, you have to pick rather unusual values for the parameters. They have to be very small, 0 0.01, or 0 0.1, 0 0.09, and uh, 0.12. Uh, with those choices, you can get by modality, but uh, it's unusual. And there's the, uh, you can see that the uh, contours of that distribution have this rather unusual boomerang shape uh, that we saw in the more general model. Okay, the marginal densities we can work out, they're not that pretty, uh, but they, but I put them down here to, to convince you that they definitely are not normal marginals. So if you're in the situation with uh, equidispersed normal conditionals 
but they're dependent and the marginals are not normal in any sense. They have this all, uh, rather awkward thing in there. Uh, the marginal densities are asymmetric, except in the case of independence, uh, but they, uh, they often don't look wild, wild, wildly asymmetric because if we draw some pictures of them, which you probably can't see, uh, they look very, they're, they're just, you can tell the tails are different. They're asymmetric, uh, but they, they sort of want to be bell-shaped if they could, if they just, if you didn't look at the tails. Uh, so now what about maximum likelihood estimation for the, uh, for, for bivariate equidispersed normal conditional distribution? Suppose you have a sample from this distribution with the parameters that we had before, okay, alpha positive, beta positive, and gamma non-negative. And suppose you want to use that sample to estimate the parameters alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay. Well, uh, the uh, the density function that you're looking at, uh, okay, uh, if this density function, you have to pay attention to this because uh, there's a proportionality sign there. And that hides the fact that there was a normalizing constant, and the joint density really should involve that normalizing constant. Okay, and it should it should not be a normal it should not be ignored. You can figure out what that normalizing constant looks like uh, by just integrating that expression. But that integration has to be done numerically. That's not a nice thing to integrate. And then the joint density function, which 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 will be used to construct the likelihood, involves this. Kappa function, alpha, beta, gamma. And, and if there's a sample of size n, we're going to have kappa to the nth power. But this means that when you're done doing perhaps a search of the joint likelihood, uh, you're going to have to, every time you look at a different value of alpha, beta, and gamma, you're going to have to recompute this kappa function. Okay. And so it makes for a very, uh, what should we say, a very complicated uh, and slow uh, optimization procedure. It can be done, but it's uh, it's not that great. Okay. Uh, so this was what the, the likelihood looked like, but you'll notice that the likelihood function involves this kappa function, multiply, log kappa function multiplied by n. And uh, although it's, it has to be done numerically, uh, but, and, and we've done some examples of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. If you, if you like to do, to, to write, Write rather uh, complicated programs, or uh, from my judgment, complicated programs, you can get maximum likelihood estimates out of it. But there's another way uh, to do this, uh, and that's using a concept known as pseudo likelihood estimation. Okay. Now, pseudo likelihood estimation uh, dates back to uh, the idea that you could. Uh, Instead of maximizing the likelihood function, you could consider something called the pseudo likelihood function. This can be quite general. We have a, a function, a bunch of data with a model that depends upon theta. What you can do is you can figure out what are the conditional densities of x given y and the conditional density of y given x at each of the observed points, the xi's and y's, and multiply all of these, including y given x and x given y, and you get this function. And the, the logic is, but if you choose values of the parameters that maximize the pseudo likelihood, they should be pretty good uh, estimates. The logic being that if you have some values of theta for which the pseudo likelihood function is small, then that suggests that at least some of the conditional densities of x given y, the pairings, are unlikely. And so your data, and, and so you, you uh, just like maximum likelihood effectively, if the likelihood is small, it means that some of the observations had very small light probability of occurring given that particular value of theta. So that value of theta seems to be suspect. And the same thing happens here. Now, you can prove that pseudo likelihood estimation is, is a valid approach. Uh, you can even figure out what the asymptotic theory associated with it. And what you can, can conclude is that we have asymptotically consistent, uh, asymptotically normal, uh, estimates that result from pseudo likelihood estimation. Uh, they're not as efficient as maximum likelihood estimation, but I would argue that since maximum likelihood in this particular case is going to be very uh, cumbersome, we probably would want to try pseudo likelihood uh, as, as a uh, 
an alternative, even though we're sacrificing some efficiency. Okay, let's go back and look at our pseudo likelihood function for the equidispersed normal conditionals model. If we write it down, it's not so bad. Remember that the likelihood function involved that unfriendly function kappa of alpha, beta, and gamma, which we were going to have to evaluate numerically. But this pseudo likelihood function is really not so bad. And we can attack this one by just differentiating with respect to alpha, beta, and gamma to obtain pseudo likelihood equations, okay, that are uh, like so. And they are very nice equations because, for example, let's look at this one at the top. If you knew what gamma was, uh, if you knew what alpha was, then the left-hand side is going to be, let's see, which way does it work? Yeah, the left-hand side is going to be a monotone function of gamma. So that one, so you can do, do sort of a, a uh, iterative scheme. You can pick values for alpha, beta, and then solve for gamma using this equation, and then take values of alpha and ga uh, of gamma to solve for beta with this equation, and then finally take values of alpha and beta and solve for gamma with this equation. So, so circulating through, you can get a solution for this, which is pushed out very nicely, and it's not hard uh, to do. And so if you want to do a likelihood ratio test uh, for, uh, oops, what's going on here? Likelihood ratio test for, for bivariate equity dispersed normal conditionals. Well, what you could do, it, as you can't see what I'm doing. Oh, somebody said something, but. Okay, uh, well, because we're going to be dealing with pseudo-normal or pseudo-likelihood equations and pseudo-likelihood estimates, then you could treat them, you could construct a, a, an analog to a likelihood ratio test where you look at pseudo-likelihood estimates instead of likelihood estimates. And, and it generally doesn't lead you astray, but it's, but it's a little bit uh, unreliable. Uh, what we did was we simulated some the behavior of the maximum likelihood estimates and the pseudo maximum likelihood estimates for various choices of the parameters. And in the end, we discovered that, that, that they were pretty good, both of them. Uh, and uh, there wasn't that much difference between the two. And as the sample size gets larger, both in both cases, we end up uh, with very good estimates you uh, using the pseudo likelihood estimate or using the maximum likelihood estimate. So we, we would we would think that they they can be defended in that sense. Uh, if you uh, as you as you increase the sample size, the estimates become more precise, which is what you expect, and the corresponding pseudo likelihood estimates behave in a similar fashion. And uh, and the we recommend that the standard errors are a little bit worse for the pseudo likelihood estimates. But what we would recommend a person to do, because we realize that most people don't want to use pseudo likelihood estimates. They, they recognize that if you do that, you have sold out. You have d agreed to use inefficient estimates, and that doesn't really make sense. You don't want to do that. So what we would recommend you would do is to construct or compute the pseudo maximum likelihood estimates quickly, which they're easy to do. But take them not as the final answer, but use them as the initial values for a numerical search to find the maximum likelihood estimates. It helps when you're searching for the maximum likelihood estimates to start in the right neighborhood, and this approach will, will help you do that. So we think that's a, a very a very sensible use for pseudo likelihood estimates in this case, and in fact in, in many practical situations where the likelihood function is particularly unfriendly, where but the pseudo likelihood function is is much nicer. Then we could still we could also use it uh, to figure out where to start our search for maximum likelihood estimates. Well, let's look at a couple of data sets. Uh, um, if you were trying to uh, get some journal to look at at results at this time, they would they would definitely say, "Where's the data?" Well, we'll try a, a set of data that we found. Uh, my co-author, I didn't mention this, is, is uh, B.J. Man Manjunath, who is from Hyderabad. And uh, so uh, he's, a, he's the guy that uh, did some, a lot of the computations are, are, are his. And, uh, and so I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the, uh, the, we're going to look at some data on wines and the quality of wine uh, that uh, is uh, available. And 
Okay, and so what we did, we have a couple of measurements, uh, uronic acids and hue, two measurements, uh, one is the color and one is the amount of a certain acid. And we have a scatter plot of the data. And for this data set, if you look at that, you ask yourself, does that look like in any way like a distribution with normal conditionals? Well, it certainly doesn't look like a classical normal distribution uh, because it's they're not elliptical contours. Indeed, the asymmetry suggests that we might might be able to do better with the uh, asymmetric with the uh, uh, equidispersed uh, normal conditionals distribution. Okay, so uh, if we look at that. We fit two models. One is the independent model, where we consider uh, uh, <coughs> a dependent, dependent equidispersed conditional model, and we also looked at a model where we looked at independent equidispersed models, and we compare them with AIC as usual. And when you get the results, let you see that the winner is uh, the model which has dependence, which is I'm actually surprised how close the comp competition was when you look back at that distribution, it doesn't look like it has independent marginals in any sense. But there it is. Okay. I think we have, I have about five minutes left. Am I right? Or maybe I have, yeah, I think maybe, I think, I think maybe six. <laughs> okay. I don't need six. Okay. Now what we're going to do, we're going to look at another data set. And I, I, have, I, have, I have this labeled, not the Aussie athletes again. The reason for that is that there's a very well-known data set uh, collected by the Australian Institute for Sport that deals with measurements that were made on a lot of male and female athletes, uh, perhaps maybe they were Olympic athletes, whatever, but a large number of them, hundreds, hundreds of men and hundreds of women, or a hundred men and hundred women, something like that. And they measured all kinds of things, you know, length of arms, uh, body mass index, height, weight, uh, certain blood measurements, and you, you can't imagine which ones they are. And it's such a rich source of data uh, that some people have, have been searching through it to find examples of bivariate normal data sets, and, uh, uh, which reminds me of a story. Many years ago, when I started looking at normal conditional distributions, I thought, well, I bet you there's a lot of data around that people have fitted with bivariate normal that should have been fitted with a normal conditionals model. So I went back and looked at some of the very early stuff that was done by Galton, where he, he has measurements of people's left arm and, and, his, and the wife's right arm and looked at those things, all kinds of data sets. And darned if almost all of them did seem to be bivariate normal. I was very disappointed. I, I thought I would be able to shoot him down somewhere, but I couldn't. But anyway, this, in, in this data set, I think we can. Uh, the uh, corresponding scatter plot uh, for these measurements looks like this. And once again, it it looks a little bit weird, not 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 elliptical, and uh, and so we don't expect uh, to be able to to model this thing using the uh, a classical normal model, or nor could we do nor do we expect it to be modeled well by a if we disperse normal distribution with with independent marginals because that would that would again uh, we don't th we 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 can see in this picture that we we can't expect independent marginals. Uh, so we fitted three models to this one. We took a dependent equidispersed normal conditionals model. We fit independent equidispersed normal conditionals model. And finally, we said, well, let's try a bivariate normal, independent bivariate normal model. Well, the independent bivariate normal model has uh, four parameters, right? So, but of course, the AIC criteria penalizes a little bit for having extra parameters. But what we did was fit those three. And when we look at there, uh, at the corresponding maximum likelihood estimates and pseudo likelihood estimates, they're very close. Notice, notice that the differences are extremely small. Okay, so that uh, once again, I guess in the for the for the, uh, uh, for the normal conditional one, there's no reason to do pseudo maximum likelihood estimate for this model because you can write down exact analytic expressions for the MLEs, so that there's no, no reason to do it. And so uh, here, here are the estimates that we found. The AIC criteria uh, shows that the dependent model wins by a hair's breadth, and of course the normal gets, uh, gets shot down. It, it doesn't have a chance, and we knew that when we looked at the data. It did not look like it was normal. Okay. Uh, now, 
uh, I'm down to about two minutes, which is good. And so, of course, my next slide says, we may consider briefly an alternative model, which is various, which seems very similar to the equidispersed normal model, but it's actually quite different. And it's this one, uh, which is a situation where we set up the variance equal to the mean squared. Okay. And uh, it turns out that if you look at the variance equal to the mean squared, this is what the uh, density looks like. And it's not an exponential family. It's a curved exponential family. Okay, which makes life a little more complicated for us. Uh, and from those equations, if you, and in fact, if you work through for this one, uh, you can find that there really are no interesting uh, models of this, bivariate models with conditionals in this family. So uh, we'll leave that one out. And finally, one final competitor, for some data sets, you might consider uh, a model in which you have centered normal conditionals, uh, uh, normal conditional distributions with mean zero for all both directions. It's a nice three parameter exponential family, a nice competitor for our equidispersed normal conditionals model. Uh, and it was uh, investigated by Jose Maria Sarabia in, our, in a paper in Statistics and Probability Letters. And uh, I have not compared it with our data, with the data sets we have here. Maybe I can get. Uh, uh, on June to, to work on that, and, and we can have a comparison of that later on. And so the next thing is to, to thank you for your attention and patience. I think that I'm just about on 45 minutes, so I did that fairly well. And I finished last year with a picture of, of my hometown uh, of, with the uh, quiet beach at my hometown, which is unusual because my hometown is often known as Surf City. As you come into town, you see a sign that says, Welcome to Surf City. And normally, this beach is full of, and the bay, and the water is full of surfers. Why aren't they here? Well, this picture was taken during COVID. And uh, so we have COVID for the opportunity to see what the beach really looks like and not covered with surfers. Again, thank you. And uh, I, I'll, I'll oh, Thank you, on. Professor Arnold, for the nice talk. Now, for the audience, is there any question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Sure. This is actually sure, I have a very, couple of very quick questions. Yes. And those are towards the later part of Barry's talk. Of course, it's very, very interesting talk, as usual. That is not surprising. We always have this talk, very interesting one. So lots of ideas coming in. So, in fact, from the beginning of this talk, I was thinking about uh, the situation where we have the coefficient of variation equal to 1. Uh, that is one of the very popular models in engineering. A lot of people do test for the coefficient of variation to be equal to one, which in uh -huh. his normal case uh, turns down equals to the mean equal to the sigma. The mean equal yeah. to sigma. So that gives you the curved exponential family, and which you touched upon in the later part. Now, in yeah. general, that will give you a curved exponential family. But uh, is there any solution of this like you have in the regular exponential family? you have this characterization that the joint distribution will be again in the exponential family, uh, regular exponential family. Maybe in a very, very particular case of this normal one that we're talking about, is it possible or is it known that this uh, joint distribution will also be in a curved bivariate exponential family? Uh, actually, I don't know the answer to that. I have to think about it. Uh, one of the things that we, if, if you were going to start out with the conditional, if you're going to take that the conditional should be uh, uh, normal with a uh, constant coefficient of variation, uh, then uh, that we can look at that. We can see we, as long as we say they're conditional numbers, we know uh, what the they must be in the family in the Bhattacharya family, and so we can check as to what what conditions must be made upon the AIJs to to give us. Uh, that condition. Let's just look back here and see if we can figure out what's happening. Here, here's the case. If we assume normality, okay, then the bivariate. Then these are the equations. Say the variance. Now the standard deviation would be the square root of this thing, and it's almost impossible for the square root of this thing to be equal to this. You know, for choices of the AIJs. So, I don't think there'll be very many interesting cases, if any, uh, of uh, equidispersed 
distributions, uh, oh, sorry, distributions with normal conditionals that have con uh, that have uh, constant uh, coefficient of variation. But uh, I need to look into it. But this this would be. But if you don't assume uh, that you have uh, normal condition, if you just assume that you have uh, constant, you know, the mean equal to the standard deviation, that's a much broader family. And and I cannot, you know, there's a huge number of, of models that bivariate distribution which would have conditionals of, in this family. And and it's going to be much more. The, the theory works out nicely when we have exponential families. When we go to curved exponential families, I think it kind of breaks down. And right. as we saw in the case case that we looked at here, it turned out that there weren't any interesting examples with the uh, variance equal to the mean squared, which was a, a nice curved exponential family. If we tried to, to force that into our model, we didn't end up with anything very, except for independent case, which, of course, is not very exciting. So. I agree with you on that. Just to, uh, the thing is, it may not be in the regular exponential family. The results on the conditional expectations that you are showing, for example, uh, yeah. they are coming from the possibly from the regular bivariate exponential family. And in your yeah. case, with the curved exponential family, it will be a little different, quite different. Okay, but yeah, I, 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 we need to, to think about that some more. Yeah, issues. I'm not sure. It. And just one final yeah. thing. What about, I saw your uh, chart, the tables with the AIC, which we compared. But uh, uh -huh. can you do something a little bit more than that? Is, are there any goodness of fit tests for your conditionally specified distribution in the bivariate case? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, we, Is there in any goodness the... of fit test? Goodness of fit test for this bivariate conditional distribution. Goodness of fit uh, test, just like this Kolmogorov mean of test in the univariate case. Yeah, or the uh, the usual functional test that we have. Camera one uses functional test. Sir, the... now you can you can continue your discussion by email. The time is uh, <laughs> yeah, over. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> we'll do that. But uh, we'll just think about yes. it. Maybe later on we can discuss that. Yes. Yeah, send me send me an email. Ashish, okay. Okay. And, uh, okay. Anyway, good. It was very nice, very in invigorating <laughs> talk. Uh, Learning one. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Over to you again. Professor Thomas. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, anyway, it is very interesting talk because information on conditional distributions, whether it can lead to joint PDF, is a question of great concern because uh, this type of problem is known as over specified problem, and uh, there is no unique distribution having a bivariate distribution with this property. And uh, Professor Barnold has actually discussed in detail the general form of the joint PDF under this uh, specified cases, uh, especially in the case of equidispersed norm, dispersed normal conditions. It is quite interesting, very useful, and uh, there, it is, there is a rich source of further research on this problem. Thank you, Professor Arnold, for giving such a nice uh, talk on a very interesting problem. Uh, we, the Department of Statistics extend a hearty thanks to you for this talk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Shall yes. I can? Okay. The, uh, yes, you, you uh, carry on. Uh, thank you, Professor Barry, for your wonderful talk. And we are <laughs> always grateful to get to you, Professor. Uh, and uh, also, we wish to extend our gratitude to Professor Yagin Thomas for uh, chairing the session in a very vibrant way and active, a nice, a very nice way. Now, we have to move, let us move to the next session. Uh, professors are waiting for the next, uh, they, they say, one or two minutes. And uh, uh, Sopna, please introduce the chair and uh, uh, please do the help for its further procedures. Warm greetings to all. Uh, we have reached the 12th technical session of WSJ 2023, which is a special session in honor of Professor S. N. Roy that shall be chaired by Professor G. Gopal from the University of Madras, India. Professor Gopal has served as the head to the Department of Statistics, a University of Madras, 
and he specializes in reliability and survival analysis. He initiated the introduction of actual science education at the postgraduate diploma level in the University of Madras, opening up new opportunities for students interested in pursuing the same. Professor Gopal has uh, several research publications to his credit, including Empirical Bayesian Software Reliability Modeling Using Relic Distribution and Applications of uh, Reliability Theory and uh, Survival Analysis. He is also a life member of uh, Society for Reliability Engineering, Quality and Operations Management India, NIQR Chennai, ISPS, ISA Pune, IAQR Kolkata, KSA Kerala, as well as ASA Assam. On behalf of the organizing committee of WSG 2023, I hereby extend a warm welcome to you, Professor Gopal, and cordially invite you to chair this session. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, Ms. Anjana, for your nice introduction. Do you hear me, sir? Hello? Yeah, we can uh, hear you, Professor. Uh, most welcome. Do you hear me? Yeah. We can yeah, okay. I am thankful to Professor uh, Satish Kumar for inviting me to chair a plenary talk. I am glad to introduce Professor Somesh Kumar uh, for to uh, give you a plenary talk in this WSTA conference. About uh, Somesh Kumar, he is Professor in IIT Karakpur and his area of interest is statistical inference. And is, uh, in particular, his interests are estimation in restricted parameter spaces, estimation of order parameters, estimation of two-stage sequential estimation, estimating parameters in selected populations, uh, estimation of bounded parameters, estimation of common mean and common location, uh, and the construction of combinatorial designs. Also, he has interest in quantum computation and quantum information. He has a publication in this area. He has a book on this topic also. And about his research publications, he has 95 publications in peer-reviewed journals. And he has about 15 book chapters and about 75 conference presentations. And he is now um, he has guided some 15 PhDs, including the current uh, PhD students. And yes, uh, to his credit, 70 MTech and MSc research projects. And uh, other than that, about uh, the general um, help to the ministry, the Ministry of MHRD uses his services for offering online courses in uh, statistics and mathematics. And he has also developed uh, several video courses on statistics and mathematics. Now, with this brief introduction, I request uh, Professor S Somesh Kumar to give his talk on order restricted inference in one way and Kova. Over to Professor uh, Somesh Kumar. Uh, yeah, good morning, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would thank uh, the organizers of the conference, especially Professor Satish Kumar, for uh, inviting me to deliver this. Uh, plenary talk on uh, Professor S. N. Roy's uh, this one, and uh, I also thank uh, Professor Gopal for giving a very uh, cordial introduction to me, which is a little bit more <laughs> than what uh, it is actually due. Uh, so, without uh, losing any more time, let me just start share my slides here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, can you please see my yeah, slides? Yeah. Yeah. It is fine, boss. Okay, sure. it is fine. Yeah. So, the topic of my talk is that uh, we are looking at the analysis of covariance model, and uh, we will looking at the inference in this part. Uh, just uh, since it is in the honor of uh, Professor S. N. Roy, just uh, I will share a couple of slides on uh, Professor Roy. Uh, he was born in 1906. And his father was actually uh, chief editor of a leading newspaper and also a freedom fighter. In fact, he uh, was jailed by the Britishers uh, during that time. And uh, he completed his uh, uh, BSc in 1928 from Presidency College and uh, MSc in Applied Mathematics in 1931 from Calcutta University with a special elective on theory of relativity. 
and uh, since he needed to do certain uh, complicated differential equation calculations and at that time uh, this newly established uh, indian statistical institute had a statistical laboratory so he came in contact with uh, professor malan obis and slowly he joined there itself his important contributions are uh, one of the first contribution is the use of rectangular coordinates in deriving the distributions and he used uh, this for distribution of the uh, malanobis uh, d square under the null hypothesis when both and sigma is known or unknown uh, and his major contributions are in determining the roots of the uh, determinantal uh, equations and that is the p statistics which he called and of course at simultaneously at the same point uh, r a fisher p l su Uh, Harold Hotling etc they were also deriving these things and uh, he considered the multivariate generalization of the anova model and related uh, distribution uh, in 1950s he shifted to uh, usa uh, and finally in fact to the university of north carolina where he spent his final uh, 14 years and um, his, his most important contribution is considered to be the union intersection principle for testing of hypotheses which he also used to construct the simultaneous uh, confidence intervals apart from that he uh, gave some contributions to the log linear model for analyzing categorical data uh, the design and analysis of quantitative multi response experiments including model for growth curves and towards the end he considered admissibility and uh, monotonicity properties of the power functions he published uh, two books uh, some aspects of multivariate analysis and analysis and design of certain Uh, quantitative multi response experiments <coughs> he passed away in canada in 1964 during summer when he was on a vacation and uh, he is my actually my mathematical uh, geology uh, genealogy actually so he is uh, uh, my you can say gu uh, grand guide of my grand guide so that's what i can say uh, i have just shown it here Uh, in this talk uh, i will propose the likelihood ratio test and the parametric bootstrap approach uh, for the likelihood ratio test and then we consider uh, this uh, snroy type uh, union intersection type of test based on the pair wise differences which lead to the simultaneous confidence intervals uh, we also look at the generalization of these two several covariates and uh, we have a simulation study on the size and power analysis and uh, then we discuss the robustness of the test under departure from the normality and we consider some uh, applications to real data sets uh, so testing for the homogeneity of uh, the treatment effects in an ancoa model is important in experiments if some covariates have an effect on the response variable for example if you consider the effect of uh, three treatments uh, on the survival periods of patients having a particular type of cancer now in this case the total time for the onset of the disease should be included as a covariate uh, because as the patients with the early detection have longer survival periods uh, similarly suppose we are considering a, a study in the contribution of different type of foods on weight gain uh, then a usual uh, useful covariate is the initial weight of the candidate uh, similarly we can consider say analyzing the effect of different drugs on mice then the initial body weight of the mice is a covariate so there is a paper by cow et al in 2020 and uh, actually it may be noted that ignoring the covariates in all these studies may lead to misleading uh, conclusions and uh, recently european medical agency has published guidelines for conducting clinical trials and uh, they have specifically recommended adjusting for the covariates so one of the advantages of using the analysis of covariance model is that it incorporates the effect of covariates and therefore it reduces the error variance as a consequence the power of the test increases for example you can look at huitema in 2011 uh, for more applications and uses of ancoa one may refer to kazelman jamison von uh, brooklyn bosa et al so uh, we are considering yij as the jth observation of the response variable for the ith treatment and xij denotes the jth covariate for the ith treatment uh, then the standard one way fixed effects and coa model is described by yij is equal to mu i plus uh, new xij so this uh, this is the regressor new you can say plus epsilon ij and uh, so we are taking the sample sizes n1 n2 nk 
and here mu i is the effect of the ir treatment mu is the regression coefficient associated with this covariate xij and uh, epsilon ij denotes the error term so we are assuming the errors to be independently normally distributed with the zero and sigma i square so we are considering this to be a uh, heterostatic model and uh, <coughs> sigma i square of course they are unknown so in a standard uh, anova and ancova model we test whether all the effects are homogeneous against at least one inequality that is uh, the alternative hypothesis is mu i is not equal to mu j for at least one pair ij uh, however there are many scientific and other applications where treatments are implemented in stages and uh, this lead to either an improvement in the effect or a change as an example consider a dose response study where it is desired to determine the effective dosage of a drug for treating a certain disease uh, the drug dosages are increased in treating successive groups of experimental subjects for example mice guinea pig etc now if mu1 mu2 mu k denote the cure rates with increased dosage it is natural to test for the alternative hypothesis uh, mu1 less than or equal to mu2 less than or equal to mu k with at least one strict inequality so of course uh, you can look at the papers by ruberg and boyet uh, testing problems for the problem of testing the homogeneity of treatment effects against alternative uh, ordered alternatives in one way anova models uh, with homogeneous error variances they have been developed by bartholomew williams in the two way anova model testing against uh, ordered alternatives has been studied by sharock <coughs> and uh, when the error variances are unknown and unequal that means the heterostatic case then recently mandal et al uh, have developed <coughs> for testing against ordered alternatives in a one way anova model and uh, further mandal et al have proposed uh, this is a very recent paper they have proposed uh, parametric bootstrap test for testing the homogeneity of treatment effects against alter, uh, ordered alternatives in a two way additive model Uh, when error variances are homogeneous becher and pedada have considered the simple order the trivi order and the umbrella order restrictions among uh, treatment effects in uh, one way and coa model so they have actually obtained order restricted uh, maximum likelihood estimators which they call rmles of parameters uh, they have also developed dunnet type test statistics for testing h not against various ordered alternatives and also provided simultaneous confidence intervals so here the condition is that the error variances are taken to be homogeneous uh, so uh, this uh, test procedures in anova and ancova which are developed under the assumption of homogeneous error variances they are not robust when this assumption is violated so there are various papers where this discussion has been done for example wang and chao ananda sadugi alwandi jafri zimmerman et al kao et al and ponish et al so they have uh, looked at the effects of uh, heterostatisticity on the standard uh, test procedures in various ancova models so here we are considering h not that is homogeneity of uh, effects against uh, alternative of ordered effects and uh, the, here you should have at least one strict inequality so we are considering heterostatistic variances and unequal sample sizes so this is the generalization that we are taking so now we firstly propose uh, iterative algorithms for evaluating the maximum likelihood estimators of parameters under h not as well as under full parameter space which is required for developing the likelihood ratio test so uh, we prove that the iterative algorithms actually converge to the uh, mles and uh, using these estimators we develop the likelihood ratio test a uh, parametric bootstrap method is proposed for the implementation of the likelihood ratio test Uh, because the uh, null distribution of uh, the uh, lrt statistic cannot be determined in a closed form and the asymptotic validity of uh, the bootstrap procedure is also established and uh, then we also develop two test procedures based on the pairwise comparison of successive treatment effects and uh, the critical points are evaluated using the asymptotic null distribution of the test statistic for these two tests and uh, we discussed uh, the size and power performance of all the tests when we have the departure from normality then what is the effect on the size and power is also investigated and uh, an r package is developed and uploaded on the open platform github for practical use of these tests on the uh, real data sets so 
let us consider the uh, parameter theta, which contains consists of all the components here as mu i, nu, and sigma i square. So all the parameters which are introduced in the model, they are denoted by this theta vector. Now we define the full and null parameter space. So full parameter space is theta such that mu one is less than or equal to mu two less than or equal to mu k, and sigma i square belongs to R plus. And uh, of course, I forgot to write nu here. And uh, then uh, omega naught that is under the null hypothesis, mu i's are all equal. Let us put equal to some mu naught, uh, mu tilde. Uh, so now for finding the likelihood ratio, we need to find the MLEs under omega naught and omega. So here we propose some algorithms for determination of that. So the first algorithm is for finding the MLEs under omega naught. So now let us look at the log likelihood function that is minus sigma n i by 2 ln sigma i square minus double summation 1 by 2 sigma i square y i j minus mu tilde nu minus nu x i j square. Uh, we use some uh, abbreviated notations that is y i bars are the means, x i bars are the means of x i j's. And uh, some new i I am using n i by sigma i square here. Uh, so using this uh, modified notations, if we write down the likelihood equations, that means the differentiation of the log likelihood function with respect to mu tilde nu as well as sigma i square, then we obtained mu tilde as uh, this, uh, nu as this, and uh, sigma i square as this. As you can see here, that each of the equations. Uh, for example, this new i is actually n i by sigma i square, so it contains uh, the parameters here. So the expression for mu tilde contains nu and sigma i square. The expression for nu contains mu tilde and sigma i square, and the expression for sigma i square contains mu tilde and nu. So these are uh, you can say implicit equations. So in order to get the solutions from the system of nonlinear equations. Uh, this 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, we give the following Gauss Seidel type iterative algorithm. So here we do that uh, we choose the basic least square estimators of mu tilde and nu as the initial iterative solutions. So these are obtained in this particular fashion. Uh, so that is nu omega naught. So this is the initial least square estimates for mu tilde and nu. And uh, uh, for sigma i square, we consider the initial solution taken as s i square, where s i square is given by uh, this quantity. Uh, so in the step n, we consider nu i n minus one, where we substitute the previous ones, and uh, then mu tilde n is this, and then mu uh, nu tilde n is this, and then sigma i omega naught square n as this. So we is proceed in the steps, and uh, we stop at the step n. If the consecutive difference is less than a prescribed accuracy, so suppose we want uh, four decimal places, five decimal places, etc., we can consider this. Uh, next, we consider the maximum likelihood estimators under omega, and uh, here the likelihood function here mu i is coming, so there is a slight difference here, and uh, the solution of the maximization problem that is the maximum maximization of L with respect to the condition that mu one less than or equal to mu two. Uh, less than or equal to mu k. Uh, these are the MLEs of the parameters under omega. So again, we propose like this. When nu and sigma i square are known, the problem of maximizing the likelihood function L becomes to minimize uh, this function. Now the above expression we rewrite in a different form by uh, adjusting of certain uh, terms here. Now you consider nu and sigma i square are known. Then maximizing L under this order restriction, it becomes a problem of minimizing this particular term subject to this condition. This is nothing but the isotonic regression of uh, y prime, y1 prime, y2 prime uh, bar, yk prime bar with weights uh, omega, that is omega 1, omega 2, omega k, where this yi prime is equal to yi bar minus nu xi bar and omega i is equal to ni by sigma i square. So this uh, isotonic regression is defined in Barlow et al. Uh, so I'm not giving the full details of that one here. Uh, now MLE of nu in terms of mu i's and sigma i squares is the solution of the likelihood equation del L by del nu is equal to zero, which is obtained as uh, nu is equal to this. And the MLE of sigma i square in terms of all other parameters is sigma i square is equal to 
this. Uh, in the following theorem, we prove the existence of the maximum likelihood estimator under omega. So the theorem says that the MLEs will exist. And uh, anyway, I think I will skip the proof part here because it requires certain uh, concepts such as uh, we are using a polyhedral convex cone and uh, then we have uh, favorable points. So we show that the maximum likelihood estimators are the uh, favorable points. So probably I'll just uh, skip this thing here. So now the uh, maximum likelihood estimators can be evaluated by solving these equations for each subscript set and then comparing whether they satisfy the order restriction. So this process is somewhat complicated. So we propose another iterative algorithm which converges to the MLEs of the parameters. So what we observe that when mu and sigma square are fixed, the MLE of mu is given by an asymptotic regression. And when mu and sigma square are known, the MLE of mu is given by the equation 3.6 here, which I mentioned it here. And uh, uh, when mu and uh, nu are fixed, then the MLE of sigma square is sigma square mu nu. So we develop the following algorithm, which uses this. So we define mu naught to be mu one naught, mu two naught, and so on, and so on for sigma uh, naught square also. So we choose the initial iterative points as the ordinary least square estimators of mu i and nu, and uh, for sigma i square as the unbiased estimator. So then we substitute it here. And again, we use this iterative procedure to substitute this and get the solution. The question is, uh, we stop here at a certain required accuracy. Suppose we want m decimal points, so we can consider this kind of condition. Uh, we have proved that actually uh, this algorithm leads to a solution. That means the sequence will converge to the unique MLE as n becomes large. Uh, Okay, so maybe I'll just skip the step of the proof here. Now, since uh, this expression of the likelihood ratio statistic turns out to be sigma i omega naught square by sigma i omega naught square uh, whole to the power n i by 2 product i is equal to 1 to k. Uh, the distribution of uh, this is quite complicated. And uh, so, the likelihood ratio test will reject H0 at level of significance alpha if lambda is less than the uh, critical point here. Uh, now, there is no closed type of formula for this, so therefore we cannot determine the distribution of this. So the only thing is that we can consider the asymptotic distribution, uh, but uh, we have observed that this asymptotic test does not achieve the nominal size if the sample sizes are small or moderate, and also when the number of groups increases. So therefore, we propose a parametric bootstrap likelihood ratio test for this. Uh, we also actually show the asymptotic accuracy of this test. And uh, we actually observe that the uh, parametric bootstrap li uh, likelihood ratio test, it achieves the nominal size even for very small samples and has higher power than the uh, asymptotic likelihood ratio test. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, of course, we observe that the distribution of the test is just uh, lambda. It is independent of the location parameter mu tilde. So without loss of generality, we assume that it is equal to zero. The procedure for finding the critical point using the statistic lambda star is described like this. So uh, we initially fix a certain parametric configuration and generate the samples uh, yij for j is equal to 1 to ni and i is equal to uh, 1 to k. And uh, then we calculate, of course, the sample variances and the estimate of new under H0. Uh, now we generate the parametric bootstrap samples yij star from a normal uh, new omega naught xij si square for j is equal to 1 to ni, i is equal to 1 to k. Again, using the bootstrap samples, we calculate the bootstrap estimators of sigma i square and we calculate the uh, bootstrap version of the likelihood statistic called lambda star. And we repeat this large number of times, say h number of times. And uh, we arrange them in the increasing order and we take the critical value as the alphaeth quantile of this. Uh, so then we actually prove that uh, this procedure is uh, asymptotically accurate. Uh, in the following theorem. So suppose we consider the conditional distribution of lambda star given y, uh, that is given the data. 
and uh, the null distribution of the likelihood ratio is statistical. <coughs> then we are able to prove that as the uh, sample sizes increase, then the maximum difference between this goes to zero. Now, next we propose, uh, so I have skipped the proof here, and uh, then we consider the two test procedures which are based on the uh, pairwise differences of consecutive uh, mean differences. So let us consider, say, uh, mu1 had L, mu k had L, etc. So we consider this ti i plus 1 is equal to mu i plus 1 L minus mu i had L divided by square root si square by ni plus si plus 1 square by ni plus 1 plus i had xi plus 1 bar minus xi bar. Uh, so here these definitions are given here. Uh, psi function is defined like this. So we propose two simultaneous test statistics. One is based on the minimum and the other one is based on the maximum. Uh, we call them t min and t max. Uh, now uh, we are able to actually derive the uh, asymptotic distributions of uh, this t1, t2, tk minus 1. Uh, that is we have defined like this ti i plus 1. So i is equal to 1 to k minus 1. So we have these combinations here and uh, we are able to uh, derive the asymptotic distribution. Uh, exact distribution of course cannot be obtained. So the asymptotic distribution using certain uh, uh, asymptotics of the central limit theorem, then the Slutsky's lemma uh, and certain uh, almost sure convergence, etc. Uh, finally, it gives us that the asymptotic distribution of T it is actually nk minus 1 with mean 0 and uh, dispersion matrix R, where R is given by D inverse sigma z uh, D inverse. And uh, this uh, D and sigma z we have uh, defined earlier here, which uses these terms here. So D is the diagonal of this and z is consisting of these terms here. Uh, so this asymptotic distribution of T is dependent on the unknown variances. So the critical values of test cannot be directly calculated using the asymptotic distribution. So what we do, we use R head in place of R. And uh, so we replace sigma I square by SI squares. And uh, so this test function that I call T min and T max, based on the asymptotic distribution, we call them A T min and A T max. So they will reject H0 for large values of T min and T max. And uh, what we do, we consider that if T min is greater than T, then this is equivalent to saying that T i i plus 1 is greater than T for all i. Similarly, T max is less than T. It is equivalent to saying that T i i plus 1 is less than T for all i. So we consider Z1 minus alpha and Z alpha as the lower tail 1 minus alpha and upper tail alpha Q coordinate quantiles of the multivariate normal distribution with mean vector 0 and dispersion matrix R. Then the A min test will reject H0 if T min is greater than Z alpha and A T max will reject H0 if T max is greater than Z1 minus alpha. And uh, for computing this Z1 minus alpha and Z alpha, one can use the R function that is QMV and R naught. Uh, so this uh, function we need to install and then we can actually do this. So uh, we have done the simulation studies in which the size and the power performance of both A min T and A max T, A T max are compared with those of LRT and ALRT. Uh, now using this uh, T max, actually we can uh, construct the simultaneous confidence intervals also. And uh, the simultaneous confidence intervals are given by this particular form for mu i plus 1 minus mu i. So that is given in this particular. So these are one-sided confidence intervals that we are able to get. Uh, this uh, result that we have developed just now can be developed to more than one covariate also. So in general, suppose we have <coughs> a few number of covariates, then we uh, uh, can write the model as yij is equal to mu i plus summation nu h x h i j plus epsilon i j. Uh, what we observe that this uh, theory that I developed, uh, we have actually been able to extend 
to q variates also so the likelihood ratio test can be developed so i will not be speaking about this here only thing is that uh, the expressions and the uh, derivations become little bit more complicated however uh, this has been developed and uh, we have developed the full algorithm and also proved the uh, uh, convergence of the algorithm to the true values and uh, similarly the test based on the pairwise differences have also been developed uh, next we talk about the simulation study on the size and the power performance uh, of the three test procedures that we have proposed so one of them is the likelihood ratio test which has a bootstrap implementation and we have the uh, two test functions t min and t max for which it is based on the asymptotic distribution so we have considered various choices for example various values of mu tilde n i s sigma i square the values of the covariates the value of the regression coefficient and so on <coughs> so these uh, values are com uh, computed and uh, uh, okay so i'll uh, talk about this thing so there are various tables uh, where we have considered estimated size values of proposed tests when one covariate is there and the number of groups is 3 uh, we have considered all types of cases for example the sample sizes all of them may be small they may be moderate or they may be large they may be equal or they may be unequal so in order to look at the total uh, variation in the size and the power performance we have considered all types of cases similarly Uh, uh similarly we are considering uh, that uh, we can have the variances to be equal or unequal so in particular we have taken the sizes as 7 8 9 30 15 10 10 14 15 30 8 8 8 7 30 and so on so these are the choices similarly the variance choices are which are tabulated here they are given like this the value of the fixed covariates have been generated from uniform distribution in one particular case the value of the regression coefficient has been taken as the 2 uh, uh, similarly in the second uh, table we have considered various other choices of the sample sizes that is n7 n8 etc here three components means that three groups have been taken and these are the sample sizes corresponding to each of them uh, okay so maybe i can go to the description here uh, so these are the sizes you can have certain observations from here the likelihood ratio test if you look at the nominal size at 0.05 it is approximately 0.05 in almost all the cases so this shows that this bootstrap implementation of the likelihood ratio test is really good if you look at the uh, asymptotic likelihood ratio test then for the small samples or moderate sample size you can see it is somewhat not that good it is performing liberally if you look at at min and at max again you can see that at max is uh, quite liberal whereas at min is somewhat closer to the uh, nominal size and uh, similar behavior we have observed for various other uh, combinations also however if you have large sample sizes then the asymptotic likelihood ratio test also becomes all right and uh, the at min also becomes much better and at max uh, is becoming less liberal compared to the earlier cases uh, then we also uh, plotted the power curves for various combinations and here you can see that the best performance is the bootstrap implementation of the likelihood ratio test and uh, then you can see uh, this uh, red is the at max and the blue one is the at min so here you can see that initially they are almost same but uh, as uh, this difference c increases means the difference between the uh, mu i is increases then the discriminatory power of at min becomes much better compared to at max and uh, if you look at uh, some other combinations so here you have seen uh, this is k is equal to 4 and here you can see that alrt uh, is 
not good initially, but it becomes almost same as the bootstrap implementation of the likelihood ratio when the differences are becoming too hard. This is based on C. So when C increases, the differences actually increase here. But LRT definitely remains the best. And uh, this A max T and A min T are comparable that you can see here. Uh, so we have uh, some more cases here where again you can see LRT is the best and here A <coughs> LRT is here and uh, here this is A max T and this is A min T. Now what is this particular case where A max T becomes much better than A min T? This case is the one where I have taken at least one equality also. So here for example you can see mu2 and mu3 are same. So when two are same, then A min T's discriminatory power becomes much less and A max T discriminatory power is much better. So this is the case uh, that we are able to describe here. In both the cases you can see. Professor, two more minutes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so what we are able to say that in general LRT performs very well for small sample sizes, ALRT uh, uh, is not good. Even A max T is not very good, but A min T performs uh, much better. Uh, now, overall recommendation. Overall recommendation is that PBLRT is certainly very good, but the computational time taken by A min T is slightly less, in fact, quite less compared to ALRT. Uh, LRT. So therefore, this can be considered as a very good computer. In fact, the similar conclusion we have drawn for the uh, uh, robustness studies also, uh, but I will not be speaking due to the lack of time now. And uh, finally, we have implemented uh, this on two real data examples. Uh, that is, uh, the tumor data is there. So uh, we have considered whether the overall longevity also increases with early detection. So if the tumor is detected at stages one, two, or three, then it is important to know whether they significantly decrease the age at the death of the patients. So this is what we have considered uh, mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to mu3 and uh, against the uh, ordered alternatives with at least one strict inequality. And uh, in fact, all the tests here, they are showing that the decision of rejecting the null hypothesis. That means it means that the mean survival year of patients with tumors detected at stage three are less than those with the tumors detected at stage two, and these are less than those with tumors detected at stage one. So this is the conclusion that we are able to draw. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Somesh Kumar, for your detailed and enlightening, enlightening lecture on uh, order restricted inference. And also, thanks for sharing the information and the contributions of uh, Professor SN Roy. And uh, it is a fitting tribute to SN Roy that the lecture has been given by the great grand student of SN Roy. And it is now open for discussion and queries. Any any queries needed? Discussion? And just to just add here that actually we no, are yeah. also yes. considering the uh, uh, multivariate extension of this and also correlated model. So actually, professors. Ashish Senmukta, I can see here, he is there. So he recently proposed that we can actually go for the correlated models also. So that we are working on. Uh, that book contains the four other book on uh, statistical inference on order restrictions. Yeah, that B4. Book, B4. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that book contains uh, material on uh, uh, the, the basis for uh, your lecture. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, they did some work in the initial years. Uh, that book was published in 1972. Right. And uh, so, till that time, whatever developments uh, have taken place, uh -huh. they have included in that book. Okay. So, this is uh, recent work that we are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Swami If there are no questions or queries from the uh, audience, 
let us thank the speaker again for his nice uh, wonderful lecture thank you thank you thank you sir thank you professor satish kumar uh, for having given an opportunity to chair this session uh, <laughs> thank you professor gobal for gobal sir for you are for nicely um managing the chair of uh, managing as the chair of the session okay. and you concluded in within the time frame Oh. and also we wish to uh, thank professor somesh kumar for your excellent talk we are uh, with a very informative and uh, useful to the researchers thank you so much now let us move to the next session uh, professor huda and professor shinde are the speakers and professor loganathan sir i, I hope they are in the group to chair this yeah professor uh sapna yes sir sapna uh, uh, please introduce the chair and uh, do and uh, do the needful for its further proceedings a warm greetings to everyone i hereby welcome you all to the technical session 13 of wst 2023 which is a special session in honor of professor p v sugathmin that shall be chaired by professor ray loganathan now professor loganathan is a former professor and head to the department of statistics from manomyam sundarnar university tamil nadu india who had been in teaching profession for over two decades he obtained his doctoral degree in statistics from annamalai university his area of specialization is bayesian estimation of parameters in finite mixed distributions and he is deeply interested in the domains of bayesian estimation acceptance sampling and clustering He has over 15 publications to his credit, including 30 papers in peer-reviewed international journals. Professor Loganathan is a recipient of Young Scientist Award by Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology, and is a life member of Indian Bayesian Society, Calcutta Statistical Association, as well as Indian Society for Probability and Statistics. Indeed, it's with great pleasure and honor that I cordially invite you, Professor, to chair this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your good words. Uh, good morning, Professor Satish Kumar. Uh, do you good hear morning. me? Yeah, you can hear you. Hear you, Professor. Can hear. Professor, uh, thank you, thank you for the invitation. I thank uh, the organizing committee of WSTA 2023 and uh, the University of Faculty members of University of Kerala and the organizing committee of this conference, uh, Professor Satish Kumar. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I feel it as a honor uh, to chair the session uh, in the name of the great professor. And uh, the speakers are also very, very important persons in the field of statistics and. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker of this session professor ds kuda uh, professor, professor is a uh, professor whether we have to check whether professor kuda is there in the group professor shinde has um, switched on there yeah, is there good morning shall we switch the camera professor kuda is not there uh, okay. we can start with the professor shinde Okay, sir. So then uh, let me introduce. Uh, uh, okay, right. It is my pleasure. Uh, since uh, due to certain reasons, uh, we could. Uh, it means it seems that Professor Hoda could not join now. He. I hope that he will join later. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee of WS 2023, I have the pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker, Professor uh, Shinde Ramkrishna Lalu. Lahu. Uh, he is a senior professor in statistics of uh, he is a professor and head of the department of actuarial science school of mathematical sciences of north maharashtra university jalgaon uh, professor has uh, put in 20 year more than uh, 28 years of uh, teaching as well as research experience uh, he has uh, Uh, he has guided uh, several uh, candidates for phd and uh, many publications he has published many papers in renowned uh, journal of international repute uh, on behalf of the organizing committee it is my privilege to uh, invite uh, professor uh, uh, shinde to present his talk on uh, markov chain modeling of markov chain modeling of um, meteorological data and its applications in weather based insurance schemes for banana professor shinde you can start your uh, presentation uh, as informed by the organizing committee uh, 40 minutes or uh, 40 minutes is allocated for the for your presentation professor shinde yes sir <coughs> thank you for nice introduction uh, can you see my slides sir 
yes sir yes thank you so this is my lecture is on markov chain modeling for meteorological data and its applications in weather based crop insurance for banana so uh, this is work with my phd student mr aryan chawan who is recently uh, working uh, started working in rbi first of all i would like to go through the indian agriculture overview uh, very briefly in india more people earn their livelihood from agriculture sector than all the other sectors all together nearly 120 million farm holdings are there approximately in india about 145 million hectares of cultivated area comes under uh, these 120 million farms and small farm holding sizes are there in india about 1.2 hectare on an average uh, people are holding cultivators 80% are small or marginal farmers are there with 60% owning less than 1 hectare land about 50% of area under cereals and millets 60% of the rural household are farming households provides 50% of employment approximately and sustains about 70% of the population varied agriculture practices we have mainly rain fed agriculture in india we observe large number of farmers produce for self consumption and just one third of the gross crop area is under the irrigation again some more overview bad weathers can have a major impact on livelihood of farmers and on the wide population that depends on this sector the role of insurance may be yield based insurance or weather based insurance as a critical risk covering tool has been widely appreciated presently there are two major crop insurance products those are national insurance agriculture insurance scheme and second is weather based crop insurance scheme the modified uh, national agriculture insurance scheme has introduced significant step to improve the effectiveness of the yield Uh, index program now it is named as pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana and weather based crop insurance uh, revised in 2016 again weather risk market for agriculture has seen tremendous growth in last few years with the spread of weather based crop insurance scheme implemented by the public and private insurers generally types of weather risk and ag in agriculture are uh, rainfall first of all that is deficit of rainfall or late onset of monsoon early withdrawal of monsoon uneven distribution of rainfall excess rainfall and in wind wind speed high wind speed generally consider in agriculture for some non agriculture situation low wind speed also a risk factor uh, temperature in agriculture low temperature as well as high temperature uh, most of the time are risk factors and then cold and frost and sunlight there also sometime in some situation are applicable now first of all as my lecture is focus on the uh, modeling of uh, meteorological data for the uh, and its application to weather based crop insurance in the banana crop banana so we'll go through the banana crop cultivation statistics worldwide statistics and then india then my state maharashtra and then my district jalgaon let us see global production about 130 countries producing banana uh, area under cultivation is around approximately 5.14 million hectares and production is 1.105 million tons and productivity worldwide productivity is 20.5 million tons per hectare in india it is uh, uh, productivity is 37 million ton per hectare 
area uh, indian area is around 11 12% of world under banana and production is around 29% of world whereas in maharashtra state of india uh, the area under cultivation is 82000 hectares and uh, production is 4.32 million metric ton productivity is 53 metric ton per hectare particularly if i talk about my district jalgao from where this study uh, is taken into account 51000 hectares area under cultivation of banana that is 1% of area under cultivation of world and it produces around 3.4 million metric ton that is 3% of world's production from this one district of uh, maharashtra that is jalgaon and productivity is 30 uh, 70 metric uh, ton per hectare it is almost 3 uh, to 4 times uh, of uh, world productivity agro uh, climatic requirements of banana crop are banana basically a tropical crop grows well in temperature ranges from 16 to 38 degree celsius and average Uh, relative humidity 65 to 85 percent in more. In India, this crop is being cultivated in climate ranging from the humid tropical to dry, mild subtropical. Soil for banana should be good drainage. Should have good drainage, adequate fertility, moisture, deep, rich loamy soil. with the ph value between 6.5 to 7.5 is most preferable for banana cultivation what are the adverse climatic conditions generally those are higher temperature with brighter sunshade causes the scorching for banana plants and then uh, low temperature below 8 degree celsius causes the chilling injury for banana uh, plant and high wind velocity exceeds 40 km per hour that damages the crop partially or fully sometime uh, one remark is here for my district jalgaon the above requirements for jalgaon district is uh, not satisfying some of them uh, climatic conditions are not satisfied by jalgaon district uh, but the some farmers or most of the farmers due to their managerial cultivation cultivation practices of farmers the area under cultivation is going on increasing and increasing day by day in jalgao even though adverse conditions are there uh, as some of them are managing their cultivating practices accordingly our study is based on the 43 years data for the uh, it is IMD approved meteorological observatory taken uh, from Jalgaon uh, near to Jalgaon city it is approved by the uh, one of the agriculture university also the analysis conducted under this particular study this statistical and probabilistic study of weather parameters study of probability distributions like uh, daily t maximum temperature maximum temperature minimum temperature and mean temperature daily for the risk covering periods define different random variables such as functions of weather parameters which may be related to triggers uh, causing banana crop loss those uh, some random variables under consideration are monthly mean of uh, minimum temperature and monthly mean of maximum uh, mean temperature in the month of november december january and february monthly mean of t maximum and t min t min in the month of march april and may number of days with minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius during november to february november december january february four months number of occurrences of t minimum minimum temperature daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius for consecutive 3 days during november to february then number of days 
T maximum is greater than 40.5 degrees Celsius in the month of March and greater than 44 degrees Celsius in the month of April and May. Number of occurrences of T maximum greater than 40.5 degrees Celsius consecutively for three or four or five days in the month of March to May. Number of occurrences of maximum temperature greater than 44 degrees Celsius consecutively for three, four or five days during March to May. Distributions related to these random variables are under consideration. Uh, fitting of distribution. Loss years are pending of loss years based on the uh, weather for the weather based crop insurance scheme. Uh, empirical estimation of uh, empirical rate that is percentage of sum assured for the loss years uh, for premium. Then model based estimation of premium. Uh, for the weather-based crop insurance scheme for banana. And uh, we have suggested the modified weather-based crop insurance scheme for banana. Government of Maharashtra. Uh, in the uh, Maharashtra is a state in the country India. And uh, Maharashtra state has given the guideline under the uh, supervision of Agriculture Insurance Company of India. Uh, AIC of India introduced the weather based crop insurance scheme firstly in 2011 12 and then modified in 15 uh, 16. Two schemes weather based crop insurance scheme one and two. Uh, this scheme one considers like this period of, of for the insurance is 1st November to 28th February against the low temperature period of insurance and the period of insurance against the high uh, sorry uh, high wind speed is 1st march to 31st july was considered uh, in this first scheme and uh, some assured was taken uh, for one hectare it is 1 lakh uh, 100000 rupees premium per hectare is 12000 rupees 12% 12 of some assured farmer has to pay only 50% of this uh, that is 6% of some assured and 25% uh, 25% will be shared by central government of india and uh, state government of india what are the triggers minimum temperature during november 1st to february 28th trigger level and claim amount is like this if the uh, conjugate to 3 or more days daily minimum temperature is less than 8 degrees celsius then claim payable will be 25000 rupees this is Call this as the event A. What is event A? That is conjugate to three days, the minimum temperature, at least for three days, minimum temperature is below eight degrees Celsius. That is event A. And wind speed during March 1st to July 31st. If wind speed uh, during March, April uh, and July uh, greater than 40 degree, uh, kilometer per hour, and in May and June, if it is greater than 40, Five kilometer per hour. The claim is payable uh, seventy-five thousand. That is event B. That is event B. We have uh, gone through the data completely for forty-three years, and uh, for every year, the number of occurrences of event A uh, is. For example, in first year, nineteen seventy-three, seventy-four, the four times. Event A has occurred, that means at least temperature less than 8 degrees Celsius in the winter, November to February, occurred four times this event. <laughs> temperature conjugatively less than three, uh, 8 degrees Celsius for three days, for three or more days. Such events occurred four times during those 120 days. And uh, similarly, number of times event B occurred, then whether it was loss year, if event occurred at least once, then also loss year is considered. And similarly, loss year for event B. This, this is done for completely for all 43 years. And it is empirical probability comes out to be 61%, that is 0.61 for getting a claim for event A. And and for event B, 0.12. Some assured uh, for event A is 25,000 and expected premium 
that is sum i should multiplied by probability it comes out to be 15244 for event a that means if the event occurs like uh, minimum temperature in the month of november to february goes consecutively 3 days below 8 degree celsius then uh, well, payable amount uh, pre premium expected premium is 15000 Uh, 244 for some assured 25,000, and for wind speed related uh, event, uh, the loss years are identified, and probability comes out to be around 12 percent, and some uh, for 75,000 some assured premium comes out to be 9,140. Uh, if you consider uh, some other random variables uh, based on these. Uh, meteorological data you can derive some random variables and their data uh, number of for example number of days uh, daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree during month november to this uh, november to february x2 is number of occurrences of daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius for at least 3 consecutive days during november to february x2 and x3 is maximum length of consecutive number of days daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius during november to february so, so these random variable data uh, is obtained here and it is uh, given in this table observed values of x1 x2 x3 the good models are fitted for these three random variables x1 x2 x3 uh, please note again Uh, x1 is number of days daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius during november to february and second random variable is much of interest that is number of occurrences of daily minimum temperature less than 8 degree celsius for at least 3 consecutive days and third one is maximum length of consecutive days so these three random variables uh, we have made two uh, period uh, 1973-74-2, and 1992-2015-16, two ranges, and commonly also we have uh, given here best fitted models. Uh, for example, for commonly X2 follows Poisson distribution with mean around one. It is 0.85. So uh, this is uh, on an average. Uh, 0.85 times the uh, number of occurrences of consecutive three days temperature goes below 8 degree celsius if you want to find the probability of occurrence of event a it can be based on this modeling also one can obtain probability of 1 minus probability of x2 is equal to 0 that is 0.757 around 57% chance is there the event a will occur event a is uh, temperature goes below 8 degree celsius consecutive at least for three consecutive days during november to february based uh, based on this data uh, now uh, distributions for t minimum november to february are also fitted separately for three uh, two periods separately and combined period also so so november december separately and november to february also separate these are easy fit software we have used and these models are uh, given here for minimum temperature if you see the minimum temperature distribution how does it is changing so oh, this dotted line is for uh, complete uh, distribution 74 to 2015-16 middle one and the uh, big dotted line is for 91 to uh, 16 whereas uh, the right side distribution is for 71 to 91 71 to 91 so there is a shift in the uh, distribution of minimum temperature during november to now will move towards the markov chain modeling for minimum temperature uh, what we do here we define a stochastic process yn taking value 
if daily temperature is below 8 degree celsius on nth day during november to february that is around 120 days are there for uh, november to february 120 days and uh, so uh, n running from 1 to 120 and it is zero if the temperature is not less than 8 degree celsius so such stochastic process is observed and we are trying to fit here the uh, markov chain model for this data and we have observed that for 42 uh, years of data for nine years zero order markov chain that are sequence of independent random variables we have observed in 18 years we have observed one order markov chain and 11 years we have observed two order markov chain two order dependent markov chain and four years y n is degenerating sequence of zeros that was also observed again a event a uh, that the daily minimum temperature is below eight degrees celsius consecutively three or more days during the period of november to february we have uh, defined a random variable g and k as the number of success runs of length greater than or equal to k greater than or equal to k in n markov bernoulli trials and using this uh, random variable which we have already studied in our world uh, uh, with my phd students uh, those are success run related distributions in which probability of a can be very easily obtained for one minus probability of j and k is equal to zero that is exact probability distribution uh, can be used for uh, markov dependent data sets and using this jnk distribution we have given here the probability of occurrence of event a for every year for every year depending upon the model fitted for example here two means to, to second order markov chain is fitted and their uh, probabilities are mentioned here second order uh, markov chains transition probability and accordingly this is obtained from using those exact distribution study probability of a for every year uh, this fitted for example some of them are generate uh, degenerate distributions also probability will be zero in that case because degenerate sequence of zero is observed and sometimes one order and zero order independence also observed those probabilities are accordingly given for all 42 years pa values are obtained and their average value is reported that is for 43% that is 0.434 probability of occurrence of event a uh, new uh, uh, weather based crop insurance scheme in 1516 was introduced uh, by aic and that was uh, triggers uh, triggers are considered like this and claim amount uh, minimum temperature during november to february that is if it is consecutive three days minimum temperature good below 8 degree then amount payable is 25000 some assured for this event uh, this is event a then wind speed during march to july 31st accordingly uh, now it is mentioned that the temperature uh, the wind speed goes beyond 40 km per hour then maximum uh, claim payable is 50000 uh, here it is expected that the uh, the event c is different we, here the uh, maximum temperature is also taken into account and maximum temperature if consecutive three or more days temperature is greater than 40.5 degrees celsius in march or maximum temperature is greater than 44 degree in april may then claim payable will be uh, 10,000 rupees. Accordingly, if uh, this C event means occurrence of C1 or C2 or C3, that means C has occurred. Any one of them occur, that means C has occurred. C1 is like this. C2 says if consecutive four or more days temperature goes beyond 40.5 in March or T maximum greater than 44 degrees Celsius in April and May for consecutive four days then uh, 15,000. Similarly, for consecutive five days, 
it is 25,000. And some assured so far for this to combine uh, is 1 lakh rupees. 25,000, this 25,000 maximum, and this 50,000, 1 lakh rupees. And Hellstrom data, if you have available based on that also, uh, if occurrence of Hellstrom maximum claim payable is 33,000, uh, so that the sum assured total goes 1,33,000 1, for uh, this banana uh, weather based crop insurance scheme. Second, we have studied uh, this scheme and uh, risk years, uh, loss years are identified, and number of occurrences of events uh, are obtained, uh, and loss years are identified, and probabilities we have obtained the first event A, probability here 0.61, and uh, event B, uh, based on the weather uh, wind speed, that is around 0.12 again, and uh, C1, C2, C3. Uh, combining these three, uh, if any one of them occurs, then uh, event C has occurred. One can talk about probability of C also. Uh, we have suggested here the modified scheme uh, for banana that is uh, based on the uh, percentiles of distribution of monthly mean uh, T max and monthly uh, mean of T minimum, daily uh, T max and daily T minimum. Their means, monthly means distribution for all those 42 uh, years data, if you take into account and uh, estimate the percentiles for uh, based on the fitted distribution of the mean T max and mean T minimum. So we introduce the uh, this scheme like this, the loss will be rupees 10,000. If the month, monthly mean T max is greater than 70th percentile and less than 80th percentile of distribution of monthly mean T max. Excuse and uh, yes, you have five more minutes, five minutes. Yes, I, I will try to finish in five to six minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. If, mon uh, if monthly uh, mean T max is greater than 80th percentile and below 90th percentile, 15,000 loss is expected here. And uh, payable amount will be 25,000. If the uh, monthly mean T max is greater than 90th percentile of distribution, It's not audible, Professor. It's not audible, Professor Shinde. Yes. Ah, now it's audible. I, I lost the connection. Now I got it. Let okay, me sir. again. Continue. Sorry, sir. Can you see okay. my slide? Yes, sir. Okay, it thank loss payable during the month of November to February based on the uh, percentiles of the distribution of monthly mean uh, daily minimum temperature. Those are again 10,000, 15,000. This is again uh, 20 to 30th percentile, then 10 to 20th percentile and 10th percentile. Uh, below 10th percentile, if you observe the uh, this monthly mean term, uh, of T minimum is below 10 percentile of distribution, then we have to pay 25,000. And wind speed we have kept the, as it is uh, the, uh, in the month of March to July, if uh, greater than 40 kilometer per hour, then the maximum claim payable is 50,000 here. The percentiles we have obtained for the uh, Minim, mean of T max, maximum daily maximum temperatures, monthly means percentiles, 
are obtained based on our data 70th percentile 80th percentile and 90th percent for the month of march april may and march to april combines anywhere if it uh, happens the claim is payable similarly uh, percentile distribution of monthly mean t minimum during november to february uh, 11 means november february uh, uh, november december january and february four months these are 10th percentile 20th percentile and 30th percentile and based on that we have defined that uh, weather based crop insurance scheme newly uh, this is distribution of uh, mean temperature uh, monthly mean temp uh, here we have concluding table for expected premium based on our study uh, of these meteorological data modeling uh, first uh, scheme as given by uh, aic and second scheme there uh, uh, some assured was 1 lakh uh, 100000 rupees and 23000 rupees some assured comes out to be that is 23.9% and uh, this is 61% uh, for minimum temperature risk and uh, wind speed 12% S second uh, weather based crop insurance scheme where uh, premium comes out to be 39756 for the same sum assured that is 39.8% third scheme what we have proposed here i am taking into account the percentile method and uh, markov chen approach also if you only consider the percentile method, then it is 30.8% and uh, expected premium per hectare for the, uh, uh, if you consider the Markov chain approach, uh, it comes out to be 43% here instead of 50% that makes changes and that is 29.2%. We suggest that this Markov chain approach and percentile approach has no? to be used. Sir? Yes, sir, I am finishing. Ah, please. Uh, I am acknowledging the grants of Raju Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, Government of Maharashtra for this project and uh, expertise opinion based on this study and uh, guidance for Professor A.P. Gore, retired professor from Pune University and uh, one of the researcher from uh, Jain Irrigation System Limited Jalgao, Mr. K. B. Patil, he has also suggested to take into account maximum temperature for Jalgao district is more important as a risk factor. So I acknowledge their uh, help and uh, references mainly uh, we have used some government uh, resolutions and uh, our two papers for uh, exact distributions of success runs in uh, higher order and to, uh, the one order Markov change and uh, the recent paper we have published Markov chain modeling and stochastic uh, depend on the daily minimum temperature in Mosam journal. Thank you for your attention and I am very much thankful to Professor Satish for this giving me opportunity to present my work here. Thank you, Professor Shinde, uh, for your nice presentation on uh, Markov chain modeling for uh, uh, based on the meteorological data for uh, banana crops. Uh, now the floor is open for uh, discussion. Um, any comments, questions, please? Hello. It's very uh, yes, very interesting. It is a very interesting uh, application oriented uh, and uh, well well connected with the theory Markov chain modeling. It is a very nice work, Professor Shinde. Thank you, sir. Uh, regarding the modeling, uh, the um, uh, what are the other? Uh, measures uh, which you can recommend for comparing the um, uh, efficiency of the model 
of us with other existing models uh smashes like a uh, map map people do like that. here we have uh, fitted markov chain models of order 1 of order 2 of uh, sometime it may go up to order 3 also but we have not come across this and uh, ac uh, as given in uh, many books markov chain modeling fitting of markov chain you can observe from medis book also for uh, this uh, fitting of markov chain is observed for for students i am telling those who are attending they can go through markov chain fitting many students are not conducting this uh, exercise during the practical uh, their practicals they can go through this markov chain modeling for many real life data sets particularly weather data sets in many situation we can come across with markov chain modeling i am talking about uh, maximum temperatures uh, we are thinking about maximum temperatures modeling also in this regard but so far we have not gone through completely any comments or questions from the participants professor huda sir your mic is muted professor huda your mic is muted please yes i am anxious to start my own lecture Actually. thank you for yes should i start sir let us uh, congratulate uh, professor uh, shinde for his nice presentation uh, thank, thank you, you professor shinde thank you thank you now our uh, uh, our next speaker uh, professor huda is uh, on the screen on behalf of the organizing committee of wsta 2023 and um, department of statistics of university of kerala and on professor on behalf of professor satish kumar i welcome professor ds kuda to uh, this uh, uh, prestigious uh, pv sukathme chair session as a speaker uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, professor kuda Professor Dias Kuda is an honorary professor in mathematics of GJ University of Science and Technology. Presently, formerly Professor Kuda was a, a pro vice chancellor of Kurukshetra University, and he has been the head of the department. And uh, he has served in many capacities in many organizations, including CCU University. He is a uh, professor. Kuda has. Uh, supervised several phd candidates for the award of phd degree and sir has published more than 130 papers in journals of national as well as international repute uh, sir has published 12 books apart from that he has uh, authored several chapter chapters in several publications of international repute uh, sir has been uh, honored with several awards and honors including the one uh, by the best researcher award Uh, by indian recently uh, several awards sir has received and uh, which includes the recent of uh, best researcher award by indian institute of technical and scientific research and lifetime achievement award uh, by inso international scientist award on engineering science and medicine sir has a very very lengthy and rich uh, uh, bio data uh, on behalf of the organizing committee it is my pleasure to welcome uh professor ds oda to make his presentation on statistics education in india a review sir is a popular uh, he is an author of several popular articles in on statistics so it will be definitely it will be a very nice um, uh, uh, lecture uh, going to be delivered by professor ds oda professor ds oda uh, you are welcome to make your presentation the time Uh, allocated uh, I mean by the organizing committee is totally 40 minutes please sir yes uh, first of all i feel sorry to be to to be late i could not join in time i i thanks the organizers to give me this opportunity particularly professor satish kumar uh, satish kumar and his other colleagues now i i, I want to start to see with the slides so i i think this this
Yes. Seems that the yeah. Just a minute, Professor. We can share it from here. Yes, it, it is. It is visible to you. No, no, sir. Uh, no. The screen is. Yes, I have. I want to you see. Send this. I could not understand how how to. It is not opening actually. Uh, uh, professor, whether we have to share it from here? Just we can send your uh, presentation material to the organizing committee. Uh, uh, we have. They will help you to we screen have. the uh, slides. Yeah, I have sent. I have already sent. Okay. Yes, it is coming on the screen. Yes, yes. Now you can um, direct uh, the just uh, next uh, only you can or previous so that uh, everything That's again. Fine. That is fine. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Welcome, person. I could not understand. Take one minute. Professor, this uh, whether we need to move. Professor, it seems that the organizing committee is uh, they have uh, uploaded your uh, file on the screen. You can direct them to move the screen wherever, whenever you require. Yes, I. Do. Yes, sir. The first first slide is on the screen. Yes. Yes. It is not opening. Actually, it is not coming. I could not. This is the problem. Yes, this is the problem. Yes, yes. The abstract has come. Yes, yes. Ah, yes. Actually, in the present talk, I will be talking about the statics education, and we, particularly our young friends, must know what is the status of the education, statics education in India, and in the end, some suggestions for its. Future planning and at national and international level has also been suggested for implementation. Next, uh, statics as a subject is about a century old, as you know, and today is being statics day, and I congratulate and actually I pay my tributes to the well-known. Statistician, you see, Malinovices on his, you see, one thirtieth birthday, and on uh, there are other statisticians also who have contributed a lot. And today I will let you know who are others. You might be knowing all of them. During last few decades, it has penetrated into almost all the sciences, like agriculture, biological. Physical, social engineering, medical sciences, its wide and varied applications have led to the growth of many branches such as industrial statistics, biometrics, business statistics, biostatics, and agriculture statistics. These branches have emerged as distinct identities or subjects with the bulk of statistical techniques specified to the, their application areas. The, it was R. F. Fisher, who, whose dedication and continued efforts put the statistical science on a strong mathematical foundation. The theory of experiment designs and other statistical techniques developed by Fisher is the backbone of the agricultural statistics. Next, in the advanced country. Actually, for the question of comparability, or comparability did not arise, but the scenario has changed after globalization and industrialization. Now, the need of statistics of increasing coverage and accuracy becomes more and more insistent. India has already reached this stage. However, the statistical system in other developing countries is still unable to meet the need, and India has. Led actually led in this regard. Yes. Yes. The future of statistics needs to be discussed in view of recent developments 
in information technology such as data mining, data communication, and information processing networks, artificial data collection for the purpose of yes, for the purpose of this and the current statistics methodology based on probabilistics models developed for the analysis of small data sets appears to be inadequate and required some methods to be put forward in the same name of data mining for such purposes. In the present talk, actually, I shall be taking all this statistical system and statistics education at various level, particularly at the MSc and UG level, and in the end, suggestions and recommendations for the future planning will be given. Yes, please. Yes, collection and first is what is ISC, ISS, Indian Statistical System. Collection and use of statistics for administrative purposes in India has a long history, spread over many centuries, Karl Shastra and N. Akbari mentioned the practice of numerical data collection for the purposes of state craft in ancient and medieval India. Mughals had a system of collection and compilation of the crop statistics to help them in land revenues collection. In the same way, British have also system and actually they also used to collection of the socioeconomic data and their system was restricted to a few specific fields like trade, commerce, selected industries, products, population, some basic crops and satisfaction, and not more than that. Yes. The Indian statistical system is one of the largest institutional framework. Having a vast wealth of information, it is the largest network supported by adequate facilities for data management by competent personnel. The system claims a wide coverage of information items, area and population. When we talk about a national statistical system, we can reasonably ask whether such a system possesses the four characteristics of this system and these characteristics are content, structure, communication and control. Next. Next, please. Unfortunately, collection and scrutiny of primary information for processing and handling of data were usually taught like by the government officials and statistics were therefore not considered a popular subject of acquiring skill and experience in pre-independence days. This was the situation before pre-independence days. Now I'm coming to the after independence. Next. Established? Yes. Just after independence, the system of data collection followed by British was found inadequate to meet the necessity of a strong database covering a variety of social and economic aspects. The existing system even did not provide the basic data required for, for uh, estimation of national income, which is essential for assessing performance and progress of the economy. The immediate task therefore was to set up a statistical system capable of filling the large gaps in the data essential for formulating economic plans. A very important step in this direction was the creation of the director, Directorate of National Sample Survey in 1950. Its aim was to collect essential statistics related to the socio-economic conditions and agricultural productions in India. Due to the sustained efforts of the academicians and official statisticians, the Indian statistical system <coughs> have attained the height of the most comprehensive statistical system of a developing country. Yes. Yes, please. Today, 
India has decentralized statistical system, which means centered in the states. Actually, this my purpose is to know that the youngsters must know the system of the India. Uh, it has, it has actually shared. The system has been shared by centered in the states. The demarcation has been done partly on the functional basis and partly on the regional basis. Statistics of items like foreign trade, banking and currency and census are wholly allocated to the center and that of like agriculture and education are assigned to the states. There is also a common category of item known as concurrent list which both the central and states can operate simultaneously to meet their respective requirements. The Department of Statistics of the central government is the apex body in the official statistics of India. The ISS pertains to the collection, compilation and discrimination of data relating to the socio-economic agriculture and industrial status in India. Ministry of Agriculture, the Central Statistical Organization, that's known as CSO, and the National Sampling Service, as known as NSSO, are important agencies of which are involved in collection, uh, collection, compilation, and dissemination of data. Next, CSO is mainly responsible for coordination of statistical activities as well as the maintaining statistical standards. NSSO has been a leading sample survey organization since its establishment in 1950 and continues to conduct major multi-subject surveys that provide valuable data required by the policy makers. NSSO conducts large-scale surveys at the national level and collects the disseminates, collects and disseminates information on different areas. The NSSO, under the scheme of improvement of crop statistics, also provides technical guidance to the states in respect of crop estimation surveys and performs sample checks to assess the quality of primary work done by the state agencies in area and crop estimation surveys. And Department of Planning of Statistics, Ministry of Agriculture, and some other government department institutions and autonomous bodies and non-government organizations are also actively involved in the creation of large database. Friends, actually, Government pays with due attention to the development of the statistics, and all my friends must know that there is a central ministry also statistics and planning. I, as you know, there is no ministry central as mathematics. Only. This is the only, you see, the ministry, this shows the central government gives very, because the importance of statistics, because statistics, as I, I have explained, it, has a so importance. And because the all planning of depends on the static data and data is collected, data is collected, disseminated, and all data is mined, and all this is done by statisticians. Next. Yes. So this is contribution to Indian. There are there have been many statisticians you see who have contributed as a teacher, as a researcher, practitioner to the development of statistics. Many of them have shifted to the advance, and you must be knowing you might have noted an experience also. If you have visited USA, you will so you will find so many Indians well placed. They have you see they part the knowledge as well as the they have worked and contributed a lot to the development of studies at the world level. And many of them have shifted to the, you see, just like, and, and this the science of statistics and have 
indeed left an indelible mark in the statistical literature. Consequently, the status of statistics in India could not be up to the mark as it should have been and brain drain was the main cause for its statistical as most of the eminent statisticians had shifted to the advanced countries. This was the field earlier you, see, you must be knowing the you see in the, in the year of 1960 to 1980 and like that. After that the situation changed and all this. This had a cost of debt Determined effect on statistical education and research in India. However, there is a long list of well known Indian statisticians who made outstanding contribution to the development. In spite of that, some have gone there. We have a long list of the well known statisticians who have contributed a lot to the development of statistics as a separate subject and discipline. Some of them are. You see, they mentioned below. These are the, I think, text. These are the, you must be known, well acquainted, Dr. D. Basu, D. S. Azumogar, T. B. Lahiri, P. C. Malanovicis, C. R. Rao, and R. Masani, P. B. Sukatme. There may be others also, but all cannot be concluded in the talk. Thank you. Next. Yes, realizing the import now school and undergraduate and, and statistical education i will not go in that because sort of time i will come to the next undergraduate and postgraduate please next 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 oh no 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 back back Yes, higher, ed higher education and research. No, no. Postgraduate also. Higher education, yes. Statistics is taught in most of the Indian universities at the postgraduate level. Universities in some states offer both UG as well as PG degrees in statistics. ISI, Calcutta, with its branches in Delhi, Bangalore, and Indian Agriculture Statistics. Research Institutes, IASRI, you must be known well known, Indian Agriculture Statistics Research Institute, Pusa, the Delhi, are engaged in research and teaching. In order to impart training at postgraduate level, leading to MSc and PhD degrees, Calcutta University established the Departments of Statistics in 1943. All there are I think this is the oldest university as far as my information is concerned. And there are several, several other universities have established separately departments of statistics and started postgraduate program in statistics. Some of these universities, which were, are well known nationally and internationally in statistics education are Calcutta, Delhi, Punjab, Madurai, Bombay, Madras, Rajasthan, etc. This is there may be more, there are more also, but I can't give the list of all. Yes. Next. In addition to this universities, Indian Statistical Institute of at Calcutta, Delhi, Bangalore are in part in statistical education at postgraduate level. These institutions and universities are mentioned above, just like I have. The major share of credit for the past and current development of statistical education in India, at least they have the major share. There is an international center located at Calcutta whose eminent statisticians where eminent statisticians from every corner of the world are invited to deliver seminars and talks in Indian statistical institutes, degree courses of statistics are taught 
to cover a wide range of subjects somewhat analogous to courses or in medicine and engineering this institutes statistical theory and different branches of applied statistics and economic planning to suit special needs of india form a large part of the teaching program this is the actually unique thing they they have this applied statistics economic planning and in addition to other branches facilities are provided to the students to become familiar with a number of scientific subjects here the emphasis is also given to the practical courses like statistical analysis and interpretation of data next most of the universities in india award an msc degree in statistics without thesis you must be knowing there are some most of the university state universities and all this they give they award the mms without thesis while in some universities a thesis or a dissertation is a partially requirement for post graduate degree in statistics i think now most of the university are are do, are doing this in isi iasri the post graduate student in statistics are required to specialize one of the fields namely economics public health agriculture business management marketing and computer applications experts in their own settings teach them two papers on the chosen subject a course ending project work in the real life setting is a part of curriculum at these universities in agriculture statistics this is very important actually irsi is taking it you see is has a significant contribution in the agriculture statistics in agriculture statistics the most significant contribution of indians is towards the methods of estimation of crops crops yield through crop cutting experiments in addition to the statistical wing of the indian council of agriculture research and the indian statistical institutes agriculture states universities have also contributed significantly to the development of experimental designs for judging the optimum size and shape of plots through crop cutting experiments because i had worked in agriculture university as haryana agriculture university sar i think that's also well known the university we had had the department of the statistics mathematics and statistics i know state universities are also not less in contribution to the development of the statistics education next professor oh there are five more only five more minutes please professor khoda yes five more there are five five only five more minutes five minutes five minutes okay yeah. okay next next give me the suggestions and that next yes uh, the time has come to introduce educational program appropriate for statistics as a fully developed new technology and that calls for the utilization of wide range of scientific knowledge to help in solving scientific and practical problems as fisher has pointed out a professional statistician as a technologist must talk the language of both theoretician as well as the practitioner also that's you see theory at the you see practice experimental both are stress education of statisticians like that of, of other no, technologists must have a broad base second the challenges in statistics education are never trivial but uh, offer opportunities in adding to the richness of statistics as a discipline and a servant university structure should tend to increase competition in addition to cooperate among facilities they should 
you see and creates competition in addition to the cooperation among faculties. Next, uh, the awareness in the statistical profession and importance of statistics education is the need of the hour. The commitment of teachers to their students and good practices of statistics will lay excellent foundation for the future. However, the challenge to increase awareness and acknowledgement across the country needs cooperation with mathematical sciences and other disciplines. The future of the statistics needs to be discussed in view of recent development in information technology, such as data missing, data communication, and information processing networks and the requirements of end users. The current statistical methodology based on probabilistic models developed for the analysis of small data sets appears to be inadequate and requires some methods to be put forward in the name of data mining for self purposes. Next. A statistician must have recourse training on the analysis packages such as SPSS, SAS, etc. During the training period, he may be asked to handle practical problems, case studies, and small research projects of applied nature. Training should also include the preparation of layout for field experiments and their actual implementation in the field. Developments in statistics are beneficial for both the government departments as well as the private industries. Therefore, research scholars and faculty from the universities and research institutions involved in statistical research must be provided with fellowship and research grants from government departments and private industries also to the tune of advanced countries. In other countries, you see there all such, you see the private industry, private concern, all finance companies, they provide actually uh, fellows, research, research grants, research fellows to the PhD students. In, in the 20th century, statics was considered a fundamental scientific tool and the basis for the experiment scientific method. Now, in 21st century, it is not possible to think of research projects without statistical support. Thus, a imperative to include this discipline in the curriculum at undergraduate level and postgraduate studies. Next. Yes. Professor? This last one, two, two minutes. Global, last, global communication Okay, there are some new emerging areas in statistics which have gained importance due to their application to all branches of science and engineering. And now there is these methods are to be included in the syllabus, and these are the data mining, industrial statistics, statistics modeling, actuarial statistics, biostatistics, computational statistics, data analysis data compression, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, etc. This, these are the, this is the newly developed. The last four or five are, are to be introduced for every course of UG and PG. Yes, last. Next. Yes, these are the references you can see. And I think this is the end of my talk. I once I'm very happy that the organizer has given the opportunity and Professor Satyaji, Satish Kumarji and other listeners, thank you for listening my talk. Though this is not so research oriented, but it has given a glimpses of some education and some what what we should plan to be introduced in our industry. So that's all from my side. Yes, any question please, any query? I, I will be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Koda, for your nice presentation. 
on uh, the statistics education as a review we have uh, professor huda made his presentation in three parts uh, statistical system origination and uh, uh, till the current development and statistics education from the earlier days from the current one uh, with uh, update uh, on topics uh, for current statistics education and uh, his suggestions and uh, recommendations for the development further development of statistical system and statistical edu education in india uh, thank you professor huda and uh, uh, before inviting the participants to make their suggestions or comments or questions uh, i wish to add a point in your la recommendation there are a lot of things you have presented among the one of the point f on recommendations and suggestions uh, you can also include that the uh, mhrd of indian government can conduct the csir ugc net examination on statistics with a separate subject not as along with the mathematics previously the examination okay, okay. examination was conducted separately for statistics but uh, for the last two, more than two or uh, two decades uh, the examination is conducted along with the mathematics right. students Uh, we are sharing we are sharing uh, the fellowships with our uh, uh, fellow mathematicians so it, uh, by that they are also losing their opportunities and uh, statistics researchers are also losing their opportunities so it can be a suggestion to include that it is a long uh, long pending demand from the statistics uh, researchers and statistics teachers for conducting that uh, UGC CSIR UGC net examination on statistics education separately because that also expressed that also uh, um, that also that is also extended in state wise examinations are also because state governments are also conducting examinations for uh, state level eligibility test they also keep containing that they keep conducting the examination along with mathematics for statistics so that uh, makes a little bit trouble to the statistics researchers the statistics students uh, for I mean for their uh, higher positions or the fellowships so uh, that is what i want to include and uh, of course there is a fine chapter uh, which is uh, which is also written by, by it is published by the state government of tamil nadu for school education there is a separate chapter on official statistics the book was prepared by uh, authored by um, a team of uh, statistics teachers uh, and uh, professor g gopal is also a main contributor for that chapter it is a it is a very nice uh, writing on uh, official statistics uh, now uh, Uh, congratulations uh, to professor huda for uh, making this presentation uh, in come uh, in in um, in felicitation of the national statistics day statistical system statistical education and uh, suggestions for the development now the floor is open for uh, discussions comments questions are invited one thing i want to add actually your suggestion it, is, it should not be my suggestion only let us resolve in this conference seminar in, in yes. this well, international let us have a pass a resolution what you have said this is good this should be as a resolution you see yes. in the end it should be put as a resolution on the because this is a gathering of a very big guys from the whole country and i think uh, this will be a better if we resolve that the all participants resolve this and it should be sent to the government okay i yes, think sir. this is my proposal just i want to remind that that is the thing you have that feeling i just i want to remind that it shall be an, an important suggestions yes 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 i will add to my suggestion this is sure. not by now this is all let us resolve it it is a resolution it is from the all statistics teachers professors researchers Yes, it is yes. Sir. Buddha yes. is ready to uh, uh, interact with the, the participants. Professor Buddha, are there any separate uh, uh, publications on uh, official studies? Separate uh, uh, articles are there um, uh, in resonance, uh, resonance uh, like in journals like Resonance. on indian statistical system official statistics are there any separate uh, books on official statistics in india i think there there is one or two books but i don't know so much equity actually i am basically i am mathematician 
But because I have worked in the agriculture university with the self study department, I have added one or two student studies also. That's why I attempted to learn this thing and attempted to collect all these data. And Reserve Bank of India is also generating databases, a large databases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that, that's 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 right. Economics. And actually, the, as I talked, there is a department of statistics and planning that that have the you see good collections and all these good officers. I I met them at the you see Hyderabad or them some people, and they are doing very good job. And the importance lies there. All these things which you are talking, they are collected by them. If we plan statistics and planning department, send industry even. Even that's a ministry. That's a ministry, not only department. Sure. Also. Sure. Anyway. Well, are there any questions, comments from the participants? If there are no questions or comments, uh, let us uh, thank uh, Professor Huda for making his nice presentation. Thank you, thank you, Professor Huda. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I hand over the session to the RBC committee. Professor Satish Kumar, I thank you and uh, the, your team and the organizing committee of WS2 2023 for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Loganathan, sir, for chairing the session in a very nice way and a timely way. But also, we will wish to extend our gratitude uh, for the wonderful talks made by uh, Professor Huda and Professor Shinde in this session. Uh, in fact, in the, the improvement of the statistical education in, uh, is a need of the hour because other disciplines also interfere and uh, those who are, do not have uh, much qualification in statistics, even the postgraduate degree in statistics, are also handling statistics in a uh, rigorous way and uh, which, which creates problems, the misuse of statistics. In several years, sure. it's the need of our. We have to take uh, care of. And uh, Professor Huda is a very uh, kindly point out several things, and uh, we can uh, do some uh, as as mentioned by Logan Nathan sir. We, have, we need the uh, separate session, in fact, you know, on these things. Right. Thank you. It is uh, a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. It is, it is a pleasure for me. Okay. Thank you for your wonderful talks. Now let us move to the next session because we have a little bit there. Uh, move to the next session. Uh, I hope uh, Risa is there. Risa? Yes, sir. Please, uh, introduce the chair and uh, uh, do the needful for the further procedures of this. Mm -hmm. A warm welcome to everyone. I hereby welcome you all to the technical session 14 with session chair Dr. Manoj Kumar, Aschim Professor, Department of Statistics. Center University, Haryana. He has done his PhD in Bayesian Interference and Survival Analysis at Banaras Hindu University. His main research interests include Bayesian Inference, Ecological Models, Survival Analysis, Stochastic Process, and Prognosis Sensory. He was awarded Nasi Swarna Jayanti Puriskar and Best Paper Presentation Award during 89th Annual Session Academy in Physical Science. He was an organizing member in National Workshop on STDAR and member of Departmental Research Committee, Central University of Haryana. We are really lucky to have you with us, sir, sharing this session today. I extend a warm welcome to all of you and kindly request to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Okay. Okay, very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, very good morning to all. And uh, I would also very much Hardly thanks to Professor Satish sir uh, for organizing this uh, again the WSTA in 2023 20, uh, Department of Statistics, a school of uh, physical science and mathematical sciences to invite me to chair this session. First of all, uh, I I war welcome to the Professor uh, Dr. Mahesh Kumar Panda sir and uh, in this session uh, three three uh, three speakers uh, dr mahesh kumar panda sir and uh, dr dinesh uh, devendra kumar and uh, another uh, another one also uh, that's name 
Dennis, Dennis uh, Uma Maria. So uh, this session is start from 11.50 to 13, 11.15 uh, to 13.15. Uh, uh, I think uh, to, uh, 25 minutes uh, for the every of the uh, uh, every of these speakers and five minutes for the question answer session. So uh, uh, I would uh, like to uh, invite the uh, Mahesh sir. Mahesh sir is here. Can you hear me, Panda? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. sir. Good morning, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Mahesh Kumar Panda, sir, completed his PhD from the Department of Statistics in University of Delhi in the field of the design and analysis of experiment. His, uh, he has about uh, 15 years of the experience in academics, research and ad administration. He was also received a scholarship under the Erofrets uh, Emerasmus and Mundus project in Europe and the work as a faculty of mathematical and informatics and Wellness University, Lutiana in 2016. He has a very vast knowledge in statistics and he has also visited, visited uh, Indian uh, Statistical Institute Kolkata as a visiting science, uh, scientist during the academic year 2017. He has the interest, uh, teaching interest in uh, major theory, design of and experiments, machine learning, the statistical inferences, simulation and multivariate analysis. Currently, is he, his research interest in uh, focus in optimal design for the models for the mixture experience, uh, polynomial research model and generalized linear model. Now he is also actively uh, actively developed for the R codes uh, for the difference of the uh, unsolvable problems uh, uh, through the R and Python and the MATLAB. So Panda sir has very good knowledge in statistics. Uh, and so uh, on this platform, I think uh, many people are enjoy from this platform. So I would like to invite Panda sir to hand over the session and uh, to. Uh, discuss the talk on the R optimal design for the logistic regression model. So I would like to invite Panda sir and yes sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, first of all, I'm thankful for uh, the uh, you know brief introduction from Dr. Manoj sir. Uh, issue is that I go I share it with Dr. There is some uh, sound breaking. Sound is breaking. So just uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, some network issue. Uh, sound is breaking, my sir. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe I to my smartphone itself because no, I got problem with my laptop. Let me change it. My is my voice is clear now. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. Y yes. Is it better? No, it is yes. better. So, no, sir. sir, I just request you. Uh, no, please uh, share my slides, sir, because I am I'm not, I'm not able to join through my laptop. So, if okay. you can share the slides, I will able to you know, discuss through my smartphone. But then you have uh, sent it? Uh, no, I, I have sent my... So, yes, yes, sir. I have sent it to your email already. Okay, I shall check. Okay we, okay, we shall share from share it from here. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, so good morning, uh, mm, uh, good morning to all of you. So myself, Dr. Mohesh Kumar Ponda. Actually, I work uh, pre right now. My area of interest is basically I'm working in generalized linear model, and basically my uh, you know I, I work in the optimal design domain. The so can you have the first slide, sir? Introduction slide. Next, yes, next, sir. Uh, yes. So the problem with the generalized linear model is basically whenever you like to find the optimal design, the optimal design 
problem is you know uh, it is little bit different from other uh, you know, orderly regression model because in this case whenever you wish to find the optimal design it will depend upon the unknown parameter although you want to estimate the unknown parameters so in this direction uh, chernop 1950 he proposed an algorithm uh, actually he proposed an uh, algorithm uh, basically to find uh, you know you guess some uh, a design having some uh, points and basically try to find the local optimality so the problem you know uh, throughout the globe you will see very rare people work in generalized linear model and especially in optimality and you find uh, that uh, uh, as compared to other uh, you know other fields you find very less number of papers in these directions because it's it's really challenging okay so in this direction if you go for the next slide review of literature yes so uh, this work is basically concentrated on logistic regression model there are other models like gamma model poisson regression model but uh, this work is specific to logistic regression model and in this direction uh, the first you uh, know uh, abedel bassit and plackett 83 they established that a d optimal k optimal design is a two point design whenever the k is a even number and three point design when k is a odd number subsequently minkin 97 he obtained the uh, you know the most uh, uh, regularly used optimality criteria d optimal design although you know uh, by relaxation some constraint impose on the design space later on chalner and lantis 89 they discuss the bayesian d optimal design for logistic regression model and then for at or 1992 they obtain c optimal and d optimal designs next slide next slide please yes uh, date hanes uh, 94 they found the e optimal designs for the same logistic model and this is matho and sina bikasina uh, this paper is published in jspi they derived the unified approach of d a and e optimal designs uh, uh, the last paper i think it is drawer and stanbock 2006 and magri ekelstone 2008 they reported optimal designs for two variable binary logistic model with interaction uh, next next slide okay so if you see the logistic model logistic model is you know the format i have used is the logit p is equal to beta not plus beta 1 d1 plus beta 2 d2 here i am interested in basically the dose response curves one so i am looking at d1 and d2 so d1 d2 are positive value and beta not beta 1 and beta 2 i am uh, these are uh, you know this model involves three unknown parameters Uh, and i assume that this uh, you know these parameters are uh, beta 1 and beta 2 specially are strictly positive and due to practical consideration one can actually you know take the beta not value as negative values next okay so what uh, we have done in this case that we have uh, you know scale this uh, parameter into you know something like i defined z1 is equal to beta1 d1 and z2 is equal to beta2 d2 in the previous model and just i can have a, this additive model of logit p is equal to beta0 plus z1 plus z2 for a, uh, a non negative and z2 would be also non negative uh, next slide please okay so uh, in optimal design there are two types of design people look for one is approximate design and one is discrete design setup so here uh, the work is basically based on the continuous design setup or approximate design setup where i will be interested in the distinct point as you, you can see that previously we uh, you know our variable of interest was z1 and z2 i am going to choose r setup binary points like z1 i and z2 i and i'm going to assign the weights w1 w2 wr so that knows the sum of the weights should be one and now for this design setup the moment matrix can be obtained like this that you know take these points evaluate at f of f of z and f, uh, then you also find the f dash z and just try to find out this summation sum over i goes from 1 to r wi f of zi and f dash z 
So if you actually work for D optimality, the target is basically you have to maximize the determinant of this matrix. So look for the uh, design which will maximize this determinant of this matrix. When you look for the A optimality design, A optimality target set the, you know, take the inverse of this matrix and then try to minimize the trace of this, uh, trace of that inverse of the matrix. So next slide, please. Yes, so if you see in this case, uh, this moment matrix would be formed, as you said that I have, you know, it can be expressed like this, that the F of Z into F dash Z would be of this form, where this K is basically related to the link function, which is nothing but uh, we can see that it is E to the power mu divided by e to one plus E to the power mu square, where, you know, this mu is defined as beta naught plus Z1 plus Z2. So next slide, please. Yes. Now, whenever you work, you know, uh, in any optimality criteria, you have to start with the initial design. So as I said that Highness et al. 2007, they have already obtained the D optimal design. So our focus was basically start with this design setup and just try to find out what should be the W so that, you know, you can have R optimality criteria. So we have considered three type of design, uh, two types of design. One is three point design. Uh, as we know that this model involves three parameters, beta naught, beta one, and beta two. So just I focus on the Hainai's paper, Hainai-Etel paper, a three-point design and four-point design. Here, you can see that the first three-point design, which actually a symmetric design with reference to zero, zero. If you consider the zero, zero, it is basically a symmetric one. And the four-point design, the last one, you can see that here the mu values are these mu values are complementary to each other. So you can see that here minus mu, minus mu, mu, and mu. And the weight has been assigned. Again, it is a mass symmetric design. So with respect to origin, you know, you have to see the position of the points. And accordingly, you have to put the mass equal. So in, in that sense, it is W, W, half minus W, and half minus W. Now the objective is to find the W so that you can get a R optimal design. Next slide. Yes. So actually, these are in uh, optimal design. Most of the work is dominated with uh, D optimality because you know D optimality has the flexibility of you work it uh, in the maximize the determinant of the matrix and which is a easier task as compared to other optimality criteria. So mostly optimal design has been discussed in D optimality. So it is like data in '97. He proposed another criteria, something known as R optimality criteria. The paper is published in Journal of Royal Statistical Society. So the idea is when you need to go for R optimality. Whenever the experiment wishes to minimize the volume of the confidence system for unknown parameter based on conformity T intervals, then he should target at D opti R optimality criteria in comparison to D optimality criteria. Now, what is the R optimality criteria? You find the inverse of the M, M of Z, what we have already discussed, take the M inverse of that matrix, and just you multiply the diagonal entries. And that will basically what? It will be a function psi of Z, and your target should be, you know, you have to get the point, you know, weights so that the product of this, uh, you know, these diagonal entries should be minimal. So in Actually, if you see the literature of R optimality, in after 97, it is 2016, Liu et al. has published one paper, basically that was related to response surface methodology. And now already 20 to 30 papers has been published in R optimality. But this is the first attempt we have made in direction of generalized linear model. The other, you know, uh, R optimality design was discussed in supersaturated design. It is design, it, it is also discussed in mixture design set, setup and other polynomial design. But for the first times, we have made an attempt to discuss the R optimality criteria in uh, generalized linear model. Next slide, please. Now, there is something called as equivalence theorem is there, which actually helps you to check whether the design you have got is actually, it is the necessary and sufficient conditions 
so you can cross check it is the confirmatory criteria to check whether your design is r optimality or not so again this result was uh, you know it can be cited from date 97 next slide please so uh, what uh, this uh, work is basically having two theorems uh, the what we have started with the as i said heine et al we consider the three point design and as you know that generalized linear model setup whenever you are trying to find out the optimal design it will again depends upon the parameters so here we have make certain assumption that we are saying that mu greater than beta not because we are saying that it is in the positive quadrant so mu minus beta not should be positive that's why it is mu greater than beta not so what is our results is that the design dies start that assign the weight of 0.2324 to the point mu minus beta not 0 0.5352 to the point 00 and 0.2324 to the zero minus mu minus beta is it actually is an r optimal design in this subset you know it is a basically the whole in the first quadrant it is a subset of that that is nothing but the delta notation i have used so this actually this design is an r optimal design in this subset of this first quadrant only okay so how we are going to prove let us go for the next slide so let us find out the m of xi matrix using the design setup try to find out the inverse of the matrix next slide and if you see now the inverse of the matrix next slide please yes it is it involves hyperbolic function now the target is what once you have got this inverse matrix you try to multiply the diagonal entries and if you multiply the diagonal entries then you get a psi xi function okay now if you wish to uh, you know get the maxima you want to do the maxima and minima then you have to take the derivative so as you can see that whenever you wish to do the derivative one uh, you know you will get this derivatives with respect to mu and w which is governed by equation 7 and equation 8 now let us try to expand this equation 7 and 8 there are few things you get from this equations first equation gives you w is equal to 2 then the second one is cos hyperbolic function minus 1 and the third equation so here you can see that w is equal to 2 weight cannot be 2 and cos hyperbolic function cannot be minus 1 so these are the two absurd cases so we should not consider that so our focus will be only on the third equation or third case next slide please if you see now again it gives you three cases w2 cos hyperbolic 0 and the six cases so again w2 and cos hyperbolic 0 basically leads to mu is equal to 0 again cases hi b and b are absurd cases so our focus will be only on case b i so we are left with case 3 and case b i so let us go for the next slide if you solve the case 3 then you get beta not is equal to mu minus 4 by 3 cos cos hyperbolic function minus cot hyperbolic function now you know this hyperbolic function when you work with this you know you you cannot generalize your, you know it it gives you a expression but numerically it cannot be used so what we thought of using the velocity expansion of cos hyperbolic function and cot hyperbolic function we consider only the first terms and replace these values so that's that's how we got the beta not value next the case 6 has been solved and it is case 6 it was a quadratic equation which gives you two values and only one value is actually feasible and that is given in the next slide you can see w star that is equal to 5 minus root over 13 by 3 that gives you 0.4648 now we have got the mu star we have got the optimal value of mu mu and w star now what we are interested to see the necessary and sufficient condition satisfy or not that is the equivalence theorem which we have done in the next slide so you know using that value basically we obtain the quadratic form phi the j i stars which is there in the next slide please and then what we try to do for the difference values of z1 and z2 in the delta region we try to plug in and we have so from this plot you can see that it's very clear that the maximum value is 3 Well, that is basically it tells you that the maximum value of the quadratic form three means, and actually as for the equivalence theorem, these three 
points, you can see that these three points must be the support points of the design points. So which you can see in the next slides that we have shown in table two, that at the design points, these values are exactly equal to three and for other points, it is less than three, okay? And this proves the equivalence theorem and hence this theorem is proved. Now we also try to see what happens to four point design, which we have discussed in the next slide. Again, we have made some assumption, yes. So here our assumption is zero less than mu less than minus beta naught. And what we are going to show that you cannot find a mass symmetric design having support point, four support point for the same models. So the process is same. You try to find the moment of the moment matrix or information matrix based on the four point design. Next slide. And just try to find out the size j function, basically the product of the diagonal entries of the inverse of the matrix. And just, you know, what do you do? You take the partial derivative and just see what are the more than half. So which is meaningless. Again, this case cannot be considered. If you consider case C and G, it gives you W is equal to half. That means you cannot be a force point design. So again, it cannot be considered. So what we are left with case D and case H, and if you expand actually for different values of beta naught, we try to find out the numerical values of you know these cases. Again, we it actually does not satisfy the restriction that zero less than W less than half and zero less than minus beta naught, the mu should be in this between these two values, these constraints are not satisfied. In that sense, we conclude that we cannot find a four point mass symmetric design for the model equation two. Okay, so conclusion, next. So it is observed that the construction of the R optimal design depends upon the two unknown parameters to a scale transformation of the explanatory variables whereas the intercept parameter provides the basic structure of the design. As you can see that this problem is only solved for three parameters. It can be extended to more parameters. And, you know, it is not an easy task. Solving this would be, uh, you know, it, it involves much, much more algebra. Okay, thank you. References are there. Thank you. So I'm thank you. Much. Okay, thank you, yeah. Panda sir, uh, Mahesh sir. Your lecture is really very nice, and uh, we are enjoy very much uh, from your lecture. And you have discussed about how the application of the field of regression analysis, how to do the optimal solution for the designing. And but a uh, little bit, uh, very small uh, for curiosity about your uh, problem to ask a, a yes. very little bit questions. Uh, how to work this approximation for this design through the R? Yes, let me tell you, when you work in actually R, as I said, I actually I really work in R, especially for the class purpose. But I try to solve the problem also through R. Let me tell you, whenever you are working in R, you have to write your own code. These okay. codes should be not available. So yes. what actually I do basically, uh, the R has one uh, you know, problem. The problem is it does not read variables. Okay. So when you, when you are writing a program, it should be input value must be defined. Yes. And then every time what you do, you take a function command. Yes. And you have to write a code. Either you are writing EPLS loop or for loop. It should be a function base. And within but the function, you try it, it should be a macro one. So that no, whenever you are giving the input, it should give you output. Okay, okay. okay? But the uh, question is that yes. uh, how to choose the initials uh, for this? As problem? I said, there is uh, yeah. in generalized linear model, that is yeah. the most, uh, that is the difficulty. There is no one has actually, there, there is no, no theorem or main result is available. It is just, as I said, Kernop 53 say that you have to guess the parameters and you know, you start with doing, the, try to find out the optimal design. So okay. sometimes you may get and sometimes you may not get. Okay, okay. So that is you. why, you know, that is why people don't work on this generalized linear model. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Exactly, but uh, your uh, work is very nice. Okay. So have any one questions, uh, dear participants? Uh, have any questions? Uh, I, I think, uh, Mahesh, sir, there is no any yes. questions uh, from the participants. Uh, 
okay and uh, thank you uh, thank you thank you so very, much very nice so i would like to invite the next session uh mahesh sir you ha ah, yes sir okay uh, now the another uh, lecture uh, for the another lecture uh, will be taken by uh, dr devendra kumar and uh, he uh, devendra kumar did his uh, msc mphil and phd from the aligarh muslim university aligarh he has received in the he has served in the department of statistics at amity university noida from the august 2012 to june 2016 after that dr kumar is a founder of the department of statistics at amity university noida he has been a, a member of the area of the advisory committee and the board of study in the statistics and as a member of the various academic body at the amit university but now a day he is working as a associate professor uh, in the department of statistics central university of haryana and uh, uh, he has a many more responsibility in our uh, in the department of statistics central university of haryana also he had been received the ugc fellowship during the amphil and phd at mul the year he has guided five phd and publications more than 150 research publication in international and national reputed journals mr kumar has organized a more than five conferences and workshop and many more my uh, the current area of his current area of the research in the order statistics distribution theory mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. statistical inferences mm -hmm. he has received a in uh, from the several university of the delivered lecture in this works of and conferences on the application of the r software for the packages for the last few year back he has also got the very good prestigious award from the central university of haryana for the best researcher award so i would like to invite uh, professor uh, uh, devendra kumar for the uh, for this session to present his or her uh, research devin sir please thank can you, you hear me thank you dr manoj kumar and uh, uh, manoj kumar is my colleague and recently <laughs> dr manoj kumar is appointed recently appointed as a department of city statistics university of delhi <laughs> and uh, uh, very good afternoon all of you especially i thank you oh, professor tees kumar inviting me for this talk in the in this webinar so my slide is visible i yeah it is it is it is visible, not visible but it is uh, a white only white oh, nothing is uh, there in the well, sir your slide is not visible yeah okay. okay once again you have to share Please try to move the slides if it is ah uh, a blank sheet is appearing a blank sheet uh, sorry blank slide
I think it is visible. Yes, yes. And now it is fine, bro, sir. Now it is fine. You can please go May ahead. You proceed, okay. sir. Your voice is. There is there is some something with regard to your audio. Some problem with regard to your audio. Oh. We can't hear. We can't hear you. There is some problems with your audio. So there may be some network. Okay. Yes. Yes. I think, uh, sir, there is some network issue. I think network uh, issues. Yeah. Mm. Please try it again. Try again to share the screen and uh, unmute your mic and please. Sir, my slide is visible now. Visible? Yes, yes. It is visible and voice is clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. 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 Now this. Okay. Now this. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, despite being an old edge statistic itself, ordered random variable has recently drawn the attention of numerous academic due to their versatility. Numerous real-world application, including data pertaining to flood, drought, reliability analysis, quality control, and strength of materials. and real life application highlight the importance of these order statuses and their movements for instance if a product or item highly reliable the duration of the failed item will also be highly reliable which will result a product that is too expensive in terms of both time and money this characteristic may be difficult for Tester to have sufficient knowledge of the product in the brief period of time. A petitioner must therefore, from the few early failures, for forecast the failure of upcoming item. Movements of order sets are frequently the foundation of these predictions. A numerous, a number of paper and book on order statistics, their distributional properties have been recently published. Among them are Balakrishnan Kohan. Anol et al. 1992, David and Nagraja, and many more. Additionally, uh, due to the multiple application of order statistics, numerous author have carried out extensive research on numerous form of order data and perform point prediction and goodness of fit test, and also obtain maximum likelihood estimate and best linear and bias estimator for the scale and location parameters of the distribution based on complete and type second sensor samples. For more information, reader may consult the writing of Balakrishnan Kohan, 1991, and Simulan Thomas, 1987, and many more. So recently, Mansoor et al. Uh, 2020-20 developed the Poisson Nadraja Hagai distribution, a new three-parameter three compounded extended exponential distribution. The distribution is quite acceptable, adaptable, and can be used to model survival data. Well, the failure rate can be increasing, decreasing. Downside, uh, upside down, bus up shape and butt up shape. Some of the model mathematically property have been discussed. Using complete and sensor data, they further obtain the maximum likelihood estimator of the model parameters. Ali et al. 2020-21 investigated this distribution after that and came up then traditional estimator. They also acquire Bayes estimator for the parameters. So the cumulative distribution function. And probability density function of the Poisson-Nadraja-Hagai distribution are respectively given in equation one and two. So clearly, if tau equal to delta equal to one, the parameter, the uh, uh, power Nadraja-Hagai Poisson-Nadraja-Hagai distribution reduced to the Poisson exponential distribution introduced by Kuss in two thousand seven. 
so I, I, in this section i will discuss the single moment of the order statistics so let x1 x2 xn be the random sample of size n from the power poisson uh, nadraj hagai distribution and x1 x1 less than equal to x2 less than equal to xn be the corresponding order statistics then the probability density function of rth order statistics given by in the form of equation 3 and the joint density function of rth and sth order statistics is given by in equation 4 Order statistics have widely used in various situations such as engineering reliability, survival studies, lifetime analysis, quality control, and goodness of fit test. And order statistics in their function play a vital role in theoretical and practical problems. To cite an example of the applicability of the order statistic, let us consider the life length of k out of n system, which is made up the n identical components with independent length, life length. Then n minus k plus one th order statistics. In a sample of size n is x n minus k plus one. If k equal to one, the system will know as the parallel system. That is the system and function as long as any of n components survives. However, if k equal to n, it is known as the series system. As another example of the order status can be applied when the time period of the fail failed item is high. The corresponding reliability is also high. In such case, the product turn out the expensive both in terms of cost and time. thus it becomes difficult to want to know about the item performance sufficiently in short period of time and therefore one would require few early item failure data prediction of the uh, failure of items for the order statistics corresponding properties as well as the statistical inference issues are crucial importance and have extensively studied by many authors due to the widely applic applications of the order statistics in lifetime analysis it is worth discussing such statistical properties under different situation however to best of my knowledge there are no reported the poisson nadra hagai distribution based on order statistics in the literature so the jth moment of the rth order statistics is given by in equation 5 if we put j1 equal to 1 then we get the uh, the mean of the rth order statistics from power nadra hagai distribution And if we put r equal to one, then we get the uh, the jth moment of the first order statistics. If we put r equal to n, we get the jth moment of the nth order statistics. So in table one, in table one, this one we uh, uh, we report the value of the mean variance in skewness and kurtosis of the rth order statistics from Poisson Nadraj Hagai distribution for different value of the parameter. R equal to one to ten and n equal to one to ten. So from one, so from table one, we see that we increase the value of the tau and decrease the mean variance in skewness of the kurtosis of the uh, rth order statistic from power nadra jagai distribution. And next we move to the product moment of the order statistics. The product moment of the order statistics is also useful for finding out the covariances of the Rth and Sth order statistics. So the Rth and Sth order statistics, uh, joint order statistics given in the equation six. If we put J1 and J2 equal to one, we get the product moment of the Rth and Sth order statistics from uh, Poisson Nadraj Hagai distribution. So in table two, we present the value of the product moment and the covariance of the Rth and Sth order statistics. In table two, we can see that. We put increase the value of delta and r, uh, increase the value of delta r and n. We um, we see that the product moment and uh, the covariance are uh, decreasing. So these are the table. Continue the table two and the product moment and covariance of the r at order statistics. We put uh, the for the value of r equal to one to ten and uh, and also n equal to one to ten. Next we. Find the unknown parameter of the Poisson Nadraj Hagai distribution with the help of the other order statistics. So based on the power Nadraj Hagai distribution, x1, x2, xn, and uh, uh, the probability density function given in equation two, the likelihood function of the parameter can be written as in the form of equation seven. And the take the log likelihood function, we find out the uh, log likelihood function in given by equation eight. And we derivate with respect to tau, delta, and n in both side, including zero. We find the three normal equations 
given equation 9 10 and 11 so any numerical iterative method can be used to solve the equation 9 10 and 11 for tau delta n and since the mles for tau delta n are not in the closed form so we use the non linear uh, minimization nlm method uh, to get the mle of tau delta n which can be obtained by using the initial guess value for the parameter as result of mle tau delta n may be derived as tau cap mle and delta cap mle and eta cap mle respectively and next uh, we find the parametric boot step confidence interval the confidence interval for the parameter of poisson nadraja hagai distribution are constructed using the boot system method in this section using mle here we take the count of the standard boot step percentile boot step and bias corrected percentile boot step method for boot stepping confidence interval the algorithm for the boot step approach is discussed in the uh, uh, this thing so the standard boost step uh, is given by in the form of the some mathematical formula and the percentage uh, booster method is also given in some formula and bo bo bias corrected percentage booster step is given by in in this some mathematical formula to examine the various confidence interval we take uh, into the account their estimate average width and coverage probabilities which is provided as given by average coverage tau average uh, average width is delta and average width is uh, eta and similarly the corresponding uh, coverage probability tau delta and eta where li and ui denote the 100 1 minus gamma percent confidence interval based on k uh, replicates so we conduct the simulate simulation study the behavior of the proposed approach of the estimate in the parameter tau delta and eta of the poisson nadraj hagai distribution is evaluated and com compared in this section using their respective MSCs. Additionally, the effectiveness of the three bias corrected confidence interval under the consideration is evaluated in relation to their average breadth and coverage probabilities. In simulation study, we take the account of the sample sizes and 20, 30 and 50. We have considered the different set of the parameter value tau delta and uh, eta that is 0 0.80, 0 0.50 and 1.0 and so on. The original sample used to create are equal to 1000 boost system sample for each design, which are taken k equal to 1000 times repeated. Each boost system sample size has uh, sample has a size of n. So table four contains the simulated result of estimated tau delta n that uh, were taken into consideration. Result in table four shows that for all parameter value taken into consideration, MSC decreases sample size increase in all circumstances, demonstrating the constant consistency of the method of the estimation taken into consideration for our study and lower average width of the high coverage probability serve as the basis of the bias uh, corrected confidence uh, comparison when comparing the uh, coverage probability we take into the account of normal values of 95 percent the result in uh, table 4 shows the confidence interval and percent of boost provide the high per, coverage probability for all configuration in the research, but confidence interval of boost uh, bias corrected percentile boost system provide a smaller average width. The average width also follow the order statuses, the bias corrected uh, percentile will less than uh, percentile boost step less than standard boost for all setting taken into consideration the paper among of the bias that were uh, taken into consideration. Therefore, we come to conclusion that the bias corrected percentile uh, Technics is better than any of BCIN of the uh, Poisson Nadra Jagai distribution. So these are the uh, table four for uh, average width MSC uh, coverage probability for the sample size 20, 30, and 50, 100. And next we move to the location, we estimate the location and scale parameter. Let x1, x2, x1 be a random sample of size n from the poisson nadra jagai distribution with probability density function as scale parameter of the poisson nadra jagai distribution is given by equation 12 and the pdf location scale parameter in given in equation 30 so let x1 less than equal to x2 less than equal to s x c and c is the sensor scheme represent type second right sensor sample from the location scale parameter poisson nadra jagai distribution equation 16 uh, sorry equation 13 and z z r n uh, is the xrn minus mu divided by sigma and expected will zn equal to mu rn 
that is the mean of the rth order statistics so we use the following notation x mu and 1 is the vector form so we find the the blue of the a and b for nine poisson nadra jaga distribution can be obtained of the unrolled data 1992 so mu star is uh, written in r r running from 1 to n minus c pr zr and sigma star summation i running from 1 to n minus c qr zr where the the coefficient of the blue pr and qr given equation 14 and 15 and further more the variance of the covariance variance is covariance of the blue r given by andol 1992 in the form of equation uh, 16 17 and 18 so these are the the coefficient of blue of uh, um, for the tau equal to 1.5 and eta equal to 2 so we we can see that if the increase the sensory stream we find the coefficient of the blue is increasing and this is the coefficient of the qr given equation 6 and so uh, we see that and equation 7 uh, the variance and covariance of the blue for the value of the tau equal to 1.5 eta equal to 2 and delta equal to 1.5 and n equal to 7 and 10 so in uh, table 4 and 5 we report the value of pr and qr and for different value of n equal to 7 and 10 tau equal to 1.5 eta 2 and delta 1.5 And uh, two and different sensory scheme. In table six represent the finding the variances covariance of the blue for the very simple sizes n equal to seven and ten. And for various parameter values, it is important to keep in the mind that the variance of the blue grows as sensory in stream is increasing, whereas the variance of the blue reduces as sample size and delta is increased. Additionally, we also observe that the variance and covariance of the blue exhibit the similar tendency. So next we. Uh, take the real app application so in this section two real data set are taken from mansoor et al 2020 and reanalyze the descriptive summary of size of data uh, uh, data n and mean x bar standard deviation s coefficient of discretion cs and coefficient of kurtosis ck as well as the model fitting summary of considered data set are described in detail by mansoor et al 2020 so using these two data set we have computed the point estimate of the model parameter using maximum likelihood method with of the model parameter and standard uh, boost step percentile boost step and bias corrected boost step the result reported in equation uh, table 7 and table 7 shows that the boost uh, bias corrected percentile boost step interval as shortest width among the uh, bias uh, uh, for the both data set su suggesting that the result are consistent with simulation study finding so these are the equation 8 Uh, reported the standard boost step percent of boost step bias corrected boost step so data set 1 and 2 for tau delta n eta and uh, last is the conclusion in this paper in this paper the single end product movement of the order statistics from poisson nadra jagai distribution are derived in explicit form the single end double movements are used to obtain the blue of the location scale parameter and poisson nadra jagai distribution to demonstrate how to well the Uh, uh, blue are performing the variance and covariance are computed simulation study has been undertaken for up, comparing the estimator using various sample size and uh, combination of the unknown parameter we compare the performance of the estimator respect of msc the performance of, of the compared in respect to average width and uh, coverage probability the data analysis reveals the outcome pattern that similar what is observed when the simulation study our conclusion indicate that the distributions movements of order sets are behaving themselves as a result further research will be motivated in investigating further order statistics properties and these are the references which will use in my study thank you thank you thank you professor <coughs> professor thank you very much uh, thank you and uh, nice presentation Uh, sir has discussed many more here application of how to apply the order statistics uh, for the complete and uh, type first and type second sensing and how to use the model as a hazard rate and uh, some of the bayesian bayesian perspective also they have discussed uh, so uh, have any one questions uh, dear participants uh, have any questions 
I think uh, Professor Kumar, they ha uh, I think uh, there is no any question from mm -hmm. the audience. Uh, but uh, curiosity point of view, I ask a very little questions that uh, how to uh, maybe order in order statistics you have used for this discussion. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Sir? Yes, 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 please. Yes, uh, you have discussed about the inference for the Poisson Nadaraja distribution based on yes. order statistics. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so how to define the delta? Delta. What How to define the delta? Delta in your expression. Delta equal to? Ha. Uh -huh. Delta. How to use the delta in your expression? Delta. Delta is the parameter of the distribution. Okay. Okay. Delta is the parameter. Of yes. The delta tau and eta is the are the parameter. So okay. Question matter is about distribution. The three parameter distribution. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, now again, I would like to invite another speaker is here. The Dinesh, you are yes, Swami. Yes, here. Yes. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, very good afternoon to very good afternoon to all of you. Once again, uh, I would like to invite the uh, Dinesh Umaria. Uh, as a assistant, uh, as a assistant professor in Sweden, and the lecturer at the University of Rwanda, College of Science and Technology at Department of Mathematical Science. Okay, and uh, he she has a very good knowledge in statistics, uh, and uh, she has very knowledge of the basic uh, statistics as well as computations and their applications, uh, how to apply the real life. Uh, application so uh, without taking too much time i would like to invite uh, uh, ma'am to deliver your talk okay thank you thank you okay, for this time and the opportunity to present my work yes. uh, i have recently defended my thesis phd thesis yes. at uh, rinshamping university and uh, this part what i'm going to present today is the uh, one part of my thesis work and uh, it is about large deviation asymptotics of condition numbers of uh, random matrices. And it is a joint work with my co-supervisor, Martin Singu, and uh, my supervisor, Xiang Feng Yang. So I'm going to start with a short introduction and the theoretical background. I will continue with the result of the paper and then how we prove the result without going into details. Uh, let me start with uh, a known definition uh, of uh, unlikely events. As we know, this, uh, uh, those are the events that uh, happen with uh, small frequencies. And uh, in uh, society, we have some examples that uh, define those uh, unlikely events. Let's say that uh, we can say this asteroid impact, major earthquakes, tsunami, Statistical estimate gives wrong information, fraud, bar collapses, act of terrorist, uh, epidemic or pandemic disease, mm -hmm. global warming. Those are just uh, events which happen with a small frequency, but uh, as long as it happens, it can affect our society. Here I can just mention uh, as example this uh, COVID-19. No one was no uh, was uh, assuming that they, we can have this kind of pandemic that can affect the society as it was in the previous years. So, uh, in mathematically, we can define this uh, lie event as uh, in the following way. They said that we have event E of alpha. That means we have a parameter. We have event E, which depends on parameter alpha, and then this event is uh, defined this probability space. And in that case, we say that the event E alpha is an unlikely event if the probability of that event converts to zero as alpha converts to this parameter alpha zero. And the study of this Lyle event is based on the study of how fast the probabilities converge to zero. And uh, the good way to address this rate of convergence is to use the theory, the theory known as uh, the theory of large deviations. 
And uh, this theory actually is a theory that studies and that deals with uh, techniques of uh, estimating probabilities of an unlikely event. And uh, to understand it uh, very well, let us just uh, consider a simple example. Let's say that we have independent and identically distributed random variables. Let's say that x1 up to xn, and they have common mean and uh, variance. Uh, that means the common mean is mu and the uh, variance is sigma squared. And let's uh, denote this uh, x bar n to be the sample mean. In this case, we can just uh, mention two rows, uh, uh, which plays important role in uh, probability and statistics. And those two laws are law, law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Law of large numbers say that the sample mean xn, uh, x bar of n goes to mu in probability. And for central limit theorem, we know that as we sample more, uh, as uh, the distribution of the random variables converge to uh, standard normal distribution. But uh, uh, they say that what if this uh, sample mean does not converge to mu? Let's say that it converts to some value which is either greater than mu or less than mu. So this law of large numbers that cannot say anything about this convergence, that's why we need other theory to study those type of uh, convergence. So, and, and then this theory is known as theory of large deviation, which goes beyond uh, row of large number and central limit theorem. And that this uh, theory of large, de large deviations is applied in different areas, let's say in finance, insurance. And here I have some typical example in uh, insurance. They said that uh, the insurance company would like to decide about monthly premium and then I have denoted this premium as Q. And let's XI denote the claim amount of each month, say month one up to N. And let us just consider the sum of all XI to denote the total claim amount. So the insurance company to succeed, it is uh, no, it, we, they will have to assume that the total amount of premium paid out is uh, greater than the total amount of claim paid. So this means that they have to achieve this, they have to, the company has to choose the good premium Q so that the, this probability that uh, sum of XI for I equal to one up to N is a greater or equal to N times Q where this Q is just the amount or the premium amount. So it is, we also expect that this probability is very small. It is also decay exponentially in N. So to study this probability, to see how it goes to zero or how small it is, we have also to use this large deviation, uh, large deviation probability to study this rate of convergence. Uh, we have applied uh, this theory of large deviations uh, to study the, the, the rate convergence of condition number of random matrices. That's why I'm going to continue with the random matrices we have considered in uh, our paper. So they say that we have two positive integers, P and N, which are greater or equal to two. And let us define P by N random matrix X. And uh, their entries are random variables that uh, follow some distribution. In this case, uh, one can define two norm condition number. We know that is just defined as a uh, ratio of uh, sigma max to sigma min where the sigma max and sigma mean are maximum and minimum singular values of X. We call it two non condition numbers because uh, uh, these uh, maximum singular values coincide with uh, the two norm of this random matrix X. So if one consider the eigenvalues of this P by P square random matrix X, X transpose, this means that we have our X as a uh, P by P by N random matrix, and then we compute square random matrix X, X transpose. In this case, we have this relation in 1.1, which means that also condition number can be defined as a square root of the ratio of lambda max to lambda mean, where this lambda max and lambda mean are just maxima and minima, again, values of this square random matrix X, X transpose. In our paper, we have assumed that 
P is always less or equal to N. So in statistics, if one uh, defines this uh, square matrix, X is transpose over N, then this W is uh, usually called sample covariance matrix. And then when the entries are IID centered normal random variables, this means that the entries I'm talking about are, the, are those entries of this random matrix X. When they are just uh, centered normal random variables, then this NW is called Wishart matrix. And the spectral properties of this Rio Wishart matrix have been studied in the literature and uh, the first result is about the joint probability density function of eigenvalues of this matrix, a uh, square matrix W of order P by P. And it is given by this equation 1.2, where uh, here beta is equal to one, and uh, this C is uh, a normalized constant. This beta, which is equal to one, this is actually to point out that uh, in our random matrix X, we have IID, Rio standard norm. So that when you compute this X, X transpose, then we have Rio Wishart matrix. So, but uh, when we have also, it is not the joint density function we have in the previous slide is not only for Rio Wishart, but is also a joint density function of eigenvalues of complex and quaternion Wishart matrix. This is when beta is equal to two and beta is equal to four. This means that when beta is equal to two, we, it means that in our random matrix X, we have complex IID standard norm, but when beta is equal to four in our random matrix X, we have quaternion IID standard norm. So we have also the result, which is known as laws of large numbers of extrema eigenvalues. These extrema eigenvalues, we mean the maximum and minima eigenvalues of sample covariance matrices of this form of W, as we defined the previous slide, which means that is equal to X, X transpose. It is known as the, our lambda max converge to this value. And then lambda mean converge to this value, where this kappa is a uh, value which is the ratio of p of uh, over n which convert to this kappa and then this kappa belong to this close interval of zero and one this is for the case when n goes to infinity and p which depends to n also goes to infinity so they say that uh, our p is either fixed or p which depends to n is equal to small o n this small o n means that as n goes to infinity the ratio of uh, p over n will be equal to zero. So in this case, we can see that this kappa will be equal to zero. If kappa is equal to zero, then you can see our lambda mass will go to one and the lambda mean will go to one because kappa is equal to zero in probability. So this means that our condition also, which is defined as the ratio of lambda max and uh, two lambda mean will go also to one in probability because it's defined as a uh, ratio of lambda max to lambda mean. So in this case, uh, one can study the large deviation probability of this conditional uh, of PN. We denoted a condition of PN because it depends on the value of or the size of random matrix P and N. And then to take this form, that's uh, the probability of P, uh, sorry, the probability of K of P and N greater or equal to C, with C greater or equal to one. So we need to study this probability in our paper. So the aim and motivation, first of all, our aim is to try to study the limiting behaviors of uh, the condition numbers, K of P N, of uh, suitable random matrices of size P by N, where the entry satisfies some conditions and uh, for the case where n goes to infinite and possibly for p which is equal to p of n goes to infinite. Here we say possibly because p is supposed to go to infinite but not very fast as uh, n. So the motivation behind our uh, the result we provide in the paper is uh, the, role, the rule of uh, condition numbers in numerical linear algebra and the theory of uh, probability. And the second motivation is uh, about testing the null hypothesis that covariance is a scalar multiple of identity 
it has uh, in the literature they say that the narrow hypothesis about the covariance is rejected for large value of a condition number. And the other motivation is about the condition numbers, which has one-to-one -one correspondence of which so-called first antigen values. And the first antigen values is defined in this way. You see that is uh, cons it, con it consider also run, uh, maxima and minima again values. And uh, this first antigen values can be found uh, can be found in many application, include also statistical inference application. This is the result of the paper. Uh, we say that in this theorem 2.1, they suppose that we have entries X, I, J, of random matrix X are I, I, D sub Gaussian with mean zero and unity variance. These sub Gaussian random variables, it means that it includes standard norm random variables, bounded random variables, and the Bernoulli random variables, but uh, they are supposed to have this uh, mean zero and uh, unity variance. So then for any C greater or equal to one, it told that for fixed B, we were able to characterize these limits we have in this 2.1. And when P, which depends on parameter N goes to infinity, with this P, and this is, was a condition to be able to have this limit in this 2.2 is equal to this small O of n, where this i, i of p, 0 of c, and i of infinity 0 are just rate of function uh, defined this way. This is our rate of function. We define this Euclidean space, RP. And since this rate of function is uh, non increasing in p, this means that for each fixed alpha and c, uh, we have this limit. This means that for P, which goes to infinity, that means in case P goes to infinity, we were able to have this limit here as a rate of function. As I said, because of Gaussian random variables uh, contain also standard random variables, we have a special case of the theorem 2.1. And then it is known as the Rio Wishart matrix, matrix, where the entries of our random matrix X has IID standard norm. And the, the special case is defined in this corollary 2.1. You see that uh, when we have the entries X, I, J, which are IID standard norm, then for any C greater or equal to one, we have this uh, rate of form, we have this uh, limit. And you can see that here it is uh, well defined. Our rate of function is uh, well defined because it, uh, it is not so, it is somehow clear to see the, the rate of convergence of this probability of condition numbers. When P is either fixed or P goes to infinity as N goes to infinity with this P of N equal to small of N. So to prove the results, actually we need to find the lower bounds and upper bounds in theorem 2.1 and corollary 2.1. And uh, if we start, uh, we started by the theorem 2.1 and the lower bounds of 2.1 and 2.2, we have used what we call Cramia theorem, which is a basic result in the theorem of large deviations. We applied by we tried to relate the conditional number probability to the one involving n IID random variables by the support of this lemma 3.1. What we did, we tried to fix x and y and then uh, write this probability as n of IID random variables so that this Cramer's theorem can be applied. But when it comes to the upper bound, it's somehow complicated because we have to consider all x and y, which has a norm of which is equal to one. But with the support of this lemma 3.2, we try to consider the all of x and y and then take approximation. So in this case, we're able to find this 2.2, the lower bound in uh, 2.1 under 2.2. So similarly for corollary, uh, 2.1 as a special uh, result of uh, theorem 
The lower bound follow uh, with, from Rema 3.1. The similarly, we have to fix just uh, only one X and Y. But when it comes to the upper bound, we have decomposed the density function we defined in the previous slide. And what we did in the decomposition, we tried to delete all eigenvalues, on, and then we kept only the maximum and minimum eigenvalues in our density function to be able to get uh, the upper bounds of, uh, of the result that we had in this uh, corollary 2.1. And with the result we have in this corollary 2.1, as I showed you, we have explicitly written data function. We were able to apply it on uh, with some. We have we were able to uh, to provide some application statistics, which is about test the null hypothesis that the covariance is a scalar multiple identity using union intersection test methods. This is the that was our null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And we have seen that as n goes to infinity, it was very clear and able to reject or accept the null hypothesis based on the upper bounds of the result we provided in our corollary 2.1. So that was the, uh, what I was talking about because we have just picked the significant level to be able to study this null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis to test if the covariance is a scalar multiple of identity. So those are some references I have just to use to prepare these slides. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dinay Sumaria, and uh, really is a good lecture. And uh, dear participants, uh, have you any questions? Uh, anyone clarification regarding this talk? Okay. Okay, uh, there is no any questions. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, really, uh, Danish, uh, Maria, I enjoy this uh, from your lecture. And uh, in the in the lecture, you have discussed about the some basics uh, of the rare events. Uh, you have take the uh, triplets uh, like omega, field, and p. When the probability of the event uh, 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 tends to be zero, as alpha tends to be the infinity okay and the another one things you have discussed about law of large number and the central limit theorem how to use for the deviations okay so these are the these are your uh, points for consider consider in this talk uh, one question uh, for uh, in in the theorem 2.1 you have take the value c greater than 1 how to use this c greater than one why not c less than one <laughs> for, for understanding point of view for this theorem you have take uh, for c greater than one so actually from this uh, theorem to uh, you uh, this point one. One. yes yes, yes. Uh, so actually as i explained here yes yeah, you see that uh, if lambda max goes to one and lambda mean goes to one, it means that if I compute the condition number, it will be the ratio of lambda max to lambda mean, which means that also condition number goes to one. Yes. yes. So this means that if you take the probability of this condition number greater than any positive value. Okay. Greater so than zero, but here okay. it goes to one. So it has to be greater or equal to one. This is the case where this probability really goes to zero. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, that means you have taken the two two normal conditions. Uh, yes. Think, two normal mm. conditions. Uh. Yeah, two normal okay. conditions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you once again, Satish, sir. Hardly very welcome to you <laughs> for this. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> to invite all the statisticians yeah. on that platform. And really, I regret feel. I, I didn't uh, uh, submit any paper in, uh, for the presentation 
due to some uh, hectic uh, schedule, I have to join the other university from Central University Haryana to Delhi University. Already my colleague, uh, Dr. Devendra has told me. But uh, uh, this uh, platform is really very nice uh, to discuss uh, all the statisticians about these problems. Okay. Okay. Once again, thank you, Satish sir. <laughs> Over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor um, Manoj Kumar, for yes. your uh, nicely managed the, your, your, the session and concluded in time. Yes. Uh, now 1.40. No, so it's fine. Yes, and also, uh, let us be, give a big clap to all the speakers, especially <laughs> uh, Dr. Mahesh Kumar Pandey, uh, Professor uh, Devendra Kumar, and Professor Dr. Dennis. Uh, now, uh, let, let us have a lunch break time. And after that, I, th I think at uh, sharp at 2 p.m., we will begin. The, before that, 1.15.55 itself, we will start the session. The introduction, introducing is the chair, etc., will uh, 1.55. So that we please join at 1.50 itself. So after uh, 45 minutes, please join. No, not 45, 50, 30 minutes. After 30, 30 minutes, minutes. Yes. yes, 30 minutes break for the time. Today, we have only 30 minutes. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, let us wait two, three minutes because uh, we can, we have two speakers in the next session. And thereafter, the, uh, uh, in the other session, this one speaker is, uh, has some <coughs> difficulty he mentioned. So we can, this session can, even though if it takes slightly more time, that will not affect second session. <coughs> Good afternoon, Satish Kumar. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon, sir. Very good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Devendra Kumar, sir. <laughs> Shakti will ask not join, listen. You will join. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we can connect. I was participated Devendra Kumar sir's presentation. It's very nice. Okay, Professor Sektivel has informed me that he will join in the meantime, since there is a retirement okay. function. Okay. That's okay. why he's in the retirement function of their professor and head. <laughs> Okay, let us start the session. Um, yeah. Neha? Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, Neha, please introduce the chair and uh, do, do the needful for supporting him for the session. Okay, please. Okay, sir. Good afternoon to all the distinguished guests. We now move on to technical session number 15, which is a special invited session to be chaired by Professor Devendra Kumar. Associate Professor at Department of Statistics, Central University of Haryana. He introduced Statistics Department in Amity University, where he had previously served. He is also a life member of various professional bodies, including Indian Society for Probability in Statistics, Kerala Statistical Association, etc. His major areas of research primarily include order statistics, distribution theory, statistical inference, etc. Dr. Kumar has published more than 150 research papers in national and international journals. We feel honored to have you with us today, sir. Once again, I humbly invite Professor Devendra Kumar to chair this session. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nia, for a nice introduction. 
so in this session first of all i thank you professor tish kumar inviting me in a session chair a session so uh, this is technical session number 15 this is from 2 pm to 3 10 pm there are two speaker professor srinivasa rao and professor kem saktiwan so first of all uh, the professor srinivasa rao did his master bachelor from nagarajana university india and also doctorate uh, from uh, uh, achar nagarjun university india and he is current currently associate professor in department of statistics school of mathematical sciences college of natural and mathematical sciences university of dodoma Do tanzania so uh, his title of talk is uh, multiple dependent state sampling plan for led manufacturing process data under interdependency using the bevel distribution so may i invite professor sri nivasa rao sir please over to you sir thank you sir thank you for your nice uh, introduction and uh, i would like like to thank the professor satish kumar sir for uh, for his invitation and participating every time in this yeah. conferences <laughs> <laughs> and also i would like to oh uh, thank the organizing committee of wsta 2013 uh let me share yeah. is it visible sir Yes, visible. Yeah. Yes, visible, sir. Oh. Okay, okay. So, uh, today's my presentation is on multi-dependent state sampling plan for LED manufacturing process data under indeterminacy using Weibull distribution. The outline of the study is scope of the study, introduction, methodologies. comparative studies led manufacturing process data illustration concluding remarks and finally the references the the scope of the article is to create a mul multiple dependent state sampling plan for luminous intensities of diodes using weibull distribution under indeterminacy using time truncated sampling schemes this demonstrates that the indeterminacy parameter has a significant impact on average sample number a comparison between the suggested sampling plan and the existing sampling plans are discussed by applying the weibull distribution to calculate luminous intensities of diodes the projected sampling technique is demonstrated we draw the conclusion that the proposed plan requires a less sample size as compared with the single sampling plan and the existing mds sampling plans based on the results obtained the luminous intensities of diodes vary erratically and conform to some statistical distributions the weibull distribution has been used intens intensively for estimation research into an engineering application and dependability among other statistical distributions classical statistics used for estimating and predicting when the observations or the parameters are known the luminous intensity of diodes data are often captured during time periods because of its uh, uh, diodeness sometimes we cannot measure exactly what the values are obtaining 
So therefore, they may be obtained in indeterminacy conditions. That means in between the sum interval of values. So for that situations, the existing sampling distributions cannot be used for study of diodes data intensities. Regarding the sampling plans, many others have created a time censored life testing based on the conventional acceptance sampling plans using various life distributions. The following are the, some of the references. Recently, several others have focused on various sampling uh, plans, including single sampling plan, multiple dependent sampling plan for various sampling distributions. The MDS sampling plans were proposed by uh, Workman Baker in 1976. According to their explanation, the MDS sampling plan is known as an attribute inspection procedure where the decision is made for each lot based on one of the three conditions, namely accept the lot, reject the lot, or Conditionally, accept or reject the lot based on the disposition of the future related lots. Later on, a numerous others have studied the MDS sampling plan for the classical distributions, some of these references. The four mentioned name uh, sampling approaches, which combine the classical statistics with a fuzzy setting, do not offer the background information on the measure of indeterminacy. The neutrosophic logic provides details regarding the measure of indeterminacy, determinacy, and falseness, which was first introduced by the Samrochi in 1998. The concept of neutrosophic logic was used in the field of neutrosophic statistics in Samrochi by 2014, later on some other others have, have been studied. Neutrosophic logic is therefore more effective than the interval-based analysis and fuzzy logics. So some other others have studied about the neutrosophic statistics in different environments. The neutrosophic statistics provide provides details on the determinacy and indeterminacy measurements. It was also studied by the Aslam in 2019. If the measure of indeterminacy is not recorded, neutrosophic statistics becomes a classical statistics. The acceptance sampling plans based on this neutrosophic environment was studied by the different authors from 2019, 2018 to till date. Neutrosophic Weibull distribution and the neutrosophic family of Weibull distributions were studied by Alshan and Samrochi in 2009. The available sampling schemes based on the fuzzy logic and the traditional statistics do not provide the data on the measure of indeterminacy. In our opinion, it is a pioneer that there has been no research on the MDS sampling plans for the Weibull distribution under indeterminacy after reviewing the literature. The goal of the current piece of work is to test the luminous intensity of diodes using MDS sampling plan strategy for the Weibull distribution under indeterminacy. To test the luminous intensity of diodes, it is predicted that the suggested sampling design exhibits a smaller average sample number than the existing sampling designs. The methodology as follows. Uh, this Weib neutrosophic Weibull distribution first was introduced by this Aslam 2021. We have borrowed those uh, probability distribution and its properties in this uh, methodology section. Uh, the neutrosophic probability density function is, can be expressed as f of xn is equal to f of xl plus 
f of x u times i n, where i n is the indeterminacy uh, part, and it can be expressed as i n is belongs to i l, uh, comma i u. Here, f of x l is uh, f of x l is the determinant part. And f of x u times i n is the indeterminacy part. Indeterminacy interval i n is expressed as i l comma i u. It should be noted that neutrosophic random variable x n belongs to x l comma x u follows to the neutrosophic probability density function. The generalization of the probability density function under the classical approach is the neutrosophic probability density function. In this neutrosophic probability density function, if I L is equal to zero, the neutrosophic probability density functions becomes a, a classical uh, probability density functions. The neutrosophic probability density function is given below and it is expressed in the equation one, where here Alpha and beta are the scale and state parameters of the distribution. And this uh, probability density function of the Weibull distribution becomes a classical probability density function when I L is equal to zero. The cumulative distribution function of the neutrosophic uh, Weibull distribution is given in the equation two, and its uh, mean is given in the equation three. The neutrosophic wave uh, uh, median of the distribution is given in the equation four. Actually, in Balamurli in Balamurli et al. in 2017 studied the uh, MDS sampling plan for the classical distribution, whereas under the neutrosophic statistics, it was proposed by the uh, Shovaki and Aslam also Khan in 2020. So we are now our intention is to modify the this uh, classical method of MDS plan and the neutrosophic uh, method of MDS sampling plan by using the indeterminacy concern. The following are the null and alternative hypotheses for the average luminous intensity of diodes, which can be expressed as H naught is equal to mu is equal to mu zero n. Actually, that is mu zero n, and H one is mu is not equal to mu zero n, where mu zero n is uh, denoted as the de desired average uh, luminous intensity diodes, and mu n is the actual average luminous intensity diodes. The MDS procedure is expressed in the following three steps. Step one is pick a sample of sample from the batch that is of size here. These samples were put through a live test for a set of amount of the time T and not. Mention the average mu zero n and the amount of indeterminacy is denoted as i n, which is belongs to the uh, i l comma i u. Step two is the test H naught mu n is equal to mu zero n could be accepted if the average luminous intensity of diodes at T zero n for C1 measurements are greater than or equal to mu zero n. That means mu zero, that is the average number is less than or equal to C1. If the average of the diodes in C2 measurements are less than T zero n, that is mu n is mu zero n is greater than C2, then the hypothesis H naught mu n is equal to mu zero n could be rejected and come to the end of the test. Remember that C1 must be less than or equal to C2. Step two 
when c1 is less than mu0 n is less than or equal to c2 then accept the current lot if m preceding lots are acceptable that means the mean number of cases must be less than or equal to c1 before the test termination time tn not the proposed plan has the four parameters namely n c1 c2 and m where n is the sample size c1 is the maximum number of allowable items that failed for unconditional acceptance c2 is the maximum number of additional items that failed for conditional acceptance where c1 is less than or equal to c2 and m is the number of subsequent lots or prior required to the reach the conclusion the characteristics of the mds sampling plan converges to the as m tends to infinity or c1 is equal to c2 is equal to c2 it becomes a mds become a single sampling plan the oc function of the mds sampling plan based on the weibull distribution can be expressed in the equation 5 suppose that t not is equal to a constant a times mu n not be the time in days where a is the termination ratio the probability of accepting the h not mu n is equal to mu n not is given by in the equation 6 where pn is the probability of rejecting the h not and obtain the equation in equation 2 and equation 3 where pn is equal to probability of tn less than or equal to tn not and it is defined as in the equation 7 where mu n by mu n not is the dif difference between the specific average and the actual average uh, luminous intensity diodes assuming that gamma and delta are the type 1 and type 2 errors respectively the proposed plan for testing the h not mu n is equal to mu n not in one that the methodologies are interested in using the because it is ensure that the probability of accepting the h not mu n is equal to mu 0 n when it is true should be greater than 1 minus alpha at mu 1 by mu n not and the probability of accepting the h not when it is incorrect should be lower than delta at mu 1 by mu 1 not is equal to 1 the following are the two inequalities should be satisfied to obtain the plan parameters so first condition is p oc function at mu 1 by mu n not is greater than or equal to mass gamma where uh, mu uh, oc function at mu1 by mu1 not is equal to 1 is less than or equal to delta where mu1 n and mu2 n is determined in the equations 10 and 11 on hand sampling strategies have frequently been used to reduce the average sample size most of the sample size uh, sampling plans approaches are the aim of reducing the sample size typically the primary goal of any sampling strategy is to reduce the asn which is also helps to reduce the time and money to to inspect the sampling uh, to inspect the procedure in line with this the proposed mds sampling design aims to reduce the average sample number for weibull distribution for our proposed plan the optimal parameters are obtained by using the following uh, 
nonlinear programming problem that is minimize the asn at p1 of n is equal to n subject to the these three inequalities which are expressed in the equation 12 where p1n and p2n are the likelihood failures at a producers and consumers risk respectively the following uh, phrases can be used to determine these acceptance chances where pa of 1n is in the equation 13 and pa of 2n is given in the equation 14. the proposal plan consists of the parameters as we discussed in the previous c1 c2 m and average sample number that are obtained by solving the nonlinear programming problem given in the equation 12 for different delta values that is 0 0.25 0 0.1 and 0 0.05 whereas gamma is fixed at 0 0.1 and the, the ratio or a multiplier a is fixed as 0.5 and 1 and here we have taken as a known determinancy uh, indeterminacy in which are express which are given in the tables one to four but to, to limit the number of slides i have given only uh, two tables for the beta is equal to two only and the other tables are available with me and uh, for a beta is equal to one means it is an exponential distribution as it is a well-known result from the tables so if you uh, identify the tables so th this is the table for beta is equal to 2 and when a is equal to 5 so we have given the indeterminacy values are u is equal to 0 0.0 0 0.02 and 0 0.04 and lastly 0 0.05 when you observe these uh, values for example i uh, as i mentioned in the previous if it is a zero a u is equal to zero means it is a classical sampling plan the classical sampling plan gives the asn at uh, the ratio 1.5 is we are getting the c1 is equal to 13 c2 is equal c1 is equal to 3 and c2 is equal to 13 whereas m is equal to 3 we got asn is 28 so if you observe this the asn is gradually decreasing and when we reach to the iu is equal to 0 0.05 it is a smaller number so when you observe this well, as uh, IU uh, indeterminacy value, IU is increases, the ASN values are decreasing in this uh, MDS sampling plan. Even for beta is equal to 2 and uh, A is equal to 1, we, we have observed the same tendency. See, this is ASN for the classical approach is 11. Whereas in the indeterminacy approach, we are getting the sample sizes, uh, yeah, average sample number is eight, which means that we are saving the time. At the same time, we are saving the money by using the this indeterminacy approach. And when you compare with the beta is equal to 1 to beta is equal to 2. So the, those tables I have not given here. So the ASN is decreasing as the shape parameter increases from beta is equal to 1 to beta is equal to 2. Okay. From these tables, we can say that the indeterminacy parameter IN has a significant influence for minimizing the average sample number. So when you are studying a sam uh, any sampling plans, we should compare with the existing sampling plans to 
show the performance of the, uh, the developed sampling procedures. Now we are comparing this uh, proposed uh, modified some uh, MDS sampling plan with the existing sampling plans in this study. So for these uh, tables one to four, you can show that the parameter IN rises lower a real exam manufacturing process. This data was borrowed from the uh, Park et al. 2007, and also the same uh, same data was used by the Jin et al. 2022. They mentioned that the quantum of dot light emitting diodes have uncertainly and inaccurate measure of device parameters. So whenever the uncertainty and uh, inaccuracy results are coming, in these cases, we can use uh, uh, the measure of indeterminacy in any distributions. So let us consider the ca a case study on a pro production of light emission diodes that focus is the use of the methodology that we have studied in this uh, talk. The justification for the process distribution is done and evidence that it uh, resembles the people distribution quite well. The study per bounded as well as a point estimate which are given in the following form. So they are they are expressed usually in the interval nature. So lower in the interval of point uh, one two nine six four to point uh, shape parameter beta hat n is equal to this, and the alpha hat is scale parameter is this. Using this fitted data, the luminous intensity diodes. So we have constructed the plan parameters in the table five for the shape parameter. Beta hat n is equal to this and uh, we have determined the IU based on this indeterminacy parametric values and we got the IU is equal to 0 0.2918. Whereas in the previous two tables, uh, one, one to four tables, we, are, we have assumed that the IU values are 0 0.02 0.05. Whereas from this real data, we got IU is equal to 0.29. For this, IU is equal to 0.29, and the beta values are in this indeterminacy values. We have constructed the table that the table 5. The table 5 is shown like this. So here is also we have constructed at A is equal to 0.5 and A is equal to 1. The, we have shown the results for the beta value is 0.7546 and the U is equal to 0.2918. It shows that ASN is equal to 15 when A is equal to 0.5. ASN is equal to 3 when A is equal to one and for other uh, delta delta combinations we have exhibited here from these results we could understand that if the engineer assumes that the testing of hypothesis is h naught mu n is equal to 3.61862 to 5.4998 because these are the indeterminacy values we are not fixing the fixed values Using the suggested sampling plan from the table 5, then IU is equal to 0.2918 and gamma is equal to 0.1. If you take the ratio as mu1 by mu0 n is equal to 1.5, then a uh, constant multiplier A is equal to 0.5 and delta is equal to 0.1, it is shown that C1 is equal to 6, C2 is equal to 10, 
and m is equal to 1, asn is equal to 25, which can be explained in the following way. The created MDA sampling plan could be functioned in the following manner. If the average luminous intensity of the diodes in 16, six measurements are greater than or equal to 23.5225, which is the mean value. So luminous intensity of the diodes accept the null hypothesis. For the batch of LEDs, a sample of diodes with varying luminous intensity will be chosen at random with the null hypothesis H0 mu n is equal to that value. The lot of LED will be allowed if the average luminous intensity of the diodes prior to the interval of 3.6186 to 5.4998 are less than or equal to six measurements. And the lot of LEDs will be denied that means rejected if it is larger than the 10 measurements because we got the C2 is 10. So if, if there are more than 10 measurements, we are rejecting the hypothesis. A property of the two current batches of LEDs will be delayed, uh, delayed, that means rejected until the testing test of the previous lots of LEDs, if the luminous intensity of diodes are between the 6 and 10 measurements. If they are in between the 6 and 10 measurements, we are continuing the procedure by taking the another lot. So if it is less than 6, we are accepting it. If it is more than 10 measurements, we are rejecting the hypothesis. The average luminous intensity diodes are more than uh, more than or equal to the 3.6186 or 5.4998, which is more than 17 measurements which occurred in our study. Which means that the certain that the hypothesis might be disproven based on the evidence. So from this data, From this data, which are we got it as 17 measurements, which are more than that uh, values which are occurred from the statistical tables in the table five. Therefore, we are rejecting it, the hypothesis, hypothesis of 3.6186 to 5.4998. So, so engineer administrators might might before advise the government that the, the average luminous intensity of diodes have reached an intolerable level. In order to decide on the average luminous intensity of diodes, which is crucial for any government to do when making a policy decision, the proposed sampling plan is useful in engineering applications, specifically LED, applications. And final conclusions from our study. Based on the indeterminacy scenario, the time truncated MDS sampling plans were developed in this study, especially related to the weeble distribution based on uh, luminous intensity diodes data. The amount of the amounts of the sampling plans are established at previously given indeterminacy parametric value. Findings indicate that the developed MDS sampling plans under the indeterminacy is more reasonable than both the conventional MDS sampling plan and the single sampling plan. Additionally, Running the generalized MDA sampling under the indeterminacy is more cost effective than the single, single sampling plan. It is a crucial to remember that 
indeterminacy parameters play a key role uh, in deriving the asn values the indeterminacy value increases asn values are decreasing as a result of mds sampling plan developed under the indeterminacy it is more beneficial to the scientists especially industrial practitioners those who have using uh, those who are are uh, researching or uh, testing declining the subjects that calls for the specific researchers are more fi findings thus it is approved to be possible to test the average luminous intensity of diodes using the mds sampling plans that was developed under the condition of indeterminacy the example based on the diodes data for light intensity for the mds sampling strategy under the indeterminacy shows the, the confirmation other researchers works in the different uh, domains would be either to develop the mds sampling schemes under indeterminacy the next research project to monitor the mean would take control charts methods based on the multi dependent sampling approach the following are the some other conclusions and end with the references thank you very much sir thank you thank you professor sinwasa for in such a nice uh, presentation so session uh, open for questions if anyone has a query please ask professor srinivasan i think there is no query from the audience so thank you thank you very much the thank you very much sir thank you very much uh, devendra kumar sir and the satish kumar sir both kumar sirs <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you professor srinivas rao <laughs> in fact um, very nice presentation in fact you can uh, we can um, share your experience etc also there is some time yeah. because professor shaktivel yeah. is attending mm -hmm. the uh, retirement function of professor vijay rakhavan the yeah. professor chodi is the retirement function is going on and he is the organizing the function um, the main person behind the function i think so so he will join little bit later he has not joined till this time yeah okay sir so in, if it is little late they can so the can... session is finished now sir so that we can finish the session for the time being uh okay. thank you so dr devendra kumar for uh you are for supporting us through chairing the session in a very nice thank way you, thank, thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you we we'll, uh, we can uh, this time if possible you can utilize for some interactions if needed Yes, sir. Uh, yes. I have one doubt, and we are doing. Uh, my, one of my PhD student is doing on the generalized Poisson distribution. Okay. So you are familiar with the uh, discrete distributions. Even Devendra Kumar sir also doing in the discrete distributions. Yeah, we are facing yeah. the uh, yeah. estimation of the parameters. because of the discrete situations i think you you, you did some work on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, my talk on that also depend on uh, some generalized discrete uh, especially the generalized open model yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, here of the model becomes quite complicated the usual procedure of the estimating the parameters with the help of 
uh, maximal accurate estimation while we are doing maximal accurate estimation we need to have we get some non linear form equations not likelihood yeah. equations are not really, um, that that much easy so that you have to adopt some uh, softwares for example newton raphson procedures you can utilize math mathematica or matlab or you can write uh, programs r programs yeah we are using we are using r programming okay 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 so uh, the mle uh, uh, mle uh, we are not we are, we are not facing any problem whereas uh, okay. while using the weighted least square and least squares methods okay okay the we are facing the problem of the cdf cdf uh, by using the r coding we are getting the single value when we are doing the simulation study we, we need to generate yeah. the uh, 10000 or 5000 uh, random yeah, yeah. numbers so that creates a problem okay okay so i, I will approach some other day okay uh, after this conference or something okay okay thank you thank you sir okay professor okay sir.
whether there is anyone in the present group who who are interested to present their contributory presentation and they are not listed in the already uh, scheduled time sessions
ಕಲಿಕಟ್ He has published several research papers during his career. His areas of specialization include distribution theory, time series analysis and forecasting, statistical inference, stochastic modeling and probability theory. He has served as the general secretary and president of Kerala Statistical Association. It's our honor to have you here with us sir. Without any further delay on behalf of the whole organizing committee, I once again welcome you sir. Over to you sir. thank you thank you very much in this session uh, we have uh, two speakers our first speaker is uh, our professor sadish of the department of statistics university of uh, kerala and as you know he is the organizer of this uh, uh for conference and the second speaker is uh, shaktivel and professor sadesh uh, he is a well known figure in the area of distribution theory and he has may have published a number of uh, 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 research papers more than 100 research papers in leading in national and international journals and also uh, he has guided a number of students for their phd and currently he is the uh, professor and director of school of uh, mathematical and physical sciences of university of kerala and he is talking on the topic on alpha generalized hyper poisson distribution and its generalization professor sadish please uh, thank you uh, <laughs> thank you professor degumar sir in fact uh, for the nice introduction and uh, i'm very much grateful to you professor for you for chairing this session and supporting us in in uh, all activities and uh, in fact um, there is a parallel session is also going on uh, for the contributory uh, presentations that is why we have uh, just a little bit late in the one or two minutes that in fact in this session um Uh, here um, i'm not uh, dealing more things because up to when uh, shaktivel professor shaktivel joined the session uh, please inform me so that uh, i can't able to see uh, who <laughs> whether he joined or not or otherwise uh, so that i can speed up within a, within 5 minutes and conclude the talk um, earlier uh, um dr baiju agreed in the to speak in this session but uh, there is a rearrangement request anyway that uh, let me to without wasting the time let me to uh, directly go to the uh, talk but kindly let, uh, with your permission let me to share my uh, slides i hope you can uh, view the slides okay is it okay is it visible okay uh the talk mainly concentrates on the alpha generalized hyperposon distribution and its generalization before going to alpha generalized hyperposon distribution give uh, some idea about the hyperposon and alternative hyperposon distribution and thereafter we can uh, that go to the alpha generalized hyperposon and it's generalized why we th these distributions this uh, be uh, before dealing with uh, these concepts 
we should know something about the confluent hypergeometric function. That is why I have written this is nothing but a confluent, the con it's a special function uh, which is phi a, a b z, which we can return in this way this form a into a plus one etc. a plus r minus one by b into b plus one etc. b plus r minus one is a raised to r by r factorial r equal to zero to infinity. This function enjoys several properties for details regarding the convergence and other properties. You can see Mathai and Saxena's book or Slater's book is also famous. It's a confluent hypergeometric function in 1960. So particularly on for that, that fun, confluent hypergeometric function. Uh, Hyperposon distribution is quite popular in the literature, mainly because of the fact that the Poisson distribution, while we considering Poisson distribution um, in the application side, the one of the main drawback of the Poisson distribution is the uh, EQ dispersion property. That's a mean and variance are equal. So um, uh, in certain situations, of, for example, modeling the rare event situation itself, there is there requires these types of uh, the assumption uh, or these types of a, a proper the characteristic of that Poisson distribution becomes a handicap in the in the sense that um, the practical situation the mean and variance may not be equal. So they uh, long back in 1964 itself uh, in, a, in the Journal of American Statistical Association, Bandwell and Crow considered a class of distributions. They are they termed as hyperposon. Uh, through this probability mass function, fx equal to gamma lambda by gamma lambda plus x, theta raised to x by phi 1 lambda theta. Here, this phi is nothing but the confluent hypergeometric function, and the lambda and theta are strictly positive numbers. And as usual, x is the support is 0, 1, 2, etc. Kindly note that when lambda equal to 1, this function, uh, this density, the phi gamma 1 is nothing but 1. Gamma 1 plus x is x factorial. When x is an integer, so because 0, 1, 2, etc., so that is an integer, the, so that it becomes x factorial. Theta raised to x and phi 1, 1 theta. Here, phi 1 lambda theta, so phi 1, 1 theta is nothing but e raised to theta. So that this is nothing but our Poisson distribution which is the probability mass function of the Poisson distribution. Okay. Now, the uh, when lambda equal to 1, the hyperposon reduces to Poisson distribution. When lambda is a positive integer, that distribution also has been studied by uh, uh, staff in the Australian Journal of Statistics in 1964. Uh, through the name, uh, displaced Poisson distribution. Badwell and Crow in 64 JASA paper termed the distribution as sub poisson and super poisson according as this lambda greater than 1 or less than 1. Clearly, lambda equal to 1 is this EQ dispersed. Lambda greater than 1, lambda less than 1, we don't know whether it is um, EQ over dispersed or under dispersed, but they termed it as sub poisson and super poisson distribution. Various methods of estimation of the parameters of the hyperposon distribution were discussed in Badwell and Crow 64 as well as Crow and Badwell 65, the classical and contagious distribution, discrete distribution. There's a book um, edited volume in that. Some queuing theory associated with the hyperposon arrivals have been worked out by Nishida in Journal of Operations Research Society. And several other papers also there in connection with the uh, certain estimation as well as some properties of this uh, hyperposon distribution. I will note that uh, Kumar and Nair in Statistica paper, they have considered an alternative version of the hyperposon. They termed it as alternative hyperposon distribution. This distribution uh, also possesses the, uh, two parameters. One is gamma and theta. And its probability mass function looks like this form, theta raised to x by gamma x, phi 1 plus x, gamma plus x minus theta. And here, uh, clearly when gamma equal to 1, this becomes 1 plus x, 1 plus x minus theta, that is uh, e raised to minus theta, so that uh, gamma 1 becomes 1x, this is nothing but x factorial, so that is Poisson distribution. So when gamma equal to 1, this alternative hyperposon distribution reduces to well-known Poisson distribution. So it is again a generalization of the Poisson distribution. 
and uh, the probability generating function simple some some algebraic or mathematical uh, um, operations you can come up with the probability generating function as uh, some i'm not going to the details phi 1 gamma theta into t minus 1 and uh, it's a mean uh, for example the rth factorial moments r factorial moment is nothing but r factorial theta raised to r by gamma r r get all to 1 so for each r equal to 1 to etc you have uh, all the moments you can find out even once you know the factorial moments it is not difficult to find the ordinary moments row moments like that and then central moments etc etc clearly the mean of the distribution is theta by gamma and variance of the distribution is theta into uh, this type of an expression theta into theta gamma plus gamma square plus gamma minus theta by gamma into gamma plus notice that the while the hyperbosan distribution is the mean and variance includes the, they are in terms of the expressions this uh, the in terms of the confluent hypergeometric function but here the mean and variance are not in terms of confluent hypergeometric function they are simply simple terms of expressions in terms of the parameters theta and gamma and notice that this variance uh, you can uh, this gamma you can rearrange so that theta by gamma you can come up with here plus this mean plus something like that so that clearly you can see that when gamma uh, less than 1 this distribution is under dispersed and when gamma greater than 1 this distribution is over dispersed while uh, considering the hyperposon, it is not difficult to say the one parameter is less than one or greater than one, or depending on a parameter, the distribution is under dispersed or over dispersed. But here it is clearly one can say that the distribution is under dispersed when gamma less than one, over dispersed when gamma greater than one, and equidispersed dispersed when gamma equal to one. So that this is an interesting property with regard to this distribution with uh, that parameter, particular parameter gamma determines the dispersion property of the uh, distribution uh, particular. So that, that, the, that, that is a very interesting thing here to highlight. The expression for uh, raw moments, uh, you can find in terms of the Stirling numbers of second kind, uh, you can see uh, uh, Sterling details regarding Sterling numbers. You can refer to Riordan's book on 1968 book or recursion formula for probabilities, uh, raw moments, several things are there, uh, factorial moments and uh, estimation with regard to the factorial moments are done so that the gamma bar and theta bar you can terms in terms of the symbol, symbol moments and this mixed moments also you can utilize. Several things are there, all those th things are away. Okay. Okay. Excuse me, so there's a call, so probably network will be. Uh, hello, I'm in a conference and meeting. So do you... ah, okay, okay. Ah. No, no, okay. Uh, okay. Uh. Uh, I got it. I got it. Uh. I got it. 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 I got Okay. Uh, can you see in the slides now? Can yes, you sir. Yes, sir. Oh. yes, we can see it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, in fact, there is a network issue. Consequently, there is a call comes and network issue. Comes. So that uh, we can see that uh, the certain data sets are considered here for uh, highlighting the importance of the this alternative hyperposon distribution but our interest is not this here the hyperposon but we are going to the uh, other generalized form so once again here the the property regarding the hyperposon distribution so once we have a one hyperposon and a alternative hyperposon distributions hyperposon is we have this enjoys this property when lambda uh, or one parameter less than one, greater than one, or equal to one depends on that determines the, the 
dispersion, under dispersion or over dispersion properties. Whereas in hyperposon case, it is not difficult. It's difficult to consider such a uh, such a result. But there is in certain data sets, hyperposon are better, and certain data sets, alternative hyperposon are more suitable. But, but so the, both distributions have the, some importance. In this ground, we are thinking of how to make the, both the distributions come under the same umbrella. So that so this alternative hyperposon itself, we, while we considering the binomial poson and the negative binomial, this type of binomial uh, is over dispersed. Uh, again, sorry, under dispersed and uh, poson uh, equal dispersed and negative binomial is over dispersed. So that this property, so the here alternative hyperposon can be utilized instead of all these three distributions, binomial, poson, and uh, negative binomial, because the, this property helps us to have a better, uh, better direction of the equidispersion property with regard to that. Similarly, here hyperposon and alternative hyperposon also suitable, and we can come on, come up with a more generalized situation that is known as that is, that is the relevance here the alpha generalized hyperposon distribution. So they led me to define alpha generalized hyperposon distribution through this probability mass function g3 set. Here uh, this type of a uh, probability mass function expression. Uh, here phi is the confluent hypergeometric function, and uh, uh, the e set takes values rho one to etc. and lambda strictly positive. And uh, alpha uh, in R and theta strictly positive. So that uh, when lambda equal to one, this distribution reduces to the uh, Poisson distribution. When lambda equal to one, this re distribution reduces to Poisson distribution. When alpha equal to zero, this distribution reduces to parametric. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that it has, it includes this uh, this family includes both hyperposon and alternative hyperposon. Now the uh, there are several properties you can derive. Uh, probability generating function can derive like this, and uh, the uh, several other recurrence relation. Also here also we can obtain the uh, uh, recurrence relation for probabilities, pro moments, factorial moments, and uh, uh, also the mean and variance. You can come up. But here the mean and variance in terms of delta 1, 1 and delta 1, 2, those are in terms of confluent hypergeometric function because of the involvement of the, the hyperposon and say subpiece. So that uh, you can come up with a condition under which the distribution becomes over dispersed and under dispersed. And recurrence relation for raw moments, okay, that's already mentioned. And uh, estimation aspects you can talk. Think of and we can utilize the maximum likelihood estimation or other other estimation procedures. Also, we can utilize moment method and mixed moment method. And uh, thereafter, we can also verify the you can, or you can highlight the the utility of the model with the help of certain data sets. How the alternative hyperposon distribution or alternative and the hyperposon distribution compared to that, this model gives a better fit to certain data sets. All the almost all data sets why because both in the, the this model includes both hyperposon and alternate hyperposon. Anyway, here this is a situation where both alternative and uh, with uh, this um, uh, the hyperposon and alternate hyperposon are not suitable, but uh, this alpha generalized hyperposon is suitable for this data set. Uh, similar another data set considered and there also we establish the 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 relevance of alternative hyperposon distribution here is another data set yeah here also the you can see that the chi square value or p value is more this is a value and that with regard to degrees here they are suitable but better suitable is here the alternative here uh, yeah can you can find that in certain situations this model how it behaves and also you can think of the generalized the the, the uh, likelihood ratio test for testing the parameter the relevance of the parameter the significance of the parameter alpha equal to zero against alpha not equal to zero or the other way so that the data 
test statistic. Uh, next, we consider the, I think time uh, 3.38, whether uh, uh, Shaktivel joined in this session? No? Yeah, Shaktivel has already joined. You, okay. just can, you, you can take for 5 to 10 minutes if you need. Uh, because we, have, we need to come, conclude this okay. session by 4.05. I shall okay. uh, conclude within <laughs> as oh, yeah. okay. So here you can consider a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables of K point following K point distribution, Hiranos K point distribution. In fact, that, that is known in the literature like that, with some parametric restrictions. We can consider use. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we can consider the uh, the this order k family, it's a generalized family the order k distribution like this. Uh, the sum of the this summation, the as as you said, the, this is the uh, random sum of independent and identically distributed Hiranos type K point distribution. So that the distribution of SCZ is nothing but the uh, alpha generalized high proportion distribution of order K. We call it as alpha generalized high proportion distribution of order K, or in short, we denote it as AGHPDK. Kindly note that the this distribution uh, becomes the stuttering Poisson distribution, well-known stuttering Poisson distribution, when lambda equal to one. And when lambda equal to one and theta j equal to theta for each j equal to one to k, this is the Poisson distribution of order k of Filippo et al. 1983 in the SPL paper. And when alpha equal to zero, the probability generating function reduces to the stuttering hyper Poisson distribution uh, and when alpha equal to minus summation theta j, j1 to k, then it reduces to the al alternative hyperposition distribution of order k. So th the, there are several papers in which uh, these uh, families of distributions are discussed. And uh, here uh, we can find, derive the probability mass function of this distribution through the uh, some mathematical computer. Yeah, so it is not, even though it is, looks like difficult, uh, this is summation over lambda one time summation over ix. The students can, can this is this is a uh, k-tuple sum. It's a k-tuple sum over the set, uh, set x1, x1, xk such that summation j, xj, j equal to 1 to k equal to x. So that this, uh, this is the probability mass function and I mentioned earlier, so for the computation of the probabilities, you can utilize this probability, this expression, this recurrence relation, which is relatively very simple compared to the other way. So computation will help us to, can we have written, in fact, the R codes also we can develop to compute the probabilities. And so the you can find the moments, all the moments exist finitely. Uh, as the factorial moments expression, it also, we can we there is we, we obtain the factorial moments uh, expression for factorial moments and expression recurrence relation for factorial moments also and also the estimation and uh, other inference aspects discussed here in the uh, this these things are available in the in our paper uh, I think this uh, come can I can see the details in the paper uh, here uh, the uh, certain data sets we have utilized for uh, highlighting the importance of this order k distribution for particular values of k, k equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. You can find. So while we are dealing with the big data analytics or different, more complicated models for particular values of k, that such a things will help us to model the data sets, more complicated data sets. This is another data set we utilized here. 
and uh, the testing aspects also uh, GLRT also discussed in this work and uh, we can see that a certain simulation study is also conducted i'm not going to the details here um these papers you can see that um i, I shall let me to check yeah yeah this uh uh yeah let's uh, language uh, okay statistical long back that's why uh, those details were not uh, fully you just uh, google you will get the details thank you so much for the for your uh, patient listening um for the time being let me to stop here because the next speaker is waiting even though i plan to let me to stop this sharing okay thank you thank you okay. any question thank you uh, professor sadish any questions or comments from the audience any questions or comments please always uh, let us thank the speaker once again thank you very thank much. you thank you sir <laughs> thank you sir for the for giving me more time back uh, also i'm uh, thankful to shaktiven because i have taken little bit time thank you so much uh, you please uh, carry on our next speaker is yeah. our next speaker is professor k m shaktiven and uh, his areas of research are statistical inference statistical quality control artificial neural networks and he has uh, obtained his uh, msc and mphil from lyalo college chennai and phd from uh, bardiar university in the year 2000 Wrong, and he is uh, working on the area mainly on uh, distributions and also on currently on wrapped models and his uh, present talk is on an optimal threshold based approach for risk modeling in extreme value analysis professor sakthibel please uh, good afternoon professor uh, can you hear me professor Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can. You can. Yeah. Is my screen is visible, Professor? Yeah. Yes. Visible. It's visible. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Ah, uh, so uh, it's uh, indeed a great pleasure to be associate with the. Uh, uh dr shatish kumar sir uh for the this uh, eighth consecutive international webinar on recent trends in statistical theory and applications and uh with uh, due respect uh i thank uh, professor jay kumar sir for sharing this section and now i would like to get into the topic uh of my talk sorry uh i today uh, topic is an optimal uh, threshold selection for risk modeling in extreme value analysis Uh, your screen is not visible now oh yeah one minute oh, sir is it okay sir ah uh, yeah no sir
so overview of my talk is uh, now i'm going to give a small introduction about this extreme value uh, theory and followed by what is a classical mechanism adapted uh, in this uh, theory and uh, we are proposing one model called uh, uh, adaptive uh technique uh, we propose a new method how we can fix a threshold and we perform one data analysis for supporting our uh, technique is superior than the existing one and followed by uh, discussion about the results of applications and summary and conclusion this is how i going to give my presentation now i give a small introduction about uh, extreme value theory uh, it is a unique statistical discipline that develops uh, techniques and model for describing uh, rare events uh, and uh, extreme event we usually uh, mean its unusual values of sequence observation of certain cases and the main idea of this uh, extreme value analysis is to model and measure the extreme events which occur very uh, small probability but its impact is very huge and uh, this will uh, devast the efforts of uh, century of human labor so therefore it is very important so forecasting those events well in advance and what will be the quantum of effect these are the uh, main objective of this study and uh, and how will be uh, the effect and uh, what will be the probability of uh, occurring such a extreme event uh, is a main important of study and uh, it is based on asymptotic behavior of a large order statistics uh, uh, based on independent and identically distributed random variable so uh, and uh, in extreme value theory there is uh, one index called extreme value index uh, which is uh, controls the behavior of the distribution function in its right time and this will tell all thing about uh, how uh, this extreme event will going to happen so therefore uh the major goal of this field is to estimate the probability of extreme event and often expressed in terms of return level and return field it is nothing but uh, how long or how long the next uh, extreme event will going to happen uh, how far it is from and how what kind of quantum uh, this will going to make a impact so this two is uh, two phenomena of interest uh, study by statisticians so therefore uh these are the two key uh, measures that is uh, interested by a uh, domain expert uh, being a statistician you should focus on estimating these two parameter based on the modeling and uh, nowadays you happen to see everything is an extreme event it may be a temperature it may be a sharp market and it may be a epidemiology or pandemic so whatsoever it may be everything goes in extreme level okay so therefore extreme value theory is a uh, uh, unavoidable field for any uh, scientist uh, and uh, i here listed a few area where uh, you can use extreme value theory uh, intensively and i start with uh, asymptotic changes so you can start flood uh, how the kerala is affected and chennai and one day flood in mumbai how it will make a uh, impact earthquake and uh, earthquake is very common in turkey heavy rain temperature cyclone storms river flow and what not so anything which relate to atmospheric or uh, environment that uh, plays a crucial role because uh, the world uh, the whole world is seriously connected so extreme in one area will uh, uh, impact the whole of the world or uh, even to say galaxy so that's why uh, extreme value theory uh, play a crucial role and the biomedical field uh, now with the advent of the sensors a um, uh, patient can be easily monitored by uh, carrying stuff and uh, necessary alert can be initiated to a uh, ward doctor or a head doctor and uh, supporting staff so in that way whenever some vital parameter of the patient is exceeding certain threshold it can be given an alert and uh, immediately they can uh, make a follow up action so that the patient will be saved so in that way extreme value analysis is useful and industry corrosion uh, defects temperature power shortage uh, demand and supply and uh, automatic gearbox monitoring and now uh, many things uh, because uh, it is very simple of threshold so anything which uh, goes above threshold is considered as extreme and it will it will make a impact so we should make a alert and also make a 
precautionary measures so that we can save. So, for example, you take corrosion. There is a bridge uh, which is made of iron and uh, uh, how long it will sustain the weight of the train so that we can save uh, people in accident and uh, you can measure something and temperature. Okay, if you in agriculture, if you see uh, high temperature, low temperature will make a production of any agricultural uh, commodity. So, and power shortage, it also make a significant impact in protections and uh, demand and supply. You happen to see uh, demand and supply is not uh, maintained, then you happen to see there will be a topple of government. Uh, even onion price will go per kg more than 100 kgs. Uh, that will uh, even make an impact in sustaining the government. And finance, your stock market crashes, financial crisis, price changes, and every place promised uh, uh, claim amount uh, because uh, they never foresee such kind of uh, incident will took place in a uh, normal period. So, in that, if that is the case, there is in uh, a, a concept called reinsurance. They themselves are reinsured to a company. Uh, whenever this kind of threshold exists, then they will bear the expense. So there is a limit up to which the present uh, insurance company will give the Pre, uh, how to say claim amount and uh, if it is exceed threshold then the insurance company will pay the amount okay so in that case now everything is insured you go in your flight you're watching a cricket match or whatsoever it may be insurance is a day-to-day -day, uh, affairs and telecommunication traffics and uh, fraud detections so if in single amount uh, single account uh, if more than uh, uh, so many number of transactions how you can detect a fraud and tele uh, tele trafficking uh, that also where you can use EVT extensively. These are the some uh, how to say pictorial representation of uh, those discussed areas. How uh, they significantly make an impact or uh, then redefine the theorem. Then uh, this uh, measure will converge to some uh, uh, measure quantity called H, uh, which is nothing but a yeah, non-degenerative. A distribution function and it will uh, converge to uh, certain limit uh, minus log of h of x. Uh, the here h is must be one of the three type of limiting distribution and they are nothing but uh, humble, uh, frigid and viable. These three distribution can be combined as yeah, one generalized distribution called generalized extreme value uh, distribution and uh, the form of the or PDF of this uh, generalized extreme value theorem is given in equation 2. And uh, here, uh, the parameter psi is called uh, tile index, uh, which will define uh, which kind of uh, particular distribution uh, it will come under. And uh, another parameter is called uh, location parameter mu and the scale parameter sigma. So it is made of three different distribution, location, scale, and the shape. And whenever this uh, shape parameter psi is greater than zero, then we have a wide range of tile behavior and this will uh, bring a shape of a frigid distribution and whenever psi is zero, then it is exponentially decreasing tile, then we have Gumball distribution and whenever psi is zero, uh, we have a finite upper end point and short tile which will, will form a shape of fiber distributions. So therefore, uh, this result is very significant since the symptom distribution of the maximum always belongs to one of these three distribution. So whatever may be the original distribution of these extremes. And another significant or a landmark uh, theorem is uh, piquant uh, balgamo dehan theorem. Uh, it gives the asymptotic tile distribution of a random variable when it is two distribution is unknown. So it will uh, based on a thrust code. Uh, it will uh, it describes the value of the threshold. So any value which is above the threshold is considered for this uh, finding this uh, conditional probability and its form is given in equation 3. And uh, the statement of theorem is nothing but let x1, x2 dot xn be a sequence of ID random variables and uh, if you be the air conditional excess uh, distribution function then this 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 theorem uh, gives a large class of underlying distribution f and uh, large value of uh, the threshold value u f u is well approximated by a generalized Pareto distribution. So uh, this uh, asymptotic distribution or approximate distribution is a generalized Pareto distribution 
and the uh, pdf of this generalized distribution here we have only two parameter uh, namely sigma and the psi and uh, it also has uh, three particular distribution uh, namely pareto exponential and uh, short tail pareto distribution for different value of this psi and it is mentioned here there are two major concept in extremality theory one is block maxima another one is peak hole threshold what is black maxima that is a given uh, iid random variable uh, uh, is uh, make it as a equal number of blocks and each block you can take extreme value so it depends either it's minimum or maximum it is depends on the problem under study and most of the time it is uh, maximum is uh, uh, considered as a extreme value so uh, the data may be annual or it may be uh, monthly or it may be daily and uh, it is of uh, equal uh, interval so, so therefore this approach consists in dividing the observation period into non-overlapping non period of equal size and restricts attention to the maximum observation in each block. And the parametric stat, uh, statistical methods for extreme value distributions are then applied to these observations. So it's generally assumed that the black uh, maxima closely follows an extreme value distribution and uh, it justifies using uh, uh, one of the major or, uh, area of extreme value theory. The another uh, method is uh, Pico threshold. So this Pico threshold approach is also called a method of excess. So this method selects those initial observations that exceeds a certain limiting threshold U. Uh, the main uh, concept of this method is use the threshold to separate the values that are considered extremes from the rest of the data. The rest of data is ignored and uh, create a model for this uh, uh, constituted data and uh, modeling uh, for a tile distribution, all these values, uh, which are all uh, exceeds uh, the fixed uh, or initial threshold. Uh, further, it can be shown that uh, for some sufficiently large uh, U, the distribution va uh, values exceeding threshold approximately to a generalized pattern distribution with the CF and the scale parameter. And uh, in this method, uh, there is a few challenges will occur because uh, whenever you fix an initial threshold, it depends on a person who handled the problem. So it is very person to person. Therefore, it's a challenging task uh, how to fix your optimal threshold. So this is why we hear the main difficulty of modeling with a uh, peak or threshold method is setting the right threshold. So it is important to find a good balance in setting the threshold to obtain a suitable balance between the variance and the bias of the model. And there are two main graphical tools for setting the threshold, that is mean exos plot and the uh, parametric stability plot. So since it is a science, uh, so initially you can start with some assumption, but later on all should converge to a single point. So therefore here we have proposed, uh, here uh, in literature there is uh, two method which will uh, give you how to fix the optimum threshold value. And uh, the first one is uh, mean uh, residual life plot, uh, which is uh, shortly abbreviated as MRL plot, which is introduced by uh, Davis and Smith in the year 1990. The mean residual life plot is based on the bigger of the mean of the generalized parameter distribution uh, through the uh, ex empirical mean excess function. Uh, and uh, if you assume uh, it follows a generalized parameter distribution, then the mean of x is uh, uh, given as sigma divided by 1 by psi whenever psi is less than 1. And uh, if the uh, generalized factor distribution is approx appropriate for modeling the excess or threshold u, then the condition, conditional mean of the excess is given and uh, as a dynastic whenever this uh, psi is less than 1 to ensure the mean excess. According to the uh, threshold stability property, the excess of any higher threshold uh, P, which is greater than U, also follows a yeah, uh, generalized pattern distribution, but uh, with a little uh, change in the scale parameter, uh, which gives a conditional mean. And it is uh, defined in equation 5. If the data follows uh, generalized pattern distribution, the mean of the excess change linearly with the threshold V. The mean excess function can be plotted with the confidence interval, uh, so that the mean residual plot will help us to identify the optimal threshold. Here, V is a 
advanced or uh, improved uh, threshold. So uh, NFT is a number of excess above the uh, threshold V. So the hello, professor. Yes, professor. You have you have five minutes more. Yes, professor. I make it fast. So the plot should be linear with V, uh, with a gradient of psi one over psi, and uh, the int uh, intercept is also given. Uh, uh, for this, uh, generalized pattern distribution is more appropriate. And another one is a parametric stability plot. Here, uh, you can uh, see the uh, plot of uh, this uh, scale parameter. And uh, for uh, whenever it has a drastic change, then you can fix that point and you can identify as an optimal threshold. Uh, this is how this will proceed. And uh, uh, we can use tile dependence and declustering. Uh, declustering, nothing but. Uh, one method uh, of filtering that dependent observation to obtain a set of threshold exceedance that are approximately independent. And uh, here identify the maximum in uh, excess with uh, each cluster and uh, assume the assuming cluster to be independent and the conditional external distribution is given as a generalized pattern distribution. And we can fix it. Here we consider only a threshold, uh, therefore we use a generalized pattern distribution. And uh, here, extremal uh, index is a measure of degree of local dependence in the extreme of a stationary process. And uh, the cluster is based on the run length. So initially, we start with the uh, 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 first uh, run one, and we see the cluster, how this is uh, behaving. And when as long as this uh, extremal index is nearer to 0, then it is uh, independent, and we stop proceeding. Otherwise, we go ahead with the two, three, and uh, we can progress in proceeding as follows. In this paper, we proposed a new method called adoptive threshold. Uh, here, we do it in two pieces. First one, we what we are doing, we are making as a uh, block, and each block we consider as a maximum, and each maximum is uh, is considered as so. Is it one? Is it two? Is it another? Uh, yeah, maximum of each block, and this is the observation under study. And among this one, which is a minimum, is considered as a first uh, threshold. In place to what we are doing. Uh, we are uh, going for uh, second threshold by using a yeah, uh, 2K's uh, estimator. And uh, it is nothing but we, we uh, for the constituted random sample, we will find a three uh, quartile, quartile one, quartile two, and quartile three. Of course, this uh, 2K uh, uh, estimator will tell you you take one fourth of the first quartile, one uh, second of the second quartile, and one fourth of that quartile, and you form a yeah, uh, new uh, value of the threshold. This will help us to find or filter the new uh, random sample, and uh, you consider this only for the further study. So that's an idea. And here we are using uh, generalized uh, PEX distribution uh, apart from usual GP, that is generalized Pareto. And uh, the PDF of this uh, generalized PEX distribution is given in equation 7, and uh, that's CDF, and the PDF is given in uh, equation 8. And uh, we are taken one real-time uh, data from uh, NASA uh, website and, uh, for ozone hole area uh, for the year 2002-2022 uh, on daily basis. And the ozone hole is a uh, region over the Antarctic with a total ozone of 220 uh, dobson units or lower. So these are the measurement used for finding the uh, ozone layer. The data is acquired from this ozone monitoring uh, instrument on NASA's uh, Aero satellite. Uh, the depth and the area of the ozone holes are primarily governed by the amounts of uh, chlorine and uh, bromine uh, in the Antarctic uh, stratosphere. Uh, here, uh, this uh, ozone layer will increase uh, in a particular period, especially for middle of September to earlier October. And uh, there is uh, there is a data set is a time series system, therefore we need to check the linearity. So we are using a decubular test for our data set. It is yeah follows a stationarity. So we go ahead with the analysis. And uh, using this uh, parametric stability plot uh, for uh, these uh, two cases, uh, for we are using modified scale parameter and also shape parameter. And uh, where the uh, drastic change, that we will fix it as a threshold. And if you happen to see the for both the modified scale parameter as well as shape parameter, uh, the point uh, 20.4 uh, million kilometers squared is the uh, optimal threshold. And uh, we are using uh, this pivoting method in the left side graph and uh, using proposed adoptive 
uh, AT approach in the right hand feature. The first one is the first test code, and the second one is a phase two using two case uh, estimator. Uh, and we study this observation is considered for our study. And POT method we consider this observation. And uh, we have obtained uh, uh, estimated these uh, parameters and the usual procedures. And uh, we have obtained the uh, for next two years, next five years, next 10 years, next 25 years, what will be the quantum of ozone uh, density or uh, depth? We, we are given with the confidence interval of uh, upper and lower quantum 95%. And uh, you can see uh, peak over threshold method, generally Poisson distribution, adaptive uh, threshold with uh, generalized parito and uh, adaptive uh, threshold with uh, generalized spark distribution. And uh, you can see the breadth of uh, this conference center, which is narrow, is a better uh, method. Therefore, from this observation, we conclude that uh, this one, that is our proposed method for a generalized effects distribution is more appropriate than the rest of two method. And uh, from uh, this Anderson and one was uh, uh, test also goodness of it is also will confirm the same. Therefore, uh, we, we, from this study, we conclude that the, our proposed method is good uh, for this generalized uh, effects method. Uh, so these are the uh, findings from uh, from this study. So now I conclude uh, this uh, our proposed method that is adaptive threshold is uh, better for this uh, generalized effects compared to the peak or threshold for the uh, generalized Pareto and also for uh, AT uh, adaptive threshold method for generalized Pareto. Uh, the, this distribution and this proposed method is performed better. Uh, so, this is the finding of this paper, and these are the references used in our study. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Sakthivel. Thank you, Professor. Any, any questions or comments from the audience? Otherwise, uh, let me thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I thank uh, our chairperson, uh, Professor Jaikumar, sir. And also, I thank uh, our Professor uh, Satish Kumar, sir, for having given me an opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank Once again, I thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Professor Jaikumar, for chairing the session in a very nice way. Uh, and uh, th thank you so much. For, Professor Sektivel for your nice talk. Uh, uh, in fact, we are a little bit late, I think. So uh, the next session, we can move to the next session. Uh, Vijay Shankar. Vijay Shankar is in the group. Okay. 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 So, no? Yes, sir. Please introduce the chair and hmm? uh, just just a minute. Please check whether the chair is here in the group.
Subna, the hello, Subna. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, just a minute. You have to wait because the chair is joining. There is some network issue. Join. Okay, sir. You join soon. Hello, Sakthivel, Professor Sakthivel. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, Subna, please introduce the chair. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. I hereby welcome you all to the technical session 17 with the session chair, Dr. Vijay Shankar. Now, Dr. Vijay Shankar is a faculty at the Department of Statistics in Government Arts College, Chidambaram, India. He obtained his MPhil and doctoral degree in statistics and has been in the teaching profession for over 15 years. He has several research publications to his credit, including estimation of expected time to recruitment using shock model approach and estimation of expected time to recruitment with wastage. We are fortunate to go have you chairing this session today. Without delaying you further, I will once again extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of the organizing committee and kindly request you to take over this session. Good evening, Professor. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, good evening, Dr. Oh, first of all, Professor, Dr. Ilango, one. Ah. Oh, okay, Total okay. service, 33 years service, foreign visit for USA and UAA. Okay. Total number of paper presented in uh, 119, PhD, uh, PhD awarded in 16, by uh, awarded PhD MP43. <laughs> Uh, doctor, number of in five. Doctor, doctor, 
please confirm yes, sir, yes, sir. professor professor ilangavan is here joined or not uh, yes here, here sir here sir wait wait okay. hey, connect okay. sir okay 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 wait sir wait sir. ஒரு மைக் professor vijay shankar please uh, introduce the uh, speaker once again and uh, please Okay. Okay. ஜிமேடி படிச்சு topic of new generalization of similarity distribution in properties and application in medical sciences it is joined by the researcher manivasagan and this paper uh, we introduce a new distribution length based 
sum of their distribution and the probability density function is given by this and based on this we have to define the weight function for this for the weight function we uh, assume the c equal to 1 then the corresponding length batch distribution with the probability density function is given by this expression and from this the cumulative distribution function other properties are derived the statistical properties are derived moment generative function and the other uh, things are uh, the yeah, parameters are estimated by mle method by fisher information matrix and the responding reliability uh, curve and the survival curves are done based on the simulated data then the survival function assort function reverse assort function and smith's ratio are calculated the statistical properties like moments harmonic mean moment generative function characteristic function order statistics and the likelihood ratio test has been derived and uh, and the uh, gunfrey lorentz curve also drawn maximum value estimation fisher information in matrix are calculated and uh, based on the application real data set blood cancer leukemia patient uh, by referring the albumin et al 2000 paper and uh, the variables are defined and the table gives the comparison performance of the fitted distribution of length bias and other distribution from this we conclude that the weighted length bias semantic distribution leads to a better fit than the other exponential length distribution this is a very new work uh, this is uh, uh, published in the web of science and uh, recently and uh, it is uh, uh, recently reviewed by so many authors and it is one of the best distribution for survival data the research derived in this will give better robust research and and it is uh, seems to be the very best distribution relating to the survival analysis uh, with respect to time t1 data thank you very much thank you sir any question from audience any question from audience Yes. 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 Okay, very good, sir. 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 Next from Tanmia. 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 सरदार पटेल यूनिवर्सिटी Gujarat. Title is the application of quality function deployment higher education. Uh, speaker's name. Can me a tinai. Ah, tinai is uh, there's a, there's a rearrangement for in that case. Uh, okay, sir. Goyal is there. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Right, uh, right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, Manish Goyal. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Manish Goyal. Yeah. You, um, since there is a rearrangement due to the some other uh, issues connected with the speakers. Okay, so please, okay, sir. Yeah, you can inter, you can just yeah. call Manish or introduce Manish Goyal and uh, or uh, you can ask Manish Goyal to introduce him in a brief way and uh, uh, present his uh, talk. Manish Koyal, are you present? Hello, Manish. Hello, Manish Koyal. Mm. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah. Can we? It's visible. Okay. You just uh, um, say a uh, few words about you, and then. Continue. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, the Dr. Stish Kumar sir, for uh, giving me opportunity uh, to present my work here. Uh, myself, Dr. Manish Goel. I am working as a system professor in IIHS Kurukshetra University, Kurukshetra, and um, I am currently working as an assistant professor here. So my topic of today's presentation is a general class of non-parametric test using Jew statistics. 
So first of all, what is the outline which I am going to present today? As I, we have defined a new class of journal class as a non-parametric test to test the location parameter against umbrella alternative using new statistics. What is the first of all, what is this umbrella alternative? This umbrella alternative is like if the effectiveness of a drug is likely to increase with increase of dose up to a certain level, then its effect begin to decrease. We can see in real life situation, like a drug has effective up to a certain level, then its effect is start decreasing because the dose level is a, has some side effects. So we have to take it only up to a level. So how to find that level and how it is increasing and decreasing effects, is it statistically or not, that's what we are going to define here. So these are many applications in biology, medicine, botany, dose level testing as I defined here, engineering, economics and other. We also compared our test with some other ex uh, existing test and uh, numerical example is provided. Then finally, simulation study to find the power of the proposed test. Yeah, so our test is based on U statistics. So what is U statistics? Here U means unbiased estimate class. So U statistics is the important role in theory of estimation and hypothesis testing. And U statistics means the average of kernel, which is a unbiased estimator with the degree of parameter. So U statistics is the U and BUE, I can say, for a estimable parameter. So that's why U statistics is very much important in hypothesis testing. That's why you use U statistics to introduce our test. So we propose the test for case sample location problem. So what is the case sample location problem? Let us suppose we have a case samples, K population with K independent samples as XL1 to XLN L, where L equal to 1 to K means there are K samples, and 1 to NL means there is a sample size of NL. Now it has CDF FLX. Now we want to see whether the locations of these CDFs, which is theta one up to theta k, all are equal, or there is an umbrella alternative. So how we define here umbrella alternative? It is like theta one is less than theta two up to theta p. Here it is theta p, means there is a peak p. This theta you are going to up to peak p, then it is start decreasing with the, as a greater sign, theta p is greater than theta p plus one up to theta k. So we have to find this pattern is existing or not with these location parameters. This is known as umbrella alternative. So we are testing this hypothesis. For if we take P equal to K, let us suppose P equal to K here. So it is only a increasing pattern. Or if we take P equal to one, then it is only a decreasing pattern. So that is known as ordered alternative because it is all, all increasing or it is all decreasing. So that alternative is represented by John Kerry and Terpasta in 1952, which is a very well-known test, John Kerry test in statistics, in non-parametric basically. So this test is also other modified by these many authors in their papers. Then this type of umbrella alternative firstly introduced by a complete with their authors in 1977. And the test is given by Mac and Hoff, which is also a very famous test in non-parametric inference. And he gave the test in 1981. And this test is further modified by these many authors. But here we proposed a journal class of this test for this case sample problem with the journal umbrella alternative as the linear combination from the Kumar 2015 test. Why we choose the Kumar 2015 test? Because this test is a for the two sample problem. We extend it to K sample problem. But this for two sample problem is a generalized test. It is already a generalized test. So that's why we used it for our K sample problem. This is a generalization of these many papers, which is where famous one is Wilcoxon Mann Whitney test, which is a famous one again. So now we propose. Uh, two sample location for case sample location problem of a test as let us suppose there are C D fixed sample size such that one is less than equal to C equal to D. Here C D is my subsample size 
from the samples of size L and M. So we take two population of L and M and their size as per sample size as C and D. Now if from the CH sample, ith order statistic is less than gth order statistics and simultaneously c minus i plus one order statistics is less than d minus j plus one then i both this i and both this l and this l is less than this mth population so lth population is less than mth population then there is a population given as two means this weight kernel hij is given as weight If either of these happen, then given weight one, otherwise G. So two weight means Lth population is less than Mth population in a location because this Ith and Gth is the order statistics. Yeah. So these are the two sample use statistics is associated like this, which is given by Kumar 2005 of two TIs. Why we choose two TIs here? First one is for the increasing pattern as in umbrella, there is firstly increasing, then start decreasing. So firstly, we take it as increasing pattern, then we start take it as for the decreasing pattern. And they, they are plissome. That is the test we default here. And we also consider the weights because there may be some weight associated with that. So that weight is known as AL. So it is a linear combination of that GUI with some weight. So in particular, if we take this uh, combination CD equal to one and IJ equal to one, our test, which is the proposed as TCDIJ, this test becomes part 2009. If we take this particular combination, this test becomes part in 2017. Uh, and if we take the yeah. if we yeah. don't have any weight, then it becomes the MAC work form. In the MAC work form test, there is no weights. He simply takes the, they simply take as AL equal to one. So yes, we have to find the optimal choice of these weights to have the maximum efficiency. So this is also one of the problem which we are going to discuss the optimal choice of these weights AL. Now the distribution of the proposed test. Firstly, we find the expectation of our uh, two sample use test, which is use CDIJ and it comes out one for all use CDIJ. So we find the um, expectation of our proposed test, which is TCDIJ, and this expectation is comes out the sum of all the optimal choice of weights, which is AL. So we have to again find the optimal choice of weights to have the expectation of our proposed test. So this AL is very much important here. And also, if we take, take AL equal to one, which is the test T becomes V, we are defining it T and V. So U is for two sample, T is for K sample location problem, we are defined, and V, if we take where say one, then it becomes K minus one here. Now we find the variance of the test, means we find the uh, distribution of the test, proposed test, and T is the uh, linear combination. So using these theorems given by circling, we find the asymptotic distribution of our proposed test. How our uh, distribution works, it is the asymptotic normality. The test simply follows normal, normal distribution asymptotically. Whenever we have take n approaches to infinity such that nl upon n is a fixed constant, which is a lambda l. And this quantity, the square root of n into t minus expectation of t, is normal with mean zero and variance sum rho t. Now, what is this row T here? It is simply the sum of first variance, means the variance of the first statistics T1, which is for the increasing pattern, plus variance of second, plus two times covariance between both of them, which makes sense here. Now, equations, we find this row T, which is a variance of our proposed test. It again depends upon some function of CDIJ, Obviously, K, which is the number of samples, C, which is the first sample, subsample, C square, and all the AIs, which means all the optimal, all the optimal choice of weights. So we have to find the optimal choice of weights here again to find the variance. And 
if we take ai equal to 1 this simply becomes 6 times k c square into rho c d i j which again makes sense and it depends on only c d i j so what is this rho c d i j firstly we find this rho c d i j from this uh, calculations of variance plus 2 times covariances and we found this rho c d i j which is a very big combination <laughs> of c d i j very big expression but that's fine because if we find, if we see this whole combination, it only depends on C, D, I, and J, which are the parameters of our dash. And it does not depend on K, which is the number of population, and any other distribution. That's why it is a distribution free test also. Now, the optimal choice of weights, which I am talking about, that we have to find the optimal choice of weights AI. Firstly, we find the efficiency, which is the sum of AI square into uh, mu square divided by this variance which we have already found, then this is a mu. And using the results, we are going to maximize this efficiency so that these weights can be found. This efficiency should be maximized so that we have to find the optimal choice of weights. Yeah. So why using this, we find this is the optimal choice of weights, here, which is for different values of L. And this is the optimal choice of weights. Here. Using these optimal choice of weights, we can find the efficiency, which is the premium efficiency. I mean, I mean, it is the maximum efficiency I can see here. Right. And this is the efficiency of the test if we don't take any optimal choice of weights. So, seven number when optimal choice of weights, eight number when we have not taken any optimal choice of weights. So, we compare the test. Obviously, with respect to this eight number also, which is a MacBook form and other test. We so compare with the MacBook form and a partial test and bot test. We take these three tests to compare our proposed test and found the following results here. This is a very important table here because here we are comparing our proposed test in the form of some numerical values, which is the efficiency values with respect to different tests. First three columns are for the MacBook test, which is a very well-known test. Then the partial test, other three, and then last one is for HUT test, which is given in 2009. So this is the latest one. It is going in a simple pattern. So now we can see our test is, whenever there is value greater than one, then our test performing better than the existing test. So we can see the maximum efficiency is here or it can be seen as here, this one column and this one. So whenever C plus D should be maximum, I have considered it up to six, but it can be should be as maximum as possible and I plus J equal to two. So whenever we take C plus D as maximum and I plus J two, we go to the maximum efficiency for this particular distribution, which is also very good distribution, U quadrating which has a kurtosis less than uniform. So next one take as uniform distribution. It is also a very good distribution as well known, which is uniform simple one, which is kurtosis 1.8. So it is also very short tail distribution. And we take, we can find here that the maximum efficiency is here. Means C plus D as maximum as possible and I plus J equal to two. So this is the, so this is the results for uniform distribution. The next one is for normal distribution. Here, C plus D equal to five and I plus J equal to five again. So this is giving the maximum efficiency here. So I, I or C, I plus J equal to two. So C plus D equal to five, not at, as maximum, only five. So we are restricting here to C plus D equal to five for the normal one, which is a medium tail distribution. Then for the low strict distribution, this is a very special case in uh, location problem. Always max, uh, Mac and both test is better because it is the optimal test for low strict distribution specific, specifically. And our test is not performing better because it is on, again an optimal test. So our test can't perform better. So that's why we should consider Mac both test here in case of low strict distribution. Now for Laplace, C plus D equal to five, I plus J equal to three. 
this is the better one and similarly for Cauchy which is a large scale distribution c plus d equal to 5 and i plus j equal to 3 and for Gumbel, c plus d is maximum as possible and i plus j equal to 2. So there are many uh, distributions we have considered and we have combined all the results in these four points. First of all, that the test depends upon the tail behavior. So tail behavior of the distribution is performing our performance of the test. So for light tail or skewed distribution, C plus D as maximum and I plus J equal to two. And for medium tail, C plus D equal to five and I plus J equal to three. And for heavy tail, C plus D maximum and I plus J equal to C plus D plus two by two to have the maximum efficiency. So we consider an um, illustrative example here, which is a, a real life, uh, we can consider a real life example in which we consider secondary data and data is considered by, given by R. D. Norman, a WIS scale. This data is given by Hollander et al. in 2013, in which data is taken as a five age groups, 16 to 19, 20 to 24, 34, sorry, then 35 to 54, 55 to 69, and greater than 70. So five age groups, people, uh, males, especially males are taken here. And a WI scale is considered for these five groups. And it is one, and the Hollander wanted to see that whether this WIS scale or this learning ability is same in all the age groups or it firstly increase then decrease. So we consider here that this learning ability is increasing up to age group 54, then it start decreasing. So we want to see whether this happened or not. So firstly, we take this uh, KS test and find that our test, uh, data follows normal distribution and we uh, apply our test with the best choice of CDIJ, which is 3232 and found our T value and P value. So this is the P value of our proposed test, which is less than 0 0.05. So we are rejecting the null hypothesis. It simply means that learning ability is increasing, significantly increasing up to age group 35 to 54. Then it start decreasing with the further increasing of age, which is a uh, real life example, real life illustration of our proposed test. That we found that this learning ability is increasing up to this age, then it start. Mac and Bob test is also find the same, but our test is so uh, next, last one after this example, we find the simulation study to find the power of the proposed test for the normal distribution and 10,000 patients we use here with the 5% level of significance. And we found for different values of theta that this is the power of the post. Their 95% power is achieved here and also here. We have we achieved the 95% power, which is the same results as the computation of efficiency, which is a bit many here. That we have found the same results in simulation power as in the PR. So these are the references I used here. That's all. Thank you, everyone. If there is any question, a good presentation. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Vijay. Manish, good presentation. Any question from others? Thank you. Any sir. question from audience? Okay, thank you, Manish. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vijay. Good. Next presenter is Bindu. Yes, sir. Bindu Government Arts College, Calicut is here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, respected Chair Vijay Shankar, sir. Sadish sir and the audience. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Sadish sir for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my uh, work in this prestigious international conference. 
let me share my presentation it's visible okay thank you sir i am dr bindu pp assistant professor in the department of statistics of pg and research department of statistics government arts and science college uh, today i am going to present my recent work asymmetric double extended x gamma distribution and its applications in the present work uh, i have extended uh, x gamma distribution which is the mixture of uh, exponential and gamma to the real line and introduced asymmetry, uh, asymmetry to model uh, asymmetric and bimodal data set you know that exponential and gamma distributions are well known probability distributions for modeling uh, lifetime and survival data sets and recently you can see several uh, modifications of or extensions of uh, exponential gamma also viable distribution also one of the important distribution several extensions of uh, these class uh, these distributions are also proposed by various authors and these distributions are uh, very useful uh, extensions are very useful in modeling uh, real life phenomena especially in the area of survival and lifetime modeling and also recently there is a lot of interest in constructing more flexible distribution that can account for asymmetry bimodality kurtosis or peakedness and heavy tails in the data and these characteristics are seen in the uh, data sets like uh, microarray gene expression data as well as the cancer pro uh, mrna expression levels cancer uh, microarray data sets and several high data several data sets we can see uh, asymmetry as well as uh, bimodality in the present uh, study i have uh, extended the x gamma distribution and also uh, extended uh, the extended x gamma distribution and also introduce asymmetry uh, in the above two distribution and sen at all uh, 2016 introduced the x gamma distribution uh, which is a special uh, finite mixture of exponential and gamma distribution and also several generalizations of x gamma also introduced by several others like exponentiated x gamma inverted x gamma transmuted x gamma marshall olkin and several other uh, extend, uh, extensions of x gamma distributions are also available and let me uh, just uh, give a quick review about what is x gamma distribution x gamma distribution is the finite mixture of exponential with the parameter theta and gamma with the parameter th three theta with mixing proportion pi equal to theta by 1 plus theta where theta is the scale parameter and recently uh, saha et al 2019 introduced a generalization of x gamma called extended x gamma distribution the extended x gamma distribution is a finite mixture of gamma alpha theta and gamma alpha alpha plus 2 theta distribution with the mixing proportion Uh, theta by theta plus beta where beta greater than or equal to zero and uh, there is uh, as i have mentioned earlier there are a lot of interest uh, in uh, distribution which can model uh, data which have asymmetry heavier tails bimodality and peakedness especially in gene expression data we can see that there is a sharp peak uh, in the middle and as well as Uh, asymmetry and also in mra sequen uh, expression data uh, we can observe bimodality also and that motivated me to in uh, uh, consider this x gamma distribution as well as the extended x gamma distribution and ex uh, and i have uh, the pdf of uh, i have consider uh, uh, develop the uh, double x gamma using the uh, pdf given in equation number one uh, the uh, the x gamma distribution with the parameter theta is having the pdf given by equation number 1 and also the extended uh, version of x gamma distribution introduced by saha et al 2019 is as in equation number 
and uh, then i have uh, introduced first i have introduced the uh, extension of the x gamma distribution to the end line that means a two tailed or reflected or two tailed x gamma distribution this is a single parameter distribution and actually we can see there's an a generalization of uh, laplace uh, distribution that is double exponential distribution so you can, if you look at the structure of this density equation number 3 it is a uh, mixture of maybe you can consider a mixture of laplace and uh, double gamma distribution and i have uh, derived several uh, uh, property uh, uh, reliability function and several properties of the double x gamma distribution and the cdf of the x double x gamma distribution as in equation number 4 and i have plotted the uh, graph of uh, double x gamma distribution for various Uh, values of the parameter is a single parameter distribution and for various of uh, values of uh, theta you can see that the distribution has heavier tails as well as sharp this is a symmetric distribution uh, heavy tailed and as well you can see from the plot itself you can see that for lower values of theta uh, it have heavier tails uh, compared to the laplace and other distributions and we also as just like laplace distribution uh, this distribution has a sharp peak in the middle and i have plotted the cdf of the uh, double x gamma distribution for various values then i have uh, uh, studied the uh, reliability measures for this distribution and this is the hazard uh, uh, graph uh, equation of the hazard function and I also i have plotted uh the graph of hazard function for various values of the parameter and also reverse uh, hazard function and also i have derived uh, studied where it is uh, reliability measures like mean residual life and that is also given in equation as in equation number uh nine and also and i have uh, since it is a uh, reflected distribution so i have calculated this for x less than 0 and x greater than the separate equations and also then i uh, have derived the expression for the rth moment of double x gamma distribution since it is uh, symmetric only even order moments ex uh, ex exist and odd order moments are zero and it is given in equation number 10 then i have uh, computed the various mo uh, mo moments uh, then also i have computed the expression for the absolute uh, moments and so coefficient of kurtosis also i have computed then uh, order statistics lot of uh, applications uh, for uh, uh, estimation also we use the order statistic uh, and so i have also uh, derived the expression pdf of the rth order statistic and cdf as in equation number 13 then uh, you have also studied several other uh, structural properties and also i didn't included in this slide and now i am going to the estimation part of the double x gamma distribution and in this estimation procedure actually i have uh, used r package and i have uh, maximized the the likelihood function using the optim function using bfgs algorithm it's very easy to uh, 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 compute the mles uh, mle of the we have only single parameter and i, I didn't uh, solve the uh, score equations in in my estimation procedure actually i have maximizing the likelihood function and uh, obtain the value of uh, theta which maximize the likelihood function and also i have uh, similar uh, 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 than this carried out the simulation studies uh, to uh, validate the uh, uh, estimation procedure uh, for for this i have uh, take uh, two some different sample size also i have uh, took and uh, uh, and uh, three choices of the parameters uh, 0.5 1 1.5 and uh, this that i have uh, took the sample size uh, 50 100 250 and 
uh, for each also so the pair i have done for some, some other values also i have done only tabulated uh, uh, the 0.5 these three values of theta and also i have uh, tabulated the uh, standard error as well as as the standard deviation after uh, over the thousand replications and you can see that uh, a uh, standard error and standard deviations very close and very small and uh, it reduces as the sample size uh, increases and i have also tried for uh, very small values of theta it's also working perfectly but it took a lot of uh, iteration number of iterations will be more if the uh, value of the theta is very small that means just like 0 0.001 like that and for very high values also it took some uh, uh, iterations and then i have uh, extended uh, the double x gamma, uh, gamma distribution uh, using the extended x gamma distribution uh, introduced by saha et al 2019 this is the uh, just like the x, uh, x double x gamma i have uh, derived the pdf of uh, double extended x gamma uh, which is as in equation number 15 and this is the uh, cdf uh, cdf of the double x gamma distribution in this derivation we have uh, i have used the incomplete uh, we can also express in terms of in the upper and lower incomplete gamma functions here i derived in using the upper incomplete gamma functions and computations are also very easy using r package you can uh, compute the incomplete uh, gamma functions and uh, for more reference uh, you can see the reference paris set all Uh, Paris to the uh, 2010 for more details. These are the plots. I have plotted uh, double extended x gamma for uh, various choices of the parameters. This is a three parameter family. Uh, this for alpha, theta, and beta. And I have plotted separately for uh, alpha less than one and alpha greater than because uh, for alpha greater than one, the distribution has bimodality. for less uh, alpha less than 1 you can see that the from this plot you can see that the distribution is uh, unimodal and also uh, you can see the tail heaviness as well as sharp peak in the middle for various uh, choices of the parameters and here is the this is the plot of the uh, double x extended x gamma distribution for uh, various choice of the parameter uh, for alpha fixing alpha greater than 1 we can see that uh, the shape of the distribution this by model for alpha greater value here i consider the value of alpha 1.5 uh, 2.5 3.5 etc you can see that it's uh, uh, by in the by modality here and uh, then i have derived various uh, uh, function the structural uh, property uh, pre pdf of, of several other things also uh, order uh, distribution order statistics etc for this distribution but i have not included in this slide uh, just similar to the previous uh, expressions and now also i have considered the uh, estimation uh, so consider uh, i have done all simulation studies also in the same way as in uh, double x gamma i have also done the simulation studies uh, for and uh, this were very only three parameters not that difficult uh, just like laplace estimation of laplace and uh, we can similar way we can do the estimation of this family and uh, next uh, i have introduced uh, the asymmetry in the first model I, uh, that is the double asymmetric uh, double x gamma distribution because uh, many data set we can see that uh, there is slight uh, asymmetry of uh, seen in this data so the symmetric uh, model is not suitable for modeling that uh, such kind of data so i have uh, introduced asymmetry in, into the symmetric using Uh, the method proposed by farnardes and steel 1998 and here i uh, have uh, here the uh, additional parameter uh, double x gamma is a one parameter family here i am introducing the asymmetry parameter kappa kappa is the as, uh, introduces asymmetry in this distribution and for x uh, less than 0 the expression uh, for x greater than we have different expressions and uh, 
then I have plotted um, the, uh, the asymmetric uh, double x gamma for uh, various choices of the parameter. For example, uh, first I have plotted for k uh, less than 1. And <clears throat> you can uh, see that um, uh, it is uh, for uh, k less than 1, the distribution is asymmetric. And uh, and again, I have plotted uh, for k greater than 1 also. If for k equal to 1, we can see that the red line is symmetric. Kappa, the parameter kappa introduce asymmetry in, the, in this in the symmetric distribution. And I also have uh, carried out the maximum likelihood estimation procedure uh, uh, using R package and again using the BFGS algorithm of uh, uh, and use the opting function and giving different uh, initial values. We have this is the two parameter theta and the kappa. And, and I have uh, also I also tried with uh, various other methods also ML, uh, rather than ML, I have uh, used an, uh, an, uh, different nonlinear uh, weighted least square estimation and other type of estimation in Anderson Darling and Kramer uh, bond estimation different other estimation procedures also I have tried for this asymmetric data asymmetric uh, double uh, double x gamma distribution also for for, uh, for various choices also we can see that bias and msc are low and if you increase the sample size you can see the msc and bias are uh, very low all the method perform uh, very well then now i have uh, extended the double x gamma distribution to uh, introduced uh, asymmetry in, in double x gamma distribution and again uh, Double x gamma, uh, double extended x gamma is three parameter. Here I am adding additional uh, parameter kappa in the same line as the other distribution, and um, kappa is the asymmetric parameter. Same thing I have done using the Fernand approach developed by uh, Fernandez and Steve, 1998 paper, and uh, I have plotted again here also. I have plotted uh, as I have mentioned earlier, double extended x gamma distribution is unimodal for for alpha less than or equal to 1, and by model for the uh, alpha greater than 1. Then uh, I have uh, plotted for alpha less than 1, and this is for alpha uh, greater than 1. And you can see asymmetry in these plots, by modality and asymmetry and heavy tails. And I, here, uh, finally, I have illustrated the applications of the two asymmetric models. I have introduced two asymmetric models here. One is uh, unimodel uh, with the sharp peak and heavy tail, uh, with the heavy tail. And that is uh, asymmetric double x gamma distribution. I, here, I have considered the distribution with the uh, unimodel data, uh, which have asymmetry. and and this data set is modeled using the asymmetric Laplace distribution. Uh, it's uh, one of the most popular distribution uh, which is used for modeling gene expression data. And uh, I can see uh, here I have proposed a more flexible uh, distribution uh, than the asymmetric Laplace distribution. And uh, for comparison purpose, I have used AAC information criteria procedures, AAC, BAC, all this I have computer, AACC, etc. I have computer, but only tabulated the AAC and BAC because uh, the, uh, the result almost same for all, uh, all other information measures. So, so I have tabulated only for only AAC and BAC. And, um, here I have for application of double uh, asymmetric double x gamma, I have used the CDNA microarray gene expression data downloaded from the uh, microarray Stanford microarray database. Here also, uh, this is my area of uh, interest in this. Uh, in this area, I did PhD, and uh, so uh, have uh, before fitting the model, I have normalized using the uh, Lovis method by Delvin. Uh, Cleveland and Delvin 1988. And after you can see from the figure uh, that is uh, the distribution, uh, the, we have normalized uh, plots are given in uh, B, uh, the part 7B. Uh, you can see that the data is normalized after the lowest uh, approach. 
and uh, here uh, i have uh, this is the descriptive statistics for the uh, microarray data set from this you can see that the skewness 0.79 and uh, as well as uh, a slight skewness as well as the high kurtosis you can see here and uh, i have compared uh, the asymmetric laplace distribution is used for model these data sets and uh, we usually we compare we, we can if you look at the error distribution for microarray the one most cited paper is asymmetric the ice asymmetric laplace myself also introduced some uh, uh, generalization of asymmetric laplace also and uh, we compare usually with the normal also here uh, the competitive model here is the asymmetric laplace and normal so i have compared the asymmetric double x gamma with asymmetric laplace and the normal and uh, I have, uh, yes, I have mentioned earlier, I have used the uh, R package, use opting function and VFGS algorithm. And I have plotted um, uh, the uh, histogram of the data and fitted uh, values are also plotted. And you can see that the data has sharper peak. And also you can see the asymmetric Laplace also is a best model for this uh, one because it has also have sharp peak. And also the double uh, extended X gamma also having the sharper peak, just like uh, in, uh, asymmetric Laplace. The, this uh, AAC, you can see that some improvement uh, or the asymmetric Laplace is observed in uh, double extended sorry asymmetric double x gamma distribution and this lower aic value indicate um, uh, it's far more uh, better than the gaussian model and uh, asymmetric we can see that asymmetric laplace also is a very good model this total the number of observation here is more than 30000 observations in the data so we can see the aic values and bsc will be very uh, bigger value because we are dealing with uh, more than 30000 observations and uh, here i have uh, compared with the aic and you can see that uh, aic is uh, lesser lower value of aic and bac for the uh, asymmetric double x gamma compared to the asymmetric laplace next i have um, uh, studied uh, illustrated application of the uh, asymmetric double extended x gamma distribution which is uh, a heavy uh, which has heavier tails uh, bimodality and the uh, asymmetry and also sharp peak in the middle also for uh, illustrate i have uh, this is my recent work and recently i have did the estimation and all this thing i have just took one data set only uh, i will try with the other data sets and and, and co competitive models also i have only tried with this models only uh, double extended x gamma and asymmetric uh, double x extended x gamma sorry asymmetric double x gamma and the asymmetric uh, double gamma asymmetric laplace and the skew normal uh, distribution these skewed distributions i have only tried and um, there may be another uh, alternate best maybe uh, some alternatives also there and i have uh, downloaded this uh, data set uh, from the uh, a cancer a national cancer institute that data set it is um homos of in uh, cancer cell uh, protein level measurement data actually and i have also uh, log transform the data and plotted and uh, fitted uh, this using the asymmetric double extended x gamma asymmetric x gamma as well as uh, asymmetric laplace asymmetric double gamma and the skew normal and uh, these are AAC and uh, this uh, the, uh, full uh, part of the table is not visible due to some uh, this part of the table is not uh, visible here and from this we can see that um, AAC values are uh, low for the uh, asymmetric double extended x gamma distribution uh, and hence uh, you can see that for the mrna uh, data with, uh, which ha uh, has bimodality and asymmetry as well uh, uh, he tail heaviness also not that much and but uh, this distribution capture uh, the as bimodality as well as asymmetry in that uh, 
totally RNA data. Usually in many RNA data, you can see the bimodality observed in many RNA data, microarray RNA data. For gene expression data, many of them are not bimodal. There is slight bimodality also in many gene expression, microarray gene expression data also. And uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, I have introduced two uh, asymmetric distributions, uh, namely asymmetric double X gamma distribution, which is um, unimodal, uh, heavy tail as well as peaked asymmetric. And other distribution is extension of that asymmetric double X, uh, extended X gamma distribution, which is asymmetric bimodal, heavy tailed and have sharp peak in the middle. So uh, I hope this uh, distribution introduced in this paper is uh, very useful for modeling data sets which uh, has uh, uh, bimodality and asymmetry as well as peakedness and uh, heavier tails. These are my these are some references. Thank you. Uh, once again, thanks to Sadish sir for giving me this opportunity. Okay, good presentation, Bindu ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any question from my audience? Okay, thank you. Next. Archana, Archana here. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Two percent here, Papa. Can I introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Esteemed chairperson, esteemed professor Sati, sir. Myself, Dr. Orchana Panigrahi, assistant professor, Department of Statistics, Seven Sai University, Kotta. I am going to present the paper. Okay. And F okay. Sir? No, okay, you're present. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Today I'm going to present the topic an approach to find an unbiased estimate of finite population variance using auxiliary information. The outline of presentation is literature review, proposed estimate, variance of proposed estimate, comparison of efficiency, empirical study, conclusion, and reference references. In literature review, we know that the finite population variance is defined as SY square, which is by n minus 1, summation of y i minus y bar. The unbiased estimate of finite population variance is defined as TB0, which is also defined as a small SY square. Its variance is given by variance of TB0 is equal to theta SY to the power 4, beta 0 minus 1, where theta is defined as 1 by small n minus 1 by capital N. And the beta 0, 4 is defined at mu 0, 0 to square. Mu migrated R and S at migrated number. Proposed a ratio for time variance using knowledge of population variance of the square, which is defined at TBR is equal to S y square, S square by small s square. Yeah, the bias estimate of the population, MSC of TBR to up to order one given by MSC of TBR is equal to theta S square beta 0 4 plus beta 4 0 minus 2 beta 2. 
where beta 40 is depends mu 40 by mu 20 and the position is equal to mu 20 by mu 20 and mu 0 the vr is more efficient than the shift data greater than half coefficient of the vr by coefficient of the vr of the vr where the coefficient of correlation coefficient between s square and s square similar to is such in a product of time population variance is given by tb equal to s square s square by and its value of the first order is given by MAC of TVP is equal to theta SY to 4, beta 0, 4 plus beta 4, 0 plus 2, beta 2, 2 minus 4. Isaki 1983 also suggested a ratio type, a, a regression type estimator for estimating SYS which is given by TVLR is equal to SY square plus SSP and Mutas. Where the test is called COVID, SSP and test. And MC of TVLR is given by MSC of TVLR. It is a linear combination of the sample variance of the square and the sample variance of auxiliary variable SS square, which is given by TBM is equal to lambda 0 SY square plus lambda 1 SS square. Lambda 0 and lambda 1 are two suitable constants for statistics. For different values of lambda 0 and lambda 1, one can get different estimators, some deduced estimators. If we consider lambda 0 equal to 1 and lambda 1 equal to 0, then we can find the usual unbiased estimator S y square. If we consider lambda 0 as capital S square by small s square and lambda 1 equal to 0, then we can find TBR, which is proposed by Isaki in 1983. If we consider lambda 0 equal to small s square by capital S square and lambda 1 equal to 0, then we can find TBP, which is a estimator similar to Isaki 1980. If you consider lambda 0 and lambda 1 equal to capital S square by minus small s square by small s square, then you can find the regression type of estimator which is given by Isaki 1980. If you consider lambda 0 equal to exponential of S square minus S square by S square plus S square and lambda 1 equal to 0, then you can find a an estimator which is which was given by Singh et al. in 2009. If you consider lambda 0 equal to exponential of s square plus s square or by s square minus s square and lambda 1 equal to 0, we can find a product type estimator, exponential estimator which, is, which was given by Singh et al. in 2009. If we consider lambda 0 equal to beta 2x minus beta 2 2xy and lambda 1 equal to 1 minus lambda 0, we can find an estimator which was given by Swain in 2015. Now come to the variance of our proposed estimator. As our estimator is unbiased, we have to construct an unbiased estimator. We have to choose lambda 0 and lambda 1 so that the proposed estimator is unbiased and the variance is also minimum. So the condition for TBM to be unbiased is given by lambda 0 minus 1 SY square plus lambda 1 SS square equal to 0. The variance of the estimator is given in matrix format lambda dash S2 lambda, where lambda equal to lambda 0 lambda 1 and S2 is equal to S00, S01, S10, S11. S00 is variance of S SY square, S11 is variance of S square. S10 and S01 are covariance of SY square and SX square. The opposite of lambda I with the condition of unbiased mean square is also given by in matrix format SY square S2 inverse and Q2 by Q2 dash S2 inverse Q2. 
hence after expansion we get lambda lambda in matrix format in the after expansion expanding the matrix the optimum value of lambda 0 and lambda 1 are given by lambda 0 star beta 40 minus beta 22 by beta 40 minus beta 2 beta 22 plus beta 0 and lambda 1 star is equal to s y square by s square beta 0 4 minus beta 22 beta 40 minus 2 beta 22 plus beta 0 4. The optimum value of the variance of TBM is given by theta s y square beta 40 minus 1 beta 0 4 minus 1 1 minus beta square by beta 40 minus 2 beta 2 2 beta 0 4. Now comparison of efficiency. Our suggested class of estimator TBM is an unbiased estimator of the population variance. So here the class of estimator TBM is optimal compared with similar the other estimators in terms of efficiency only. The efficiency of the the comparison of efficiency of suggested class of estimators TBM under optimality with other conditions with other estimators are made under two conditions. First one A under general condition and second one B under bivariate normality condition. The suggested class of estimator TBM under optimality is always more efficient than the usual unbiased estimator TB0. The estimator TBM under optimality is more efficient than TBR if S1 beta 4 0 minus 2 beta 2 2 plus beta 0 0 4 square minus VH is greater than beta 4 0 minus 1 beta 0 4 minus 1 1 minus beta square under binary normality condition the condition is 4 1 minus rho square whole square of 1 minus rho square greater than 1 minus theta square where rho is the correlation coefficient between the study variable y and the auxiliary variable x. The class of estimator TBM under optimality is more efficient than TBP under general condition A beta 4 0 minus 2 beta 2 2 plus beta 0 4 square minus 4 whole square of beta 2 2 minus 1 is greater than beta 4 0 minus 1 into beta 0 4 minus 1 and 1 minus theta square. Under bivariate normality condition case B 4 1 minus rho square greater than 1 minus theta square. The estimator TBM under optimality is more efficient than TBLR if S1 beta 0 4 plus 1 is greater than 2 beta 2 2 and under vibrate normality condition rho square less than half. Now for empirical study, we, I consider here uh, to study the performance of the proposed estimator numerically, I consider 16 populations collected from the different literature, uh, which is described in table 1, 8 population having positive correlation between X and Y, and in table 2, 8 populations having negative correlation between X and Y. The source of populations, description of nature of X and Y, capital N, small n, rho, beta 40, beta 04, of these populations are presented in these tables. For comparison purpose, we consider the usual language estimate TB0, Ratio type estimator TBR due to Isaki, product type estimator TBP, which is similar to Isaki, the regression type estimator TBLR due to Isaki, and our proposed estimator TBM. Now, assuming simple random sampling without replacement, the relative efficiency of different estimators with respect to TB0 are compiled in table 3 for the cases in which the correlation coefficient is positive in table 4. For the cases in which the correlation coefficient is negative, it is the description, it is the table one, which is a description for population where the correlation coefficient is greater than zero. The sources are Johnson 92, Draper Smith 1966, Black 2009, Stevens 2009, Draper Smith 1966, Murphy 1967. Cochrane 1953, Black 2009. And the description for the population where rho less than zero. The sources are Black 2009, Madala 1988, Draper Smith 1966, 
Adel 2007, Madala 1988, Black 2009, and Adel 2007. Now it is the table for percent relative efficiency of estimators with respect to TB0 when rho greater than 0. It is the table for percent relative efficiency for rho greater than 0. Here we can observe for TB0 it is 100 and for TBM it is the maximum. And if this is the table for percent relative efficiency of estimators with respect to TB0 when rho less than 0. And here we also find the percent relative efficiency in TB0 is 100 and TBM is the maximum. In conclusion, in table 3 for population from 1 to 8, the percent relative efficiency of TBM is the maximum. In table 4 for population from 1 to 8, the percent relative efficiency of TBM is the maximum. So when the study variable and auxiliary variable are positively correlated, the proposed estimator is more efficient than the ratio type estimator TBR and the regression type estimator TBLR. So we may write the efficiency E in descending order, like efficiency of TBM greater than efficiency of TBLR greater than equal to efficiency of TBR. When the study variable and the auxiliary variable are negatively correlated, the proposed estimator is more efficient than the product type estimator TBP and the regression type estimator TBLR. So we may write the efficiency E in descending order like this. Efficiency of TBM greater than equal to efficiency of TBLR greater than equal to efficiency of TBP. These are the references of my work. And thank you all to listening me. Thank you very much. Very good. Archana. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, good presentation. Next. Hello. Am I audible? Uh, next. Uh, audible. Next. One name. One Akanksha Kashikar. Uh, Akanksha Kashikar in Pune. Yes. Pune University. Yes. Okay. Yes. Person Yeah. Let me share my screen. Yes. So is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Visible. Yeah. So I'll be talking on outlier detection uh, in cylindrical data based on Mahalnobis distance. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my work here. This work is with my PhD student, uh, Prashant Hamale. So um, first, what is cylindrical data? So cylindrical data is basically directional data, but it has two components. One component is circular or angular, and the second component is linear. So for the circular part, the observations can be recorded in polar coordinates, like they are on the surface of a sphere, and the linear part are like our usual observations. Hence, it is treated as being on the surface of a unit cylinder. So such types of uh, data sets occur in environment, psychology, agriculture, and geology. For example, if I'm recording direction of the wind, then that direction is a circular component. And if along each direction, I'm also recording concentrations of the pollutants, then the concentrations would be like our usual continuous variables. So those would be the linear observations. Similarly, if, I, if I'm recording, say, amount of rainfall and wind direction, then wind direction will be an angular observation, and the amount of rainfall will be the linear component of it. Outliers, uh, now what are outliers? So outliers are unexpected observations that impact our analysis. So in circular data, 
outliers are defined as observations that are far from the mean using a circular distance measure now when we have to talk about cylindrical data the outliers could be either in the circular component of the data or the linear component of the data or they could be outliers in both the variables circular as well as linear so so far people have uh, developed test for uh, c uh, cylindrical data using cd lm statistics and for cylindrical data very less work has been done so one of the recent works for cylindrical data is by mohammed et al where they have proposed a test statistic based on spacing theory so this is based on k nearest neighbors distance and they use discord um they use k nearest neighbor cutoffs but the cutoffs are derived from simulations and there are two limitations of their test first is they don't consider correlation between linear and circular co components they treat them as kind of independent and that they are assuming that the underlying distribution has to be johnson verily then only their cutoffs hold so we thought that we should try to develop a procedure which can address these two limitations so what does our proposed procedure do so we pr we are proposing a procedure which is based on mahalanobis distance since it is based on mahalanobis distance it incorporates correlation between the components and for determining the cutoff for uh, i mean the threshold for cutoffs for declaring an observation as an outlier we have proposed two approaches parametric bootstrap and non parametric bootstrap so parametric bootstrap is of course based on the distribution but it is not restricted to any particular distribution whichever distribution we have the data from we can use parametric distribution uh, we can use parametric bootstrap for that and if we decide to use non parametric bootstrap then this becomes a distribution fee procedure these are the two advantages of our method so as i said it will involve two steps first step is computation of mahalanobis distance and second step is determination of the threshold once the threshold is determined any observation which has distance above that threshold will be declared as an outlier okay and for determination of threshold we have two possible approaches one is using parametric bootstrap other is using non parametric bootstrap now first how do we compute mahalanobis distance as i said the data that we have consists of cylindrical observations so they are recorded as theta and x so theta is the cylindrical component and x is the linear component so for theta we need to convert that theta to some sort of cartesian coordinates so we use polar coordinate equations so this theta i we transform as r cos theta i and r sin theta i r can be taken as 1 and the third component remains x i so now that i have trivariate data we can compute mahalanobis distance using our usual formula from multivariate theory so v bar is the mean vector of all the observations and sigma hat v is the sample variance covariance matrix computed using all the observations because we are using sigma v here the correlations between the components is taken care of and once i have so we will get values of d1 d2 dn corresponding to n observations high di will indicate potential outliers now we have to decide how high is high so for that we need uh, thresholds so if i want to use non parametric bootstrap then what we will do is we will generate a trivariate bootstrap sample consisting of n observation so bootstrap sample means we will be uh, generating observations repeatedly from the same sample with replacement and the sample size will again be n so with that we will then calculate mahalanobis distance for each observation in the new bootstrap samples then we will find 95th percentile for those n distances this entire procedure we have to repeat for b bootstrap samples b could be 100 1000 2000 anything so we will get b values of this d star that is d1 star d2 star db star and then we will compute fifth percentile of this which is de uh, decided as threshold so if for the original data if any observation has distance greater than this threshold then we tag that observation as outlier similarly for parametric bootstrap the procedure is more or less same 
the only difference is in the part where we generate the sample so instead of generating a random sample from the given data we generate the sample assuming that the underlying distribution is known of course we don't know the parameters so we use the estimated parameter values and we use the information about the assumed distribution to generate a samples and once we have the samples rest of the procedure is exactly the same as in case of non parametric bootstrap so these are the two approaches for determining the threshold based on either the parametric bootstrap or the non parametric bootstrap so let me now go to the simulation study uh so for the simulation study we have used data from johnson and verley distribution why we have used this data because we are planning to compare our proposed procedure with the procedure given by uh, mohammed et al and as i said their procedure is applicable only in the case of jw distribution so jw distribution wa was developed based on maximum entropy principle and mardia and certain obtained the density by conditioning on a trivariate normal distribution so this is the pdf of the jw distribution the parameters are mu and kappa and lambda and the ranges mu is between 0 to 2 pi kappa and lambda are positive and kappa has to be less than lambda so we have two components the circular component which is given by theta and the linear component which is given by x so the marginal distribution of the circular component is wrapped cauchy distribution with mean direction mu and mean resultant length this whereas marginal distribution for x is uh, not known conditional distribution of x given theta is exponential with this mean and conditional distribution of theta given x is von mises with mean mu and concentration parameter kappa x so the parameters that we have used are so currently so mu we have taken as pi by 2 and we have tried various values of kappa from 0.5 to 30 pi kappa indicates strong association between linear and circular variables so if we want data to be highly correlated then kappa values have to be high and as of now we have used 500 bootstrap samples for generating cutoffs all the simulations have been carried out in r uh, we have tried various sample sizes 20 30 40 50 and because see in an outlier detection procedure if we want to check efficiency of the procedure ideally we should know in advance which observations are outliers and we cannot really know that in advance for a real data hence in the simulation setup we contaminate some randomly chosen observations because we have contaminated them we know that they are outliers they are not naturally occurring observations and then we check which of these contaminated observations are detected as outliers by our procedure so we have two performance measures p1 is the ratio of contaminated observations correctly identified as outliers so they are true positives and p2 is the ratio of non contaminated observations incorrectly marked as outliers so these are false positives so ideally if my procedure is good then i should get high value of p1 that is true positive and low value of p2 that is false positive so uh, these are various values of the parameters which we have tried and we have proposed it with the mohammed et al's method of uh, which is given by ck in statistic so ckn is the k nearest neighbor distance corresponding to i th observe sorry ckn is the maximum of cki where cki is the k nearest neighbor distance for the i th observation cut off value for c1n statistic are provided in this paper and they provide only for c1n so if we want to detect more than one outlier then we need to derive cut off so we have derived the cut offs for them but the procedure is that if i am using ckn then they can detect at most k outliers okay it cannot detect more than k outliers so here is one of the graphs i am not showing uh, graphs co corresponding to all the combinations i am showing just one graph so this is comparison of c33 statistic and proposed method for different values of kappa when sample size is 30 
and 10% observations are contaminated. So three observations are contaminated and hence we are comparing it with C330. Okay. Now you can see here the red graphs are corresponding to the CKN statistic and the black graphs are black curves are corresponding to the Malanobis distance based statistic. So as you can see, I, I said we need high values of P1 and low values of P2. Correct. Uh, let me check. Yes. So because P1 are true positives, so we want high P1. On the x axis, what do I have? On x axis, I have contaminant level. Means uh, if I am having an outlier which is very far away from the data, then of course that is easy to detect. So contaminant level kind of decides the addition that I'm doing to the current data. So this is linear contaminant. So if I'm adding zero, if I'm adding one, then of course that outlier is going to be less easy to detect. Whereas if I'm adding 20, then that observation is going to be very easy to detect as outliers. So as expected, Malinobis distance uh, performance of the method improves with the contaminant increase in the contaminant level. And with kappa equal to 0.5, we get the significant improvement because kappa denotes the concentration parameter. So for lower kappa, we get better values. On the other hand, we want uh, low values of P2. So again, the performance improves with contaminant levels. Uh, here, you might see for P1, it is obvious that the method, uh, CKN method does not detect outliers. So it is showing almost zero values of P1. As far as P2 is concerned, we might feel that CKN method is better because the graph for uh, CKN method lies near zero. But the problem is uh, this shows zero, uh, I mean, this shows zero false detection rate because it does not recognize any observation as outlier. And if you don't recognize any observation as outlier, then obviously you won't recognize it as I mean, there is no chance of getting false positive because there are no positives at all. Okay. So that's why P2 value is zero, even though the method is bad. Uh, we have also applied this to real data. So this is the data on wind direction and wind speed. So wind speed is X axis. Uh, so we can see here that this observation colored in blue has been detected as outlier by their method as well as by our method. These are the estimated parameters and the threshold distance. And there is another data set, which is ozone concentration and wind direction. So the outliers, we have detected three outliers. One is here, another is here, and other is here. These are the three outliers detected by, by our method. So these are the parameters on the basis of which uh, these observations are marked as outliers. So um, I would stop here. Uh, thanks a lot for giving uh, listening to me thank you thank you thank you Akshana. Pune university thank you sir a good presentation very thank you It was Akansha, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Any presenter is here? Madam, references, madam. Question. I will paste in the chat. Okay, okay. Very nice presentation, madam. Professor, is five participants is presented, professor. Um, it was a very fine, excellent session um, by young researchers in the in fact, uh, professors of the department and university, university level. 
um let us give a big clap to um, from professor elangovan professor um dr krishna uh then dr bindu and dr archana is it yes manish oh, no manish going manish oh, yeah. let us give a big clap to each of the speakers thank you sir thank you uh, excellent presentations okay very good keep it up and uh, we need in fact <laughs> thank, you, thank you thank you bro thank you um uh, i think uh, we can uh, next session we'll start at um, 6:25 so there is some time so your session uh, concluded earlier anyway this um, if anyone is there to present no problem we can any contributor speakers who are not listed in the uh, that can also we, we can give time but otherwise let us take a um or consider this time as far as an interactive session you can interact each other or otherwise wait for the next session next session we will um, the parallel session is going on Uh, okay, for okay. the presentations so okay, the, this you, pla main platform mainly only on the invited talks and the parallel sessions are for contributory presentations let's go on those who are, who, who are interested can join there and uh, please return back uh, maximum to attend the next uh, invited talk i think the plenary talk by uh, dr dia satokopen professor of the university of rutgers there after uh, professor vijay nayar and uh, professor david banks and professor sidnam to chatterjee professor chatterjee so um, you be request your support and your participation active participation in the mining sessions too and also uh, there are several are waiting so it is not possible for us to start this next session before so let us wait up to 8 uh, 20 or 25 22 23 like that 8 okay okay thank you professor sir thank you is occasion to thank the chair of the session okay thank you thank you thank, thank you. you vijay chengar thank you thank you sir i forgot okay thank you
Hi, Professor. Do you? Hello, Dr. Satish Kumar. Good morning. Hi. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> yeah. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm waiting for the chair. There is some network issue. Okay. With the okay. But uh, yes. Mm. Doctor, the the best body of Central University Rajasthan agreed to chair this session. This session. Okay. No problem. Uh, yeah. He is trying to join. That I think okay. he is not at join because yeah. of some network issue. Probably. He sent uh, a message to me. He is trying to join, but uh, there is some network problem. So. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Language. No, you are not. No, you, you, you. Okay. 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 Anjana, please introduce the chair and uh, help the chair to uh, for for uh, making the session in a smooth way. Conducting. Of course, sir. Warm greetings to all the participants. We have reached uh, the 18th technical session of WSTA 2023, which is a special session in honor of Professor U. S. Nair, that will be chaired by Dr. Deepesh Bharti. Dr. Bharti is a faculty at the Department of Statistics, Central University of Rajasthan, India. He specializes in uh, distribution theory, statistical inference, actuarial science, and extreme value theory and its applications. Dr. Bharti has uh, numerous research publications to his credit, including uh, the research paper entitled "A New Skew Logistic Distribution: Properties and Applications," published in the Brazilian Journal of Probability and Statistics in 2016. He has enthusiastically engaged in uh, many national and international conferences, where he has shared his expertise and experience through invited talks and presentations. And it gives me immense joy and honor to welcome you, Dr. Bharti, to chair this special session. So, without further ado, over to you, sir. Uh, welcome, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. You are have to unmute your mic. You have to unmute your mic. Okay. Now it is up. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Satish, uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to chair this session. I am delighted to uh, request Professor Jaya Satagopalan to. Uh, to start uh, his uh, to start her lecture um, after afterwards we will have, uh, so this session is uh, is 
it's uh, for 35 or approximately 35 30 minutes 5 minutes for uh, discussion so professor jaya please over to you thank you dr bharti and thank you dr kumar uh, let me share my screen uh, Are you able to see my screen? Uh, not now, madam. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Are you able to see? Okay. Excellent. So, uh, first of all, congratulations to Dr. Satish Kumar and his colleagues from the University of Kerala for putting together yet another wonderful seminar series. Uh, I know they do this annually. It's a tremendous amount of work and they have been um, consistent in, uh, in organizing this and giving opportunities to several people to speak and to attend these seminars. So thank you, uh, Dr. Satish Kumar, once again, and my congratulations. And also I want to wish everyone a very happy National Statistics Day. It was yesterday and it continues today. And throughout. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Anjana, would you please give a brief by sketch of the report of there before starting the session? Of course, okay. sir. It'd be my pleasure. Okay. Please. So please. we have a Professor Jayat Sethaguman. She is currently working as a professor at Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at Rutgers School of Public Health. She received her doctoral degree from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and her research focuses on our statistical genetics or genomics with applications in cancer epidemiology and our tumor biology studies. Her research topics include our cost effective study designs for genome wide studies and our dimension reduction, among others. Professor Satagovan has established uh, the Center for South Asian Quantitative Health and Education at Rutgers which studies cancer and allied diseases and aims at promoting cancer prevention in these communities. And uh, we feel really fortunate to have you, ma'am, as a speaker. So now I'll leave the virtual stage to you for your talk. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Anjana. I, uh, that was very kind of you. And today I will uh, uh, talk about two studies um, uh, on breast cancer that I've been doing. Through uh, these are one is a study that I did very early on in my career, which uh, I started my career 28 years ago, and a second study that I did more recently uh, towards the 25 uh, plus years of my career. And since this is a session in honor of uh, Dr. Uni Shivaraman Nair, I want to begin by saying a few words about Nair. Um, uh, he is the uh, founder of the Department of Statistics at the University of Kerala in 1945, when it was then known as the Travancore University. And uh, Professor uh, Nair is also a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He was elected in 1944, which was the year when my mother was born. <laughs> so I I'm very delighted to see this uh, relationship in the years here. Uh, after all, we are statisticians. We like the relationships and numbers. And India has played a major role in statistics in, in numerous ways. And uh, one of the foundations for statistics that comes out of India is agriculture. It's not agriculture alone, but agriculture plays also a very important role in the statistical contributions, especially from India. And Dr. Nair has written numerous reports uh, about statistics in agriculture or agricultural reports in the 1950s. And he also led uh, Kerala in the National Sample Survey. And he also served as the superintendent of census operations in the Travancore, Cochin State. So 1950s was a thriving period when uh, Dr. Nair was making numerous contributions to statistics in addition to other years where he has made pivotal contributions. He was born in 1904 and it's a very, 1904 happens to be a very important year for India. Uh, it is when the Indian Universities Act was um, established and the Indian Universities Act was meant is meant to uh, formalize uh, higher education in India 
and establish research laboratories and so on, and sort of modernize or begin the modernization of the university system as we know today. And of course, Dr. Nair um, lived in a very, very important period for India, 1904 to 1982. We all know that is the time of the struggle for independence, and he saw India receiving independence and then India making sustained progress towards becoming a modern nation. And as part of being a modern nation, India made numerous contributions to science. And the year of his death, 1982, is a very, very important year once again for science in India. And it is the year science entered every single household in India because 1982 is when color television was arrived. It was the first broadcast of Durdarshan in color happened in 1982. I did not have the fortune of personally meeting <clears throat> Dr. Unni Shivaraman Nair, but I would uh, suspect or I speculate that perhaps Dr. Nair um, left this mortal word with the satisfaction that science is arriving for the public and entertaining or doing good for the public. So with that, I pay my respects to Dr. Unni Shivaraman Nair, and I will begin my talk now. So my talk is about breast cancer, <clears throat> and it is the most common cancer diagnosis among women in the world. This is a map of the world, and you can see pretty much everywhere is pink, the color of breast cancer. Of course, there are a few countries, uh, one country in South America and few in Africa and uh, Mongolia and some Asian countries where there are other cancers that are more prevalent, such as cervical cancer and liver cancer. But breast cancer um, is, is the most common across the world. And today, numerous advances have been made, and we understand a lot about breast cancer today. We know uh, what are the um, non-modifiable risk factors. We know cancer increases with age. We know uh, age at menarche is an important um, uh, risk factor for breast cancer, age at first full-time pregnancy, age at menopause, and so on. So these are all age cannot be changed. We cannot wake up one day and say, today I'm changing my age. And other things that cannot be changed but play a role in breast cancer, important role, are family history of breast cancer and especially inherited genetic mutations such as BRCA1, BRCA2, and other genes. And other things as dense breast tissue and once we have received radiation to the chest, especially for a childhood cancer, that could potentially play a role in breast cancer. Once uh, uh, we receive radiation to the chest for childhood cancer, that cannot be changed. We already got it. And that uh, those children must be monitored carefully, and that happens. But there are also other modifiable risk factors, lack of physical activity. We can increase our physical activity, use of birth control. We can change that, menopausal hormonal therapy and so on. So these are all some of the very important factors related to um, increased risk of breast cancer or modifying the risk of breast cancer. And today, uh, we also have a lot of good understanding about various aspects of breast cancer, such as how to diagnose breast cancer, how to screen for breast cancer, you for using, for example, a mam mam mammography. We also know a lot about different types of treatments for breast cancer. We know also how to treat breast cancer based on the genetic composition of breast cancer. And numerous studies are also occurring to learn more about additional genetic compositions of breast cancer, which can subsequently uh, be used to form uh, new drugs in order to treat breast cancer. And this is only uh, this slide does not cannot do, do justice to everything we are understanding breast cancer, but these are some of the important understandings today. And we have arrived at these key understandings through the applications of numerous statistical and computational methods. They have been foundational to our understanding of numerous diseases, including breast cancer. And we all know uh, how, how to use Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, how to calculate re relative risks or odds ratios. These are fundamental uh, metrics um, that are used in uh, all sorts of health, including breast cancer. We also know how to fit statistical models and how to do stochastic modeling. We know how to look for trends 
And we also today know many more modern ways of looking at large data. And there is also several um, databases or data repositories that are available. Uh, collectively, these are allowing us to learn more and more about breast cancer and other diseases too. And in the next few minutes, I will share with you two personal contributions. And these two personal contributions, as I said, one is in early days of my career and one more recently. And these are all done with uh, collaborative teams. None of these are done alone by myself. And these are, one is a study of uh, lifetime risk of uh, breast cancer in Ashkenazi Jewish women who carry either a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation. And the second is a more recent study of sparse canonical correlations to learn about breast cancer genomics. And I chose these two studies because these two um, encompass two distinct study design. The first one is a case control design, and the second was, is uh, more observational samples coming from a large cohort. And they also focus on distinct populations. The first one is focusing on Ashkenazi Jewish women, and the second one focuses on non-Hispanic white women. These are Caucasian women. And study design is a very important uh, foundation for statistics, so I want to highlight this here. So the study of lifetime risk um, estimation in mutation carriers. So when a woman has a mutation or when a woman is detected to have a mutation, the natural question for either the woman or her family members or importantly for her clinical um, care a provider is what is the risk of breast cancer in the woman who carries this particular mutation? And this is the question we attempted to address in this study. So I, I was, uh, this was early on in my career, within six years of starting my career. And Colin Begg was my chairman at that time. And I worked with numerous oncologists who are providing uh, care to patients through surgery or treatment or through genetic counseling. And also one other statistician colleague from the National Cancer Institute. So this is to show you that it takes people with many different expertise to come together to do a study of this kind. So the question is, what is the lifetime risk of breast cancer for an Ashkenazi Jewish woman who carries a BRCA mutation? It may be a, B a mutation in the BRCA1 gene or BRCA2 gene. I clump together here in this title as BRCA without distinguishing between one and two. So in this study, we obtained data on a uh, hospital diagnosed with breast cancer in three different hospitals, um, two from the United States and one from Canada. And we have a total of 782 women who all have breast cancer. These are our cases. And at that time, there was a study going on in Washington, D.C., in Ashkenazi Jewish women. And these are women who do not have breast cancer. At that time, they did not have breast cancer. 3,434 women. So these are cases and controls. And in each woman, uh, we, the, the study investigator measured whether this woman has a BRCA1 mutation. They, took, they looked for a particular mutation uh, that I named here, 185 del AG and 5382 insertion C. And they also looked for a BRCA2 mutation. So they say either a woman has or does not have a BRCA mutation. She may have any of these mutations. And for each woman, they also say she has or does not have a BRCA2 mutation. And in addition to whether a woman is a case or a control and what is her mutation status, we also have da uh, data on age of that woman. So is she age under 40 or is she between age 40 and 49 or is she uh, of age 50 and above? So the question now, what lifetime risk is essentially for a statistician, what is the probability of getting breast cancer by a certain age A when a woman has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation. So in statistical terms, what is the probability disease equal to one, that is getting a disease, given mutation is one by certain age. But in case control data, we do not get, collect data on probability disease equal to one, given mutation equal to one. But what case control studies tell us is, what is the mutation probability of mutation in cases probability of mutations and controls, right? Because the conditioning factor are we have collected cases, we have collected controls, and we can calculate this retrospective probability. 
So from the probability of mutation given disease equal to 1, we want to get back to probability of disease equal to 1 given mutation equal to 1. And with some algebra and with some effort, we can calculate this probability of this uh, in this form given on the right hand side. It's a ratio. The numerator has an odds ratio which we can ca calculate using a logistic regression applied to the case control data. And we can also calculate probability disease equal to 1, which is the baseline risk. Under certain assumptions, we can ca do this calculation. And what is the odds ratio we can calculate from case control data? What is the probability of disease in the entire population? That is baseline risk we can obtain from some cancer registries. And what is the probability of mutation or mutation prevalence we can calculate from our control data under the rare disease assumption. And suppose I, I refer to this probability of disease equal to 1 given mutation equal to 1 as the incidence of breast cancer in a particular age or I of A, then the probability that by age, by age 50, by age 70, a woman gets breast cancer at age 70. That means the woman gets cancer at age 70, but she must be without cancer in all the previous ages, right? So we can calculate what is the probability of not mutation. This is probability of disease by age A is 1 minus being disease free in every single age group before that age. So these probabilities can be calculated with a little bit of effort, but they are very simple to calculate. And once we have this probability, we can put together the case control data and estimate the probability of breast cancer by age A, that is lifetime risk of cancer. So in this slide, I show you the data from that case control study. So we have women in three age groups. Due to confidentiality and privacy, they only give an age group of the woman. They will not provide us the age of each woman. And we have data on cases and controls. And we also know who has mutation and who has what mutation and who is negative that does not have mutation. So there are, let's say, 71 cases in the age 40, under 40. And this is 692 controls age under 40. For these 71 cases, 18 have a BRCA1 mutation, 2 have a BRCA2 mutation, and 51 women have no mutation. So 25% have BRCA mutation, about 3% have BRCA2 mutation, and the rest do not have mutation. And we can assemble the data for each age group in this manner. And we can also calculate the odds ratio. What is the odds of a disease uh, in a woman carrying a BRCA1 mutation relative to the odds of, the dis uh, of disease in a woman who does not have a BRCA mutation? So we can calculate these odds ratios. And once we have these odds ratios and uh, under the rare disease assumption, uh, we can uh, assemble the lifetime risk of breast cancer. So we have women... So these are women given in 10-year age groups, whereas in the left-hand side table, I showed age in a certain uh, different age groups. And these 10-year age groups are given because the cancer registry in the United States provides data in these 5-year or 10-year age groups. So in each of these age groups from the cancer registry, we can calculate the probability disease equal to 1, the baseline risk of breast cancer. So the baseline risk changes according to the decade of the woman. But in our data, we only have age less than 40, right, as one entire group. So what is the probability of mutation or prevalence of mutation in the age 20 to 29 group, age 30 to 39 group? We assume them to, be, we have to make some assumptions. So we make the assumption that it is the same prevalence. And we also have prevalence of mutation in the 40 to 49 age group, 1.1%, right, from the control. So it's 0.011. And once again, age 50 or above, we have the same mutation prevalence because that's what we have here, that age group but we can get different uh, probability of disease from the registry. And once again, we make the same assumption. The odds ratio is the same because we do not have finer gradations of age here. And we can calculate the overall um, uh, lifetime risk by age A using the formula that I gave in the slide before. So what it says is just for BRCA1, a woman, if a woman of Ashkenazi Jewish origin carries a BRCA1 mutation, then she has 31 
percent probability of getting breast cancer by the time before she reaches age 60 or she has 46 percent probability of getting breast cancer before she reaches age 70. And we can calculate uh, confidence. These are after all estimates. So using our sample. So we need to calculate confidence interval for the population proportion. And we did that using the bootstrap procedure. And we can do a similar exercise to calculate the um, lifetime risk of breast cancer for those carrying a BRCA2 mutation. And these two figures were the endpoints, the, the deliverables of our work. So as a woman ages on the left-hand side, this the vertical axis shows the BRCA1 penetrance or lifetime risk of breast cancer in an Ashkenazi Jewish woman who carries a BRCA1 mutation as she ages. So you can see by the time she's age 70, um, her probability of breast cancer is around 46%. And these two dashed lines are the 95% confidence intervals that we obtained via the bootstrap. And the right-hand side figure shows the lifetime risk of breast cancer in different ages when a woman carries BRCA2 mutation, and this is an Ashkenazi Jewish woman. So in this sense, we used a design, case control design, focusing on Ashkenazi Jewish individuals to estimate the lifetime risk of breast cancer in mutation carriers. And this involved working with a retrospective and prospective probabilities in a suitable way and bringing data from uh, the SEER cancer, reg uh, cancer registry to estimate the baseline risk. So now I'll move on to the second uh, portion of the talk to give a quick um, summary about the computational investigation that is a sparse canonical correlation approach we used to examine breast cancer related genes, um, a large number of genes. This is work done with Dr. Deepta Vodatta, who is a junior researcher at the National Cancer Institute and Dr. Anando Sen, who is an experienced researcher from the University of Michigan, where he is also the Lee A. Green Research Professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Department of Biostatistics, and myself. So we published this very recently in December of last year. Um, Satish, how much time do I have? Uh, Madam, uh, another 10 minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. So in this study, we are trying to under identify what genomic characteristics might be associated with breast cancer outcomes. And breast cancer exhibits numerous genomic characteristics and more and more are uh, continued to be discovered. So one of the very important genomic characteristics that we wanted to focus on are somatic characteristics. That these are not characteristics we receive from our parents, but once a woman has breast cancer, the cancer itself will develop certain characteristics. And one such number, uh, one such um, characteristic occurs in the DNA, known as copy number aberrations. So or uh, structural somatic changes. So these are copy number gains or copy number losses. Our chromosomes come in pairs, so sometimes a, a small piece of the chromosome can be lost. So that's a copy number loss. Or the chromosome is just perfect, so it's okay. Or as it can develop some additional copies, so those are copy number gains. And these copy number losses and copy number gains can regulate how breast cancer develops and grows. And one of the um, hypotheses is that these copy number changes occurring at the DNA level affect what is happening to the genes at the RNA level. That is, they may impact gene expressions. So DNA level affects the RNA level, which can affect the outcome, as shown in this slide. So our hypothesis is that CNAs, that is, that occur at the DNA level, impact gene expressions at the RNA level, which impacts outcome. So our goal is to find those gene expressions affecting the outcome, but those must be gene expressions that are also impacted by the copy number aberrations. In other words, we want to identify copy number aberration regulated gene expressions that in turn impact breast cancer outcomes. So for copy number aberrations, we have uh, data of the form negative one means there is a copy number loss. F zero means there is a copy number gain, that is, there are two. So you think of number minus two. So 
and negative one is copy number loss zero is copy number gain one two and so on are additional copy numbers like the copy number gains um, zero is no aberration and the gene expressions are recorded as some continuous value measuring the amount of rna of a particular gene available and we, our outcome there are numerous breast cancer outcomes um, stage out um, uh, survival and so on we focused on a binary outcome that is whether a breast cancer is positive or negative for the estrogen receptor and we use data from the metabric study these data are available publicly from the cbio portal and this is a large tumor bank of uk and canada and consists of non hispanic white women and it is a large cohort and not a case control study so these are all primary breast cancer tissues and we have data from 1904 women so in each woman there are uh, 20 more than 22000 copy number aberrations measured across the dna and more than 24000 gene expressions measured across the rna so we want to first identify which um, gene expressions are regulated by copy number aberrations in order to do that we imp uh, uh, applied a sparse canonical correlation analysis and the summary of this analysis is as follows suppose we take a look at g as the matrix of copy number aberrations it's a large matrix each row is a woman a patient 1904 rows and each column is a copy number aberration in a particular location on the dna there are 20 more than 22000 locations measured so it's a matrix with 1904 rows and more than 22000 columns and e is a normalized gene expression matrix once again 1904 rows and more than 24000 columns measuring rna level expression so we want to now calculate a, a linear combination of the g uh, that is highly correlated with a linear combination of e and we want to uh, identify a sparse uh, combination because we have more than 22000 cnas and more than 24000 uh, rna level data so we can impose some uh, sparsity and calculate the linear combination so we know how to do the linear combination uh, in a canonical correlation analysis and how to impose sparsity on that is um, uh, published by witten and colleagues and so we applied this in order to extract our first linear combination of our sparse canonical correlation but there can be many more linear combinations how do we identify them we can apply hotelling's deflation so once you extract the first linear combination we can take this correlation matrix g transpose e and take out the first linear combination in some way and then apply the sparse canonical correlation to the leftover matrix and we can continue to do this until we get many different uh, orthogonal um, uh, many different linear combinations of uh, g that are highly correlated with linear combinations of e so why do we do this it provides useful interpretations it provides orthogonal uh, linear combinations but how many linear combination do we want we can determine the uh, number of linear combinations by maximizing the iterative ratio of the sparse canonical correlations so i have a couple of slides of results so this is a slide that shows the at the dna level what did we find so we have uh, 22 pairs of chromosome and sex chromosome so these 22 chromosomes are shown here visually these are all women so we only have x chromosome we do not have the y chromosome because women do not have the y chromosome right the female sex does not have the y chromosome so uh, this each each line is a chromosome and we show some colors here that means in chromosome 1 a linear combination of cnas from this region and a linear combination of cnas from this region were found to be highly correlated with uh, certain gene expressions and if we look at a uh, chromosome 5 a large chunk here a linear combination of values from this large chunk is co correlated with some rna level expression and so on and this is a table of how to think of those slides so there are 14 combinations or uh, linear combinations that we identified the first linear combination was in chromosome 5 the big chunk it consists of 139 dna locations 
and these were co correlated with 70 RNA level locations. Of these 70, 24 were on different chromosomes and the remaining 46 were on the same chromosome 5. Of those 46, 18 were distal, that is uh, um, far away from, let think of it as far away from this particular region of that chunk and the remaining were closer to that chunk in some sense. So in this sense, we identified 14 distinct linear combinations of DNA. Each of these linear combinations were uh, highly correlated with certain linear combinations at the RNA level consisting of so many genes. And once we identify these genes here, we want to relate these to the uh, outcome. So we fit a logistic regression model relating the estrogen receptor uh, positive negative status to these uh, th the genes that we identified here, a collection of genes. And then we, uh, since due to multiple uh, comparisons, we have to control the, the p-values for false discovery, uh, for, for multiple comparisons by calculating the false discovery rate. So we found um, uh, 221 genes out of these many RNAs that were identified to be significantly associated with the logistic, uh, with, with the estrogen receptor status. And if we controlled it at 0.05 a false discovery rate based on the collection of gene expressions. But if we take into account that we have actually started with 24,000 genes uh, and make a, a multiplicity correction across all the 24,000 genes, then 58 genes were significantly associated with the um, outcome, which is estrogen receptor status. And the genes that we identified include very important genes that are previously known, such as P53, MIC, PIC3CA, and so on. And just to conclude, uh, just a small visual. So here is, uh, are, I'm showing two components. And this is um, a set of gene expressions that were associated with chromosome 5 that are regulated by chromosome 5. And in chromosome 5, in a particular location, we may have some people with um, copy number loss, some people with no aberration perfect, some people with a copy number gain and uh, some people have one copy number gain and some people may have two or more, but in this case, none. So what do the estrogen receptor negative gene, uh, negative people, what does their gene expression look like? So um, as the copy number um, value increases, the uh, median uh, expression value also increases for this particular gene, S cubed tube. And it's much higher for the estrogen um, receptor positive patients. So uh, S cube 2 was significantly different in uh, estrogen receptor negative versus estrogen receptor positive, the average S cube 2. So that was what one of the uh, significantly associated genes. And another gene, DNAL1, um, is uh, the expression of this gene is regulated by um, CNA in, in uh, a in, a, in chromosome 17, which we identified as component 4. And once again, the average expression of this gene is different in the, the patients who are estrogen receptor negative and those with estrogen receptor positive. So these are the kinds of uh, comparisons that we are able to identify by making these uh, making this large sparse correlation, canonical correlation, to select out gene expressions that are correlated strongly with the DNA level, and then focusing on just these uh, RNA level information in relation to the outcome. So these works serve as a key inspiration for some ongoing studies of breast cancer in South Asian women in the United States. South Asia consists of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh is here, Nepal is here, Bhutan is somewhere there, and also the Maldives somewhere here. And uh, uh, these are all women uh, from the South Asian region living in the United States. And we have established a study called Cancer Analytics and South Asian Health Cancer BC Study. And we know uh, from cancer registry data is that as a woman ages, her risk for breast cancer increases. But the rate at which in it increases changes around the menopause time. The red line shows uh, the rate at which breast cancer incidence increases for 
non-Hispanic white women. And in black, we see that for South Asian women living in the United States, everybody's cancer risk goes up and changes a bit around the menopausal age. And that is to be expected because breast cancer is a hormonal cancer. And But the question is, what do we know about risk factors associated with breast cancer? Um, like postmenopausal estrogen, obesity-related factors, genetic predisposition to breast cancer, and so on. So when we focus on uh, different risk factors for cancer, we see that there is very limited data available on Asian women in the uh, cancer epidemiology descriptive cohort database. There may be other data available elsewhere, but I looked at how much data do we have. So if we look at white women, there are more than 50 data on more than 51,000 women. Whereas if I look at Asian women, Asian means South Asian, East Asian, and so on. So there are only 296 women in total at the time I looked at this database, which was early on this year. So there is limited data available on breast cancer related health. When we don't have data, it's very hard to study the risk factors for these women. And this is what motivated our cancer BC study. So I'll quickly wrap up by saying this is a study in collaboration between the School of Public Health where I'm located and also the Cancer Institute of New Jersey where also I have an appointment. And we work closely with the New Jersey State Cancer Registry and the New Jersey Department of Health. The study has three aims. One aim, the first aim is the recruitment aim, how we collaborate with the New Jersey State Cancer Registry to recruit women. And we, our goal is a pilot goal to see can we recruit at least 100 women? And this is going on. And the second and third aim are data collection aims. The second aim is to collect saliva samples for conducting future genetic studies. And we want to know, do, can we collect data from at least 65 women? And the third aim is also a data collection aim. We have to collect data about the health of these women. What is her age? What is her family history? What is her age at menarche? What is the age at which she had a first child and so on. So these efforts are ongoing. And once again, I cannot do it myself. It is with a huge set of collaborators, statisticians, epidemiologists, oncologists, and so on. Several students are also involved. And we are also working closely with the local radio station that caters to the South Asian population to disseminate the study. And there is also a companion study that is helping uh, on Black and Hispanic women that is helping us uh, by sharing their experiences on how to collect data. So in summary and in giving a big thank you to you, I want to uh, conclude by saying that uh, I showed you two studies that I worked on uh, among the many studies that I worked on. Uh, these studies use different study designs and different study designs provide unique opportunities to address different uh, questions about health. And we also use simple methods in the first study in the lifetime risk study. It was just calculating probabilities by uh, using Bayes theorem or uh, some simple concepts. And in the second study, we took methods developed by Witten and colleagues and built on that. So not all methods are developed by us and we can also repurpose methods that are available. And I want to big, give a big gratitude to all my collaborators, people who have mentored me over the years and also the students and also data repositories that make these kind of studies possible. And these are all possible because the ultimate champions are the study participants who allow us to use their data. But today's champions are you all uh, for uh, uh, staying and uh, uh, joining this talk. So I want to say a very big thank you to you. And in conclusion, I want to also say, uh, give my uh, gratitude to Dr. Satish and also pay my respects to Dr. Uni Shivaraman Nair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, any any questions? We will take in one or two questions, if any. Um, yes. If I may, um, I enjoyed your talk very much, Dr. Sadagopan. Uh, I wonder if you consider transfer learning as a tool to try and borrow strength from the lots of Anglos and apply it to the uh, very small number of Southeast Asian women. Thank you, Dr. Vance. Wonderful. Actually, I have a meeting at 10 o'clock with a student who is in 20 minutes with a student 
who is working on transfer learning and uh, uh, initially learning about the data. So we are working with the National Health Interview Survey uh, to learn because which which is a large database in the United States over multiple years. And uh, interestingly, also in the National Health Interview Survey, there is um, data from over the years, data from 160 or 170 South Asians, uh, whereas about 80,000 or so or 40,000 or so or something, like some large number of non-Hispanic white women. So the student is interested in seeing how to a leverage uh, data from the National Health Interview Survey to uh, start working on some transfer learning. So thank you very much. I am really looking forward to the, that uh, results, uh, how it goes, and hope to share with you and others in the future. You are so far ahead of things. I'm so impressed. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm with everybody on this. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Jair for your insightful talk, especially for your introduction about Professor U.S. Nair. I am really on behalf of the organizer of this conference. We uh, we are thankful to you for accepting our invitation and giving this insightful talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Over to you, Professor Sapish. Uh, thank you, Professor Jaya, for your wonderful talk. <laughs> and. Uh, also, uh, we extend our thanks to Professor uh, Deepesh Bhatti for chairing this session. Thank you, all. Thank you, both of you. <laughs> now, let us move to the next session because it is the time, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, Professor Vijay Naya and the chair, Professor, the, Professor Sangar and Sir, is also there to chair. Uh, uh, Bhagi Rashmi, please introduce the chair and uh, support him for further proceedings of the session. Please. Yes, sir. Hello everyone, we are moving on to the 19th technical session of WSTA 2023, which is a special session in honor of Professor D. Basu that shall be chaired by Professor P.G. Shankaran. Professor P.G. Shankaran is the 13th Pro Vice Chancellor of the Cochin University of Science and Technology. He had served as the head to the Department of Statistics, PUSAC, and as Director of Center for Population Studies. He received Boys Cast Fellowship of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India in 2000 and wrote Young Researcher Award of International Indian Statistical Association in 2010. He is the recipient of Distinguished Statistician Award of Indian Society for Probability and Statistics 2020. Dr. Shangaran has published more than 175 research papers, of which 135 are in international journals. His areas of interest include survival analysis, distribution theory, reliability theory, and quantile functions. An excellent academician with over two decades of experience in teaching and research, we feel privileged to have such an eminent person with us chairing the session today. It's with great pleasure and honor that I invite you, sir, to chair the session. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sadish and Dr. Fagilishmi. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vijay Nair, who is a great academician. Uh, and uh, as you know, he was associated with um, the different areas of statistics. Uh, yeah, Vijay Nair was the president of International Statistical Institute uh, during the period 2013 to 15. He, he, he was the Donald A. Darling Professor of Statistics and Professor of Industrial and Operations Engineering at the University of Michigan, USA. He has been actively involved in big data initiative and effort to launch an institute called Institute of uh, Data Science at the University of Michigan. He is a fellow of various professional societies and he served as editor in various journals, reported journals. Um, what I found him, he is always transforming his career, um, starting with economics, then moved to statistics and he worked in industrial statistics during early days. Then he moved to uh, big data analytics and now he moved to computer science, machine learning and related areas. I'm sure that his um, talk will be very much beneficial in the current scenario where the data science and analytics the, is playing a uh, pivotal role in the area of uh, statistics and related areas. Um, He's a very good friend of mine and a uh, good friend of department. I uh, cordially invite Professor Vijay Nair to begin the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vijay Nair. 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 Thank you, Professor
ഡോക്ടർ വിജയ് നായർ കൈൻഡ് കൈൻഡ് അൺമ്യൂട്ട് പ്രൊഫസർ കൈൻഡ് ഐ ഐ ഐ വിൽ ഡു ദാറ്റ് പ്രൊഫസർ വിജയ് നായർ പ്ലീസ് അൺമ്യൂട്ട് യുവർ മൈക്ക് യെസ് സോ താങ്ക് യു കാൻ യു ഹിയർ മീ Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes. 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 Hey, Shankar, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a very busy guy, very important guy at uh, Cochin. Uh, my I sense, no, my sense. Sense. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on your uh, recent appointment. And uh, I think uh, it's also uh, very much a pleasure to be here. I haven't interacted with the University of Kerala, you know, um, uh, for, you know, but I have had a close association with Cochin. I was there in March teaching a workshop and I uh, was able to actually uh, get a ride in Shankaran's car which says pro vice chancellor now you come as say ch- uh, vice chancellor right <laughs> all right let me uh, let me share my screen all right can you uh, that's a wrong one Sorry, I don't know what happened. My my laptop is giving me trouble. So give me one second, please. Um Okay, can you see my screen? No, no, no. Not yet, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, share. All right. Too many buttons to push. And actually Yeah. Mm-hmm. You share your entire screen. I don't know why it's not clicking, but let me just try it again. In case your of any difficulty. What? What's that? In case of any difficulty, you can just share it to me and we shall share from right. here. No, let, let me try to let me try yeah. to do this. Uh, again, one yes. okay. Um What is going on here? Uh Sorry guys, yeah, bear with me. All right, I'm back here, right? So, come on. Don't don't install updates. Uh where is the pin for sharing? There is something at the bottom for share. At the bottom there is a upward arrow. Right. Uh, near to the hand raise button, there's a near to there right. a small box a put arrow. Right, right. But the, the share button doesn't click. So that uh, the under screen select and uh, a bi- a pop up menu comes so th- and uh, click on the middle portion so that share button will be active middle portion there's a black this is right okay it. hold on a second yeah. i got multiple things going on this oh this one okay now you can share right i can go to the yeah oh crap I think uh, it says you might not have sh- screen recording permission on your computer. Sorry, Satish. I have to email you my my file. Uh sorry folks. No, no problem. Sir. Please uh, email to me. So. Okay so this I just send it to you. Jyotish? Yeah yeah bro sir uh, I shall check it and uh, I shall now uh, share it from here. Okay. I shall. All right. Okay. okay let me uh, let me start uh, uh, yeah. saying a little bit what I'm going to be talking well first of all it's it's an honor to uh present in the uh, in the session that is uh, dedicated to Professor Basu. Professor Basu is one of my heroes. Uh I think there are very many uh Indian statisticians uh who are even uh you know uh, most even more senior to me that is hard to believe given the amount of white hair I have. 
But you know, there are lots and lots of established uh, statisticians uh, uh, in, in the Indian community. And uh, as you, among those, right, uh, Professor Basu stands out uh, even in this very distinguished community uh, because of, uh, you know, he's, he's just a uh, very incisive approach. Oh, there you go. All right, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Satish. All right, uh, everybody, uh, you can go to full screen if you want. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You just give right. the direction so that we can move. Step. All right, I will. Let no, so. it's okay. Okay, can you go to the next page, uh, Satish? Next page, yep. Yeah. Okay, here is a little bit of Professor Basu's background that I uh, found on the uh, from the uh, web. Uh, I have never had the uh, fortune to meet him, but I've always admired him for his deep insight. And, uh, you know, as as you know, he was uh, born in uh, Dhaka, what is Bangladesh now, and got his early degree in math from the University of Dhaka. And uh, then he came to ISI at some point, and then he spent uh, a good part of his career in the Indian Statistical Institute, and the second part at Florida State uh, University. Very early in his career, he was in, uh, he actually met Abraham Wald when he visited India. Uh, and then he also made a trip to Berkeley to meet uh, other luminaries like Naaman and, 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 and of course, uh, Fisher and others. And he read all of these uh, works and, uh, and apparently, uh, from what I understand, a lot of the inconsistencies in likelihood and Fisherian theory convinced him that, you know, and also reading early work of uh, uh, Wall convinced him that uh, Bayesian approach is the right way to do statistics. And uh, he has made, uh, you know, pioneering contributions uh, to foundations of statistics. Again, uh, you know, he, he wasn't the one who published a whole lot, but uh, his impact on the field is way, way more than his publications. Right? So the one thing that uh, some of you would know about is Basu's theorem, uh, which is taught and now is a part and parcel of what we learn in uh, graduate level statistics courses. Uh, and as I said, he eventually be, uh, became a Bayesian and he influenced a, a lot of people. For example, the, uh, Richard Barlow, uh, who was at Berkeley. Berkeley, by the way, was a very anti-Bayesian place. Uh, only only Bay, uh, person who was very close to Bay, uh, Bayesian philosophy was David Blackwell. And he, uh, you know, so Dick Barlow visited and spent some time in uh, Florida State. And when he came back, he became an ardent Bayesian because of uh, Basu's influence. Many others, right? Even Jim Berger, for example, uh, says that Basu's, uh, some of the Basu's work was very influential in him becoming a Bayesian. So he had a huge influence on, on uh, many leading researchers. Just his way of thinking, the way, way of arguing through philosophical issues and philosophical inconsistencies, right? The one thing that I particularly liked was his counterexamples uh, showing inconsistencies and his paradoxes. Uh, the one that I have actually used is the one about the um, Horowitz Thompson estimator and how that leads to ridiculous estimators. And his uh, big, ex his famous example about the suckers with elephants and the big elephant uh, jumbo. That is really, and I've used that in my presentation. This is very, very convincing counter, uh, example about what can go wrong with uh, traditional inference. And at the bottom, I've indicated uh, a volume edited by uh, Professor Ghosh uh, in honor of uh, Professor Basu. So next uh, page, uh, Satish. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is slightly different from the talk I sent to the organizers. And uh, I'm going to be talking about some work that uh, our team here uh, is doing. And just to uh, give a little bit more details, I uh, retired from University of Michigan about seven years ago and moved to North Carolina, uh, close, to be closer to my grandchildren mostly. And now I work at a bank called Wells Fargo. And uh, we have been spending quite a bit of time understanding uh, the, uh, the methodologies, 
in machine learning and uh, assessing how we can use them and, uh, and trying to adopt it when uh, it, they make sense. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a, an approach to developing interpretable machine learning algorithms. And as you will see later, this is nothing really new here. Uh, it's really adapting using the machine learning architecture to fit what uh, we've a statistician called functional ANOVA models. Next page, please. Okay. Let me just uh, set, uh, you know, set, to set the uh, you know, framework, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. A lot of people out there uh, use machine learning and artificial intelligence, the two terms interchangeably. But uh, for us, right, as we know, machine learning is just one part of artificial intelligence. In fact, it is just a, one of the technologies, methodologies, if you will, uh, that is used to uh, accomplish the goals of artificial intelligence, right? The term uh, machine learning, according to Wiki, it was uh, coined by someone called Arthur Samuel, who was at IBM at that time, and he had moved around. And here is a working definition. Uh, study and construction of algorithms can look, uh, learn from data, identify features, recognize patterns, and make, make predictions, right? And there is another phrase to this that I took out, which is, and takes actions. Uh, taking action is uh, really a, a part of uh, reinforcement learning, but it's really not a part of a lot of the supervised learning that we do. And as if you see this definition, then for us, who've been statisticians for a long time, says, hey, that's just statistics, right? But the different uh, difference here is that this use of algorithms, right? So it's more of an algorithmic approach, as you will see in my presentation. Artificial intelligence, on the on the other hand, is much broader. It's really associated with the particular uh, systems that you're trying to develop. For example, autonomous driving, driving without a human, right? And if you think about uh, autonomous driving, there are many, many, many pieces to that. Right, collecting data uh, about all kinds of things that a human being, uh, you know, be, uh, uh, sees when they are driving, and all the decisions they have to make. Right, and all, in, you know, so you have to take those decisions, uh, data, and analyze them, and do pattern recognition. Of course, is a big part of it, but a big part of that is what do you do uh, with those pattern recognitions, right? You've got to make decisions at uh, different points in time. So there's a lot of optimization involved, right? A lot of reinforcement learning is involved. So it's much, much more than just machine learning, right? So uh, AI is now, of course, a big buzzword uh, because we, uh, you know, the chatbot, uh, chat GPT and generative AI is making a big wave right now, right? So everybody's very excited about that. Uh, but of course, the said AI is bigger than that. And not yet, go back, please, uh, Satish. So uh, AI uh, has a long history. I guess people have for a, for a long time been interested in whether there are other things besides humans or intelligence. And uh, and then uh, it, AI has gone through what people call winters, AI winters. And there have been periods when people promised a lot and then uh, the computational technology uh, didn't keep up with it. So it went down, came up, went down. Right now it has come back in a big way because of these so-called deep learning neural networks. And uh, if you look at uh, things like ChatGPT, these are very complicated uh, networks called transformers. And uh, they have what people call trillion parameters and you don't really know what, what is a model of trillion parameters, right? So is it really a model, right? And there are a whole bunch of questions about is it really a model? Is it really a what people call a stochastic parrot, which is really remembering and regurgitating? And there are lots of challenges about whether it is hallucinating is a term that people use in the area, right? There are a lot of interesting challenges. Uh, chat GPT, but it also uh, offers a lot of promise. And we at the Wells Fargo, the bank where I am, we are looking at it uh, a lot, right? So can you go to the next page, please? So this. Okay, there are many different machine learning tasks, right? So I've listed all of them here. I'm focusing, uh, which is a mo well, the most common one for a lot in a lot of situations is what's called supervised learning. For statisticians, that is just regression and classification. 
So these are, these are situations where we have Ys and Xs, right? Ys are called labels and Xs, and we have some training data, and we'll use the training data to uh, learn the, uh, uh, so, uh, the algorithm, the predictor, you know, Y to uh, X to Y, which we call it F hat. And then when a new observation comes in, we'll apply the F hat to make a prediction, right? And that's sort of the very simple description of supervised learning. And sometimes it's classification uh, or binary regression, Y is uh, uh, zero, one, and it's a multi-class classification with a lot of applications of that type. But that's really what I'm gonna be focusing on today. Next, please. Okay, so uh, I, I like to use this slide in my presentations. It's, it's really uh, from Leo Bryman, who was one of the uh, a big, big contributors in machine learning and a big thinker. Even he was a statistician, he was a probabilist actually in his early days from Berkeley. He got his PhD from LOF, and then he moved on to become a consultant, then he became a statistician, and then a machine learning guy. Talk about people transforming themselves, right? So he wrote this paper in 2001, Statistical Modeling in the Two Cultures, came up in Statistical Science. If you haven't re read this paper, I would strongly recommend that you do. He, he sort of wrote a what, what one would call a provocative paper, and he did it purposely, is my understanding. So he uh, talked about the two kinds of modeling that uh, people uh, would do, even at that time, and he tried to contrast the statistical paradigm versus the machine learning paradigm. So in traditional statistics that most of us have learned, people of my vintage and even younger, uh, the goal is to, you know, we, we say there is some uh, population of interest that could be a concrete population, like in surveys, or it could be a hypothetical population, right? Like what is, uh, what is going to happen with climate change, right? And we draw a sample. We have a sample at hand. We, I wouldn't say we draw. We, we have a sample at hand, right, that is supposedly representative of the population. Of course, it is not the case often, right? So because we have to do forecast about what happens in the future. Our goal is to use this sample to uh, draw conclusions about the population, right? So, so we want to understand the, uh, the, the, the uh, use the sample to make inference. That's what we call inference, right? So this is the uh, paradigm under which we have operated, you know, since uh, Calpius, since time, right? And uh, now, if you look at what machine learning is doing, right? So, so what has happened to give you at least my perspective, a lot of computer scientists uh, and database uh, uh, managers were having a lot of data because they were collecting data. And they said, look, I have all of this data. What can I do with it? And of course, all their approach is all algorithms. So they said, let me develop some algorithms to make sense of this data. So things like data mining came about, which is really uh, exploratory data analysis in steroids. And then they also talked about making predictions. Right? So uh, it was an algorithmic approach to, uh, to making prediction, right? And uh, they, you have your set of data, and then you hold out a piece of that data. Uh, right? uh, typically, they take a random sample. And then you train uh, your algorithm on the uh, data that was not held out. And you uh, then you assess performance on the held out data set because on the original uh, training data set, it will overfit. So you want to assess performance on the held out data set. And the typical uh, way they operate is they look at two or three or four different algorithms and they say look my algorithm does really well and beats what this you know what is out there right so it's a totally algorithmic approach and part of it is the automation of model building by automation i mean the feature you know variable importance all the variable uh, selection that we used to do all the feature engineering of figuring out how to transform the data uh, all of that uh, need, does not need, a, a, you don't have to do that up front. The model will do feature engineering. I called it automation, but it's really semi-automation. There are still some parameters you have to tune. And then you do feature engineering, uh, and then you, you can assess uh, variable importance after the fact, right? After you fitted the model. Uh, 
So the focus is on prediction, right? For example, uh, the, you, some of you may remember the famous Netflix challenge where they wanted you, Netflix uh, wanted people to come up with the best predictive algorithm to decide how people, sh you know, what kind of a recommendation they should make to people who watch movies, right? Uh, and uh, there is no focus on in, uh, inference, no not, no no randomized uh, randomness, no data, not uh, no uh, uh, probability, anything like that. Although that is uh, to be uh, to be uh, frank, there is changing as well. There is a sort of probabilistic machine learning that goes on as in, uh, right now. So one of the things that has happened uh, after machine learning took a big uh, uh, splash is that. You know, in some industries, particularly regulated industries and safety critical applications, you, it's not just a prediction problem. You have to be able to explain the results, right, and understand the results, right? I mean, clearly, if you are flying a plane, right, if there is a crash, God forbid, you want to be, uh, you want to know what happened, right? Same thing with autonomous driving, same thing with, you know, a very uh, uh, surgeries, for example, right? In banking, we have regulators and regulators want us to explain our models to them. We have stakeholders, our customers, we got to explain if we reject a loan application, somebody applies to us to a, for an, a, a credit and we reject it, we have to explain why we rejected that loan. So to do all that, you need to understand model interpretability. So that's really what I am going to, uh, I'm talking about, uh, going to be talking about today, right? Next, uh, Satish. Okay, so I'm going to go through very quickly. I'm just going to so basically assume that more, many of you know about different machine learning algorithms. What I'm showing a picture here are the, uh, uh, on this slide is uh, what's called ensemble algorithms. Uh, two examples are random forest, right, is one, and boosting, which is uh, another one. Uh, random forest is due to Bryman. Boosting uh, actually is uh, the origins of boosting came from Shapiro, Shapir, who is uh, uh, was at uh, Bell Labs uh, and my colleague at the Bell Labs at the time, not my colleague, he was in computer science. And then, of course, Jerry Friedman and others have made fundamental contributions and it's called gradient boosting. So what you do, see here is on the left uh, figure, you see how we traditionally do, uh, do modeling. We have a set of data. We uh, take the data set, we train an algorithm, right? Uh, we, what we call a develop an algorithm. Now everything is training and learning. So we uh, develop an algorithm, you know, that's what I call a fitted model. And of course we do all kinds of uh, inference or, or assessment associated with that. And then you have a new observation coming in, we apply F hat and we get a new predictor Y hat, right? Now uh, in ensemble algorithms, as the name suggests, you combine multiple algorithms, right? So you have an original data set and you split it, uh, a training data set, and you split it into multiple data sets, and you train uh, algorithms on each one of them. They're called, uh, typically computer scientists call them weak learners, meaning you don't have to fit a very complicated model. Typically, you, uh, you fit uh, trees, and then uh, somehow you combine all of those algorithms, and then you get a new a predictor age, and uh, that it, uh, does well. Surprisingly, it does well than you know, just uh, many of the traditional algorithms that we have. And then if you have a new X star, you just uh, apply H to, uh, to get a predictor. Now, as you can see, you're combining many different algorithms and the combination is often uh, not simple. And so H is, can be very complex and it's not interpretable. All you have is a, in the, you know, in model uh, lingo, you have an object, model object, you apply X and you get X star to that and you get Y star, you can't really write down the expression. What is the expression? Analytical expression for H. Next slide. So uh, another class of algorithms that have become very popular, and I'm only showing you the simple vanilla version, which is called feed forward neural network. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this since I'm a little bit behind, and uh, the idea here is, you know, the early work was to mimic how our brains work, it's neuronal networks. And uh, so that's really uh, how it, it started. 
and uh, the and there are some components called uh, internal hidden layer you know input layer which is what your uh, your access are and then output layer is your y hats and then internal there are some hidden layers called uh, uh, there are many of them and that is part of the tuning parameter and then you have uh, within each layer you have what's called neurons and uh, and and so the input layer, uh, you know, the data from the input layer, the access, uh, go to the hidden layer. One takes a linear combination of those, then applies what's called an activation function, and then the output of an activation function is sent to the next layer. Right, and this is a simple feedforward neural network. Every they only go in one direction, right, and every neuron is connected to every other neuron in the next layer, right? And then there are many more complicated versions of these now. And then, of course, people, this whole uh, new ideas called transformers are just hugely complex, which um, I'm not uh, uh, going to be able to get into. Next one. Okay. All right, now I'm going to start really my my talk, and I know I'm already 30 minutes into that, right? So I'm going to have to go very fast. So uh, machine learning, right? As I said, in the early uh, early direction, of machine learning is you know you try you have a data set, and uh, you know and you hope that the data set is in, uh, representative of whatever your application is going to be in the future. And uh, the, the focus was all on the algorithms, right? So you try to come up with algorithms that extracted as much predictive performance as possible. This led to increasingly complex algorithms, right? And uh, there was no interest nor emphasis on interpretation. And uh, you know there were lots of variables in the model, relations were complex. There were, can be very high order interactions. And of course, uh, you know, the, there was no effort to do careful uh, screening for collinearity and all that. So a lot of the variables were very highly correlated, right? And the uh, people relied on what is called post hoc tools, right? After the, you fit in the model, you look at them uh, to see uh, things like what, which one of the variables are important. What is the input-output relationship, right? And this input-output relationships, uh, by necessity, they have to be low-dimensional summaries, right? Because we just don't have the ability to visualize in very high dimensions, right? There's a lot of work, even though there are some good tools these days, but it's still very hard to do that. So low-dimensional summaries in the presence of very, if there is high-dimensional interaction or relationships, you, you can't capture the full picture, right? So uh, there are a lot of different uh, efforts, and I'm talking about a particular view that is emerging, and that is you don't have to look at improvements, predictive uh, performances that are tiny. You don't, you know, if you are familiar with Kaggle competitions, you know that people look for improvements in, uh, let's say, AUC uh, or a decrease in mean squared error to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh decimal places, right? From our point of view, that's really not that important, right? So the idea is, you know, why don't we not worry about small improvements and focus more on interpretation so that we can trade it off a little bit, right? And so as part of this, uh, we are rediscovering what is uh, lower order functional models, right? And I'll show in the next slide that these are not new. And what we are finding through just experience is that you know you might lose you know one two percent or even three percent of our predictive performance, but you can explain the models better. They're directly interpretable. Right. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, you, what you see in blue is a representation of a function in terms of its decompositions, right? So you have an overall mean, and the next uh, G, J of X is just the main effects, right? What we are first order models. But then you have the second order models, which depend only on X, J, and X, K, and third order models, and so on, right? You can write these things down like that, right? And of course, to be interpretable, you need to make sure that these things are orthogonal. Otherwise, you know, they'll be cross-talk, and, you know, and they are not unique, right? 
So um, the, uh, the direction that we and some others are following is you focus on uh, functional main effects and second order interactions only, okay? You don't worry about high order interactions. Not to say you don't worry about it, you make a an assumption that in many, you know, high order interactions are going to be not that common. And even if they are there, they may not be that uh, big, right? Now these, but in, and we focus on low order interactions, right? And we are now talking about second order interactions and we are now working on methods for third order interactions and fourth order interactions, but not beyond that, it becomes computationally prohibitive. Now, uh, those of you, you know, who uh, have been around for a while will know that this is not, doesn't come as surprising to you, right? And this is really an attempt by the machine learning community to rediscover what statisticians have known for a long time. Chuck Stone, for example, has written about these, uh, low, you know, uh, functional NOVA models. Grace Waba, uh, who led the uh, Wisconsin Madison's uh, School of Smoothing Splines, right, have been talking about this. And there is even a text by her student, Chang Gu, who is now at Purdue on smoothing splines, and all that, right? So what is new here? What's new here is uh, yeah, the fact that you, uh, you can use the machine learning architecture boosting on neural networks and the associated uh, optimization algorithms to develop fast algorithm, right? Because when you have 50 variables, 60 variables, right? You got to need, you have to, you, uh, you need very fast algorithms, right? And of course, you also need to be able to screen uh, all of the possible interactions, right? When you have 50, 50, time, uh, uh, 50 variables, right? You, the number of possible interactions is huge already, right? Next, please. Okay, so again, we are going to be focusing on uh, two, sec two, fact two order interaction models. And we're going to, the idea is to fit the model, decompose it into main effects and interactions. And to make them unique, you want to make, keep them, uh, you want to, uh, they have to be orthogonal, right? So what is the advantage of this? As you see, uh, what I've listed under interpretability, the model is additive, right? It's additive, right? It's, it's, it's easy. To, to, so it's easy to interpret. And uh, it's I put near orthogonality. I don't want to talk about the near part of it. It's uh, you make the main effects and interaction orthogonal, so it's easy. And and uh, and uh, and then you can we can visualize them. We can develop very easy diagnostics, see which ones are important, which ones are not, and all of that stuff, right? So, so you might ask why functional ANOVA? Why not some, you know, this is really taking a function and projecting them into some basis, right? Some basis functions, but oh, you can do it in many ways, right? Uh, the reason we're looking at FANAVA, at least that we, in our, my team, we've been thinking about it is because a lot of people uh, are used to the notions of main effects and second order interactions, right? In the, in the parametric sense. So this is a natural way to, for them to think about it, except now they are functional. So they're non-parametric, but they are non-parametric in a limited sense, right? You're not going after the very high order interactions, right? But still they, they are able to capture the uh, interactions and main effects in a, in a flexible way, right? Now, not, you know, there is no, of course there is no free lunch. So there are a bunch of issues that I should point out that I have listed at the bottom there. And uh, so, you know, the more, the, Challenge is that you know you, the, any any kind of uh, representation like this will not necessarily recover the true model, right? Suppose you have a model which is x1 times x2, right? And uh, you know, and let's suppose uh, you apply this, you're not going to recover the x1 x2 because you're going to pull out a main effect, right? In x1, you're going to pull out a main effect in x2. And then what is remaining is the residual part of the second order interaction. Now the problem is worse if X1 and X2 are correlated. Because think about X1 and X2 being highly correlated. X1, X2 will look like X1 squared, right? Or X2 squared, right? So when you fit a main effect, you're gonna pull out an X2, X1 squared term or and an X2 squared term, and whatever is remaining is what you can explain by interaction. 
And if the remaining part is small, then you will not detect an interaction, right? So in terms of interpretability, what you're doing is you're going to say, look, I'm going to take my uh, data and I'm going to fit a model. I don't really know what the underlying model is, right? Of course, you don't. Really, nobody knows. And I'm going to represent it on this space, and I'm going to use this particular thing to represent to interpret it, right? So when you you know when you have a lot of when you have high correlation, you, we know that the model is not identifiable, right? The prediction would be stable, but identifiability is not, right? So we have to live with the fact that whatever projections and inter, uh, interpretations we do, it's just one way of viewing the model, right? Okay, so next, please. Okay, so there are a number of uh, algorithms out there. The earliest one is something called explainable boosting machines by the people at Microsoft. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they have an algorithm, uh, to th there's two references here. By the way, I'll, uh, Satish can uh, forward uh, the slides to anybody who's interested, right? And then there was another paper using neural networks by Yang, Zhang, and Sujianto. Those are people in my team and Sujianto is my manager. And then we have another algorithm recently where we fit uh, trees, but trees with uh, linear, mo linear models, not piecewise constant trees, but linear model trees to the data, right? How much more time do I have, uh, Shankaran? Somebody can tell me how much more time I have? In 10 minutes you have, Professor. Eight, 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 eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. Eight, eight okay. minutes. All right, so uh, let's go to the next yeah. slide. Next slide. Okay, let me just tell you how the algorithm works, right? So it's a multi-stage algorithm. So you see that top uh, top um, uh, tree there, right? What, what you're trying to do in the top tree is just fit main effects. So what you do is you take each variable, in this case, I'm taking the jth variable xj, and I split only on XJs, right? So by splitting only on XJs, I'm modeling uh, the the main effects part, right? Because you know, if I have linear, a linear model, if it's linear, I got to do multiple, multiple. Uh, well, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm I'm fitting a piecewise linear model. So if I have non-linear model, that's x x squared, then I have to do multiple splits to approximate x squared by piecewise linear functions, right? <coughs> And within each uh, leaf node, within each node, I put a linear model, right? That's really what we're doing. Now, the bottom tree, what we do, we fit the many facts and then subtract it off and then take the residuals and then fit an interaction model to the many facts. Now, in the interaction model, we first look at a pair X, J, X, K. So we take xj, right, and that, uh, take a variable, and then we fit only, we split only on xk's, right? So we split, split only on xk's, then you're modeling the xj, xk interaction. We'll do the same thing, you know, we'll also do this with xk first because it's a greedy algorithm. So xj, xk uh, splits will not be the same as xk, xj splits, right? And then there's a lot of regularization that goes on, you know, and then there is iteration. And at the end, we have to purify the model, meaning we, even though we fitted the interactions on residuals, we are not going to necessarily get them to be orthogonal, so we purify them to get orthogonality. So, so next uh, slide. I'm going to skip the next few slides. Next slide. Uh, okay, let's, let's skip that. Okay, so you can do the same thing with neural networks, right? So instead of fitting uh, to all neural, all possible uh, 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 completely flexible neural network, you can trick the neural network, so to speak, also to fit main effects and interactions. And that's really what is going on on that picture there. It's, it looks complicated, but the first one fits uh, main effects and the second one take, you know, fits interactions on the residuals. Uh, next one. Next, I'm going to skip all this. Next, please, Satish. Right. So uh, no, let me. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so just just an example here. Uh, you can see that what we did here was we are comparing. This is a simulation simulated data. You can see that everything in black is a 
linear uh, main effects part, and the, the blue is interactions, second order, and the red is uh, third order interactions, okay? So interestingly enough, you can see that, you know, this has third order interactions, x1, x2, x3, and our model can only fit up to second order interactions. So we compared it with XGBoost, which is a general algorithm. It's a, XGBoost is a gradient boosting machine with a particular uh, implementation. And uh, our, our model, GAMI linear tree, when the data is correlated, it actually does, you know, as well, almost as well as, or you are slightly better than XGBoost, right? So uh, next one. Okay, so here uh, I'm just uh, showing you how the model fit looks like, right? So what we are fitting here is a hinge function, xj, uh, you can see xj times the indicator function, xj bigger than zero. So when, they have when xj is less than zero, that is zero, it's bigger than zero, it's xj, right? So it is that hockey stick or, or piecewise linear function, hinge function. And it shows you what the different fits are like. The green one is EBM, Extended Boosting Machine from the Microsoft. That's a piecewise constant uh, fit. And you can see, right, and because of boosting, right, it, it, it's, it's jumpy, whereas the other two are slightly better. Uh, Gaminet, uh, if you are not familiar with Gaminets, uh, I mean, uh, neural nets, if you take uh, uh, what is called a ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit Activation Function, and what it ends up doing is, is a, once partitioning your space into many regions, what we call oblique partitions, and within each partition, it's a uh, piecewise linear model. That's what a ReLU activation function does, so, right? So, so we did have two minutes. Oh, okay. All right. Go. Well, let's let's continue. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Let, I'm just going to uh, go to the last slide. Two minutes. No, I'm, I'm going to go to the last slide. Okay. Stop. And then, okay. All right. No, no. Yeah. All right, so you know I'm going to send, send the slides, and and the, you will uh, get take a you can take a look at it right for the details. I can also send you a paper uh, if you if you're interested. It's an archive. And uh, what have we talked about? Uh, you know the idea here is that there is now much much more interest in interpret interpretability. And uh, which means at least with tabular, you know, at least in tabular data, right? I mean, all these chat GPTs and, you know, these large language models, they are have tons of parameters. They're very, very complicated models. In our space, we want interpretability. So we're thinking about uh, using these functional ANOVA models to fit, in, uh, to achieve this interpretability. Let me stop here and, and ask, uh, let people ask questions, if there is any question. There are any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you um, Professor Vichinayar, for your nice talk. Uh, questions? Two, three questions? Time for two, three questions. Uh, no. Uh, no May, may I ask a question? Yes, yes. yes. <coughs> so as you said initially, statistics is directed towards inference and uh, machine learning is directed towards prediction. How does this interpretation matter with respect to machine learning? It's more meaningful with respect to statistical inference. But what is the concern of interpretation with respect to prediction. Can you just uh, give some meaning to that? Well, uh, I think I think one one difference, there are many differences, right? One difference is we are no longer fitting parametric models, right? That use for because we have lots more data, we can fit uh, semi-parametric or parametric uh, non-parametric models. They are flexible. So we are no longer talking about re uh, coefficients, right? Regression coefficients, trying to estimate confidence in the, you know, get confidence intervals. There is no hypothesis testing and so on, right? That's one difference. The, uh, so we are in that space of, you know, flexible modeling. So we, 
Now, we're still interested in how good the model is, right? How good is the model? We're interested in uncertainty. We're interested in bias, right? Because, you know, it turns out when you have a million observations, variance is not that big a deal. But bias can is still a big deal, right? So we're interested in bias, right? But for, for, uh, for what I'm talking about here is slightly different, right? Because what I'm saying here is, you know, we often have been fitting and relying on what is called a black box model. Black box means I have no idea. It's like, you know, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how my car operates. I, you know, it's just a black box to me, right? So can I do something, right? So the idea here is let's not take a, the black box and try to figure out what is under the hood. But can I enforce some kind of interpretability? And by interpretability here in my presentation, I'm talking about trying to fit, uh, you know, curves that I if first order and second order curves, and I can visualize them. I can even approximate them using splines, for example, right? So now I can actually have some, you know, some interpretability, right? But it is, there is no confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and all of the stuff that goes on in this space. Hope I answered that call, uh, question. Anybody else? Professor Jaya, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Nair, for a very insightful talk. So for conducting these uh, kind of studies uh, at Wells Fargo, so how does it work? Is, is Do you have internal Wells Fargo data or is this something that is used by Wells Fargo or is it applied to out external uh, oh, needs? That's, that's, okay. So, you know, uh, models are fundamental to every, pretty much everything a bank does, right? Because if I'm going to give out a loan to you, I need to know what kind of a customer you are. What is my risk? So we use what is called credit scoring models, you know, to see, to assess the probability of default and how much money we'll lose on each customer before we decide on a loan, whether it's a mortgage or home mortgage, auto loan, or even credit cards, right? And then we also are interested in fraud because, you know, we lose billions of dollars in fraud, right? Not credit card frauds, all kinds of frauds, right? So we use our models. Uh, so we have tons of data, right? We have, you know, a trillion accounts, a trillion. So this is our data. So, right. Of course, we combine this with external data just to see, you know, other, other if you can get them. But it's very hard to get, you know, data from Bank of America and so on unless you go to a consortium. So we have tons of data of our own, right? You know, we have accounts, transactions, 100 million transactions, right? Uh, so we have lots and lots of data of our own. We apply to our own models. You know, this is where we come from, right? And then we have also capital, we have trading, commodities, interest rates. You know, we do a lot of our own in this space, right? Of course, there are models out there, but we look at how their models, the public models uh, track with models on our day our models track with public models our data right so that's it's all it's all driven by our own needs thank you very much okay so okay. Uh, thank thank you. You. yeah yeah thank you very much um professor Vijina, for an insightful talk uh, so I, I have one comment. Uh, so this uh, machine learning and other thing, unlike uh, usual traditional statistics uh, tools, this will be data specific tools. More, so, so here, this is data specific tools. What do you mean by data specific tools? In the, because uh, depending on the data, your model will be completely different because um, non-linear nature, lot of non-linear nature and other things. For the maybe for the same situation like banking in same situation credit and other things uh, depending on their data. I think I think you know if, my, if I can under, interpret your question correctly, uh, the answer is yes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know if you when you're fitting a flexible model, right? By definition, it has to be fit the data, right? But but there is a risk of overfitting that a whole bunch of regularization people do and use. But it is right because you have to know what is the whether the the which variables are important, which of course we know in statistics. But you know the transformation of an of a variable is done internally in the in the algorithm, right? 
So, so the algorithms are you know, smart enough to know the internal uh, internal structure, but you know, but they are not they are not uh, uh, geniuses. Okay. There are all kinds of potential problems. Uh, uh, Professor Nair, Professor Nair. Right. I read that the so, paper Two Cultures by Bremen. Yeah. Uh -huh. He makes a statement in the paper: two percent of the statisticians use algorithmic modeling. And 98% uses the statistical modeling. And he makes a statement after Excuse that. Me? Excuse me? No, I understand. Yeah. I understood. He says, yeah. so I, if I remember correctly, Govindaswamy, uh, he, he makes yeah. some provocative statements, right? He says something like this, right? Statisticians, I'm going to uh, rephrase what you said. Statisticians do a lot of what we call uh, statistical modeling or generative model, I mean, uh, traditional statistical modeling, which is based on inference. And he also says somewhere there that a lot of real world problems are prediction problems. Right. He, sa he, he says a lot of real world problems are prediction problems. And he says some numbers that cause a lot of controversy. Right. When he went to Stanford from, he was at Berkeley, went to Stanford and, you know, you got a lot of criticism about this at Stanford. And if you read the paper, there are also discussions by people like Efron and David Cobbs and all that. And, you know, and traditional statisticians were very critical, right? Unfairly so, I would say, right? And Leo was ahead of his time. Yeah. You know, okay. anytime you want to make Anytime you want to make a change, you want to make sure that it's a provocative so that, you know, you exaggerate the case. You are exaggerating. Go okay. Ahead, okay. 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 Thank you, Thank you. Professor Vijay Nair. Thank you very much for your uh, valuable talk. Okay. Professor Thank you. Sadish. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Vijay Nair, for your wonderful talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> we are very much grateful to you, Professor. I will, also, I, will wait, I will wait for my good friend David Banks talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's waiting. Uh, also, we would like to extend our gratitude to Professor Sankayam for chairing this session. Uh, thank you so much. Now, we'll let us move to the next session. Uh, Professor David Bank is waiting. <laughs> uh, everyone is waiting here. And um, Professor Ismail uh, to chair. Um, I Sangamitra, please introduce the chair and uh, please do the help to uh, for the further proceedings. Welcome to the technical session 20 of WSTA 2023. The session is chaired by Dr. Ismail B, Professor, Department of Statistics, Inepoya, deemed to be University of Bangalore. He also worked as a professor and chairman, Department of PG Studies and Research in Statistics, Mangalore University. His area of specialization is econometrics. He has worked on modeling this continuous phenomena. He has around 30 publications in journals. In the field of non-parametric regression, significant contribution has been made on detecting discontinuities, estimation of jump size and testing for discontinuities. He has developed improved methods for estimation and testing change points in regression curves and surfaces. We are really happy to happy and honored to have you here to chair the session, sir. Without delaying you any further, I once again extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of the organizing committee and kindly request you to take over the session. Over to thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Satish. It is my pleasure to chair this session. We are in the plenary session five. Welcome to this for all the delegates. Now, uh, David Bank from Duke University is uh, presenting on advers adversarial risk analysis. Uh, David Bank is uh, from Duke University and he returned to academic in the year 2003. He got his new NSF postdoctoral research fellowship in the mathematical sciences and uh, he took Berkeley working with David Blackwell. He was the coordinating editor of JASA. He co-founder of the Journal of Statistics and Public Policy and served as a, its editor. The co-founder of American Statistical Association section on national defense and homeland security and has chaired that section as well as sections on risk analysis and on statistical learning and data mining. In 2003, he led a research program on data mining at the, at the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Science Institute in 2008, 
He led a research program at the Isaac Newton Institute on Theory and Methods of Complex High Dimensional Data. In 2012, he led a, uh, a SAMSI research program on computational advertising, he has published 92 refereed articles, eight, uh, edit, nine edited books, and co authored five monographs. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Association of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and of American Association for the Advancement of Science. He won the American Statistical Association Founders Award, the D. Groot Award, and gave the William Sally Gossett Lecture from January 2018 to September 21. He was the director of SAMC. His research area includes models for computational advertising, dynamic text networks, adversarial risk analysis, Bayesian behavioral and game theory, human rights statistics, agent-based models, forensics, forensics and certain topics in high dimensional data analysis. This is a very brief introduction of uh, Professor David Banks on behalf of all the delegates and on behalf of the University of Kerala, I extend a warm welcome to David Banks and I request him to present his talks on adversarial risk analysis. Please, you have 40 minutes for the presentation and discussion. Over to you, Thank you very uh, much. Professor David Banks. Thank you very much for that handsome intro uh, introduction, and I hope everybody is having a good evening. I'm sure it's late where you all are, and I am sorry that the time zones aren't more convenient. Uh, I want to talk about adversarial risk analysis, which is basically a decision theoretic alternative to game theory. Classical game theory has been used in situations where the outcomes are typically non-stochastic, um, and um, when it does take account of uncertainty, it makes unreasonable assumptions about common knowledge. It assumes that we both have the same distribution over uh, what the other person's values are. And that seems unreasonable. Uh, we also know from behavioral uh, economics that game theory is a terrible guide for how human beings actually make decisions in real life. Um, there's just tons of evidence that we don't think the way that um, uh, a game theorist would say that we should. Uh, one alternative to classical game theory is statistical risk analysis. But that focuses upon situations in which your opponent is non-strategic. Classical risk analysis is great for trying to predict um, the probability of a hurricane striking a city or the probability of an earthquake but it doesn't really apply to situations in which you have an intelligent hurricane that notices that you've evacuated one city and consequently steers itself towards a different city. That type of situation doesn't arise in traditional risk analysis. But we all know that uh, there are clear applications where you have uh, intelligent opponents who are not using game theory and you want to make decisions that respond to how you believe your opponent is going to behave. And uh, corporate competition is one example. You have Coca-Cola and you have Pepsi, and Coca-Cola can decide to invest in a new product line, and Pepsi can try and open up a new market in, I don't know, Mexico. In federal regulation, you often have uh, uh, three uh, opponents. You have an industry that uh, doesn't want to be regulated. You have the federal government, which is imposing regulations on that industry. And then you have the public, whose interests may not align with either the corporation or the government. So all of these are situations in which uh, it's reasonable to have considerable knowledge about your opponent, and a Bayesian would like to use that in order to develop an analysis that is uh, uh, going to maximize expected utility. And this extends ideas by uh, Jake Cadane and Pat Larkey and um, Howard Raifa, but uh, these ideas are controversial. Roger Meyerson has a Nobel Prize in economics, and he hates what I'm going to tell you. Uh, he believes, as this text shows, that a decision theoretic alternative to game theory is intellectually bankrupt. Uh, he says that if you try to go through the logic of a decision theoretic uh, framework, uh, you wind up with uh, basically a paradox uh, that would force the player eye to abandon the decision theoretic approach entirely and instead do game theory. 
uh, in which you try and solve all the program player's decision problems for an equilibrium simultaneously. And I think he is too quick to reject that, uh, that possibility. So um, instead of defaulting back to game theory, I'm going to explore um, versions of uh, adversarial risk analysis, largely in the context of auctions. The adversarial risk analysis framework builds a model for the decision-making process of an opponent, and then you use some subject you place a subjective Bayesian distribution over anything you don't know. Then you take the decision that maximizes your expected utility against that model. And this model can be quite complex. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the reality is this is a very human way of thinking. Uh, suppose you go into your boss and you ask for a raise. You have a mental model for what your boss values in the workday. Uh, if you think that your boss values um, punctuality and paperwork uh, and you're good at that, then you have a good chance of getting a raise. But if you're wrong about your boss, if he actually values how many clients you have and how much money you bring into the firm, then you're making the wrong pitch. You have misunderstood your boss, your model for the decision making is wrong, and your chance of getting a raise is very, very low. So I would argue that this type of ARA framework is a very common human situation. Now, one nice thing about ARA is that it conveniently partitions the uncertainty in the problem into three parts which can be addressed separately. There's the aleatory uncertainty, which is non-strategic. This is the uncertainty in the outcome conditional on the pair of actions that the two opponents choose. For example, um, uh, I can imagine that I'm a terrorist. Uh, I can imagine that uh, uh, Professor Satish is a, um, uh, a police officer. Uh, I'm going to try and smuggle a bomb into a statistics conference. Uh, I've made my decision about whether or not I'm going to smuggle a bomb. Uh, Professor Satish has made his decision about whether or not he's going to search me. And conditional on those two things, it is possible that he will search me and be unsuccessful. It is possible that he will search me and be successful. That is the aleatory uncertainty. And it's non-strategic because we've both made our decisions already. Epistemic uncertainty describes um, the uh, uncertainty that a Bayesian has about the utilities, the uh, capabilities, and the probabilities of my opponent. Uh, so I may not know what um, uh, uh, my opponent's um, how my opponent values certain outcomes. Uh, I don't know whether or not my opponent has certain abilities. Uh, and so as a Bayesian, I can put a Bayesian prior over that, a subjective distribution over that. And that is how I handle this epistemic uncertainty. Uh, the most interesting and sort of novel thing is the concept uncertainty. I don't know exactly how my opponent is trying to frame the decision problem that they're making. Are they seeking a Bayes-Nash equilibrium? Are they using level two thinking? Are they acting at random in a non-strategic way? Those are all possibilities. And in principle, I don't know that, but as a Bayesian, I can assign a subjective distribution to those possibilities. Uh, Greg Parnell and Jason Merrick uh, compared probabilistic risk analysis with various intelligent adversary methods, and they wound up preferring um, adversarial risk analysis in large part because the division of the uncertainty into three components allowed you to address them uh, in a fairly neat way. The aleatory uncertainty, that corresponds to standard risk analysis, classical risk analysis. Doesn't mean that it's easy, but we've been doing risk analysis uh, for a long time, and so it's a well-worn path. The epistemic uncertainty, we can do that with Bayesian uh, techniques. We have subjective beliefs and we can uh, apply those. Similarly, Bayesian approaches apply for concept uncertainty. And so uh, to make these ideas more concrete, I'm going to talk about them in the context of auctions. Let us imagine that Daphne is bidding for a first edition of the theory of games and economic behavior. She is the only bidder, but the owner has set a secret reservation price V star. And if she bids less than V star, she will not get the book. The owner will keep the book. Uh, and if she bids more than V star, then she will acquire the book. Daphne doesn't know what the secret value V star is, 
But being a Bayesian, she can have subjective distribution over that, and we're going to call that subjective distribution f of v. I'm going to assume that Daphne's utility function for money is linear. Uh, we don't have to do that. We can do it in other ways, but let's assume it's linear. And we're going to assume that her personal true top dollar value for the book is D naught. Daphne knows what is the maximum amount that she would pay. And uh, assuming that money is infinitely divisible, then the uh, expected utility that she gets for a bid of D is going to be D naught minus D. That's the profit she makes. The difference between what she would pay as the top dollar value and her bid times the probability that the bid of D is greater than the secret reservation price V star. And so Daphne should make the bid D star that maximizes her expected utility. That's going to be the thing that is the arg max of D naught minus D times the probability that a bid of D wins. And this is a dead standard approach in auction theory. It's all over the place. There's nothing new about this. Now we're going to move to a two-person auction, and we're going to consider a two-person first price independent private value sealed bid auction amid uh, among risk neutral opponents. That's a whole lot of technical stuff that we've packed together, but the idea is really very simple. Um, Daphne and Apollo are bidding against each other. Daphne writes down her bid in a sealed envelope. Apollo writes down his bid and puts it in a sealed envelope. They hand it to the auctioneer and whoever bid the most wins the book. So it's a very simple uh, auction model. Aleatory uncertainty arises in this situation if the value of the book is unknown to Daphne and Apollo. They've not had an opportunity to examine the book before the auction, so it may be that the book is beat up and in terrible condition, in which case it's worth less than they imagine it to be. On the other hand, it could be that the book was owned by John Nash, who made notations in the margins. And in that case, the book would be worth much more than you would expect it to be. So the aleatory uncertainty is the value of the book to, let's say, Daphne, conditional on her bid and Apollo's bid. They've made their bids, uh, Warlam has won the book, and now the actual value of the book turns out to be a random variable because it could be low or high. Epistemic uncertainty arises because neither Apollo nor Daphne knows the true value of the book to the other. It could be that the book was owned by Apollo's PhD supervisor, and so it has sentimental value to Apollo that Daphne does not know about, and so that's going to affect the behavior. And concept uncertainty arises here because Daphne does not know how Apollo is going to decide upon his bid. It's possible that he will be non-strategic. It's possible that he will seek a Bayes-Nash equilibrium. And he might use something called level K thinking that we'll talk about shortly. To begin, assume that there is no aleatory uncertainty. That simplifies things. Both Apollo and Daphne have had the opportunity to inspect the book before the auction so they know what its value is to them. Uh, and for Daphne, her value for that book is going to be X naught. Let us start by assuming that Daphne thinks his Apollo is non-strategic. And one type of non-strategic bid is he's going to bid some fraction of his true value uh, for the book. So you can imagine that Apollo's rule in an auction is I'm going to bid 90% of what I think is the top dollar value of the book to me. And Daphne does not know what fraction he bids and he does not, she does not know the true value of the book, V. But she's a Bayesian, and so she can have this objective density F1 over V and this objective density F2 over P. And in that case, it turns out that her belief about the distribution of Apollo's bid is going to be that double integral there. Uh, and I'm going to write that double integral as F of Y. Uh, so... Now, Daphne's optimal bid, just as in the previous slide, is going to be the value D star. That's the arg max that uh, maximizes her expected profit, D naught minus D times capital F of D. Uh, so uh, that's how she would frame the problem uh, for a non-strategic bidder. Now let's imagine that Daphne supposes that Apollo is strategic, and she thinks that he might seek a Bayes-Nash equilibrium solution. The base nash equilibrium assumption uh, assumes that both Apollo and Daphne have distributions H sub D and H sub A for each other's valuation of the book, and that both of them know each other's distributions and knows that each other knows them, uh, which basically amounts to, to, 
to telepathy. And I don't believe that that's ever a good model, but that's the way game theory works. Um, so if you buy into all those assumptions, you wind up solving a system of first order differential equations. And for an asymmetric auction, when H sub A does not equal H sub D, no solution algorithm exists. Uh, although it's known that H sub A and H sub D are differentiable. It's like, if H sub A and H sub D are both differentiable, then a unique solution exists and that solution is also differentiable. Previous attempts at solutions are based on something called the back shooting algorithm. Uh, Fibich and Gavish showed that all such algorithms are inherently unstable. Uh, Kierkegaard did some stuff, Hubbard did some stuff. Tim Al in 2014 uh, found an algorithm that actually succeeds based on the limits of discretized bids and points of indifference. And uh, uh, he was my PhD student and uh, another student and I have written some papers that, that prove the convergence of his uh, uh, algorithm. I want to go back to this common knowledge assumption that I find so repugnant. Uh, from the ARA perspective, we don't really need to think that way at all. Daphne has a subjective opinion about the distribution H sub D that she thinks that Apollo has for her value of the book. And she has a subjective opinion H sub A, which is what she believes is the distribution for his value. So the H sub A and the H sub D are subjective beliefs that Daphne as a Bayesian is allowed to hold. And these represent her epistemic uncertainty about the, uh, the auction that's going on. So she's just modeling Apollo. She's not having certain knowledge about what Apollo's beliefs are. So no common knowledge. Uh, in that ARA framework, she believes that Apollo is solving the following Bayes-Nash equilibrium solutions. Uh, D naught is the true top dollar value of the book to Daphne as believed by Apollo to have a distribution H sub D. And A sub naught, capital A sub naught, is the top dollar value of the book that Apollo thinks Daphne has for Apollo's distribution. And now the argmax solution of the first line is going to have distribution capital G. The argmax solution for the second line is going to have distribution capital F. And so we have a set of coupled equations that we can solve. Uh, and we use Tim Au's bid algorithm to solve this. And she works, and Daphne works through this, finds the distribution of F, this thing here, and uh, that's going to give her belief about the Bayes-Nash equilibrium solution that Apollo has derived. Now she steps outside of the Bayes-Nash equilibrium framework and solves this equation using her true known to herself value D naught it is the top dollar value she has for the book, and she solves to find the bid that maximizes her expected utility. Uh, and I'm going to call this a mirroring argument because it's slightly different from the Bayes-Nash equilibrium solution. It's almost identical for the case of two opponents, but when we have three opponents, everything changes, and it's no longer equivalent to a Bayes-Nash equilibrium solution. So one nice feature of the ARA mirroring equilibrium formulation is that it allows for a new class of multi-person games. If Bob is bidding against Apollo and Daphne in the same auction, it's totally possible for Daphne to have opinions about what Apollo thinks about Bob and what Apollo thinks Daphne thinks about Bob that are not expressible in the common knowledge framework. Specifically, Daphne can believe that Bob is going to bid low, but she also thinks that Apollo thinks that Bob is going to bid high. And that's just not representable in the uh, Base nash equilibrium world, but it's a totally reasonable situation. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of the concept uncertainty, we first took Apollo to be non-strategic, and then we assumed that he used the base nash equilibrium concept. And in practice, Daphne might have a subjective probability P1 that he is non-strategic, and a subjective probability P2 that he seeks a base nash equilibrium, and perhaps a probability P3, that he's a level one reasoner and so forth. There are many, many possible solution concepts. And so she can apply a probability to all of these, work the solutions out for each, do the mixture, and then find the um, uh, solution that maximizes your expected utility against this much more complicated situation. Uh, it's work, 
But it's not an unreasonable situation to imagine that she isn't certain about the solution concept that Apollo will use. Oh, I'd like to introduce a fourth solution concept besides the mirroring equilibrium, Bayes Nash equilibrium, and uh, non strategic thinking. And this is a uh, level K thinking. If Daphne is a level zero thinker, she bids non strategically. If she's a level one thinker, she believes that Apollo is a level zero thinker, and she makes her best response given her beliefs about the probabilities of him acting in a non strategic way. If she's a level two thinker, then she believes that Apollo is a level one thinker who is modeling her as a non-strategic level zero thinker. And this becomes pretty intricate to talk about, but it's a simple recursion. So it's easy to program. Uh, but, uh, but let's do an example. I think that will help. Uh, let us assume that uh, Daphne is a level two thinker. And that believes, means that she believes that Apollo thinks her value for the book has, let us suppose, a uniform distribution on $100 to $200, and that she bids a proportion of her value uh, that has the uh, beta distribution uh, shown there. So she thinks that Apollo is modeling her as a non-strategic person who is bidding about 90% of her true top dollar value of the book. And uh, he believes that uh, this... Uh, top dollar value is uniformly distributed between $100 and $200. And in that case, uh, Apollo's best response is going to be the A star that's the arg max of this thing. And Daphne does not know what capital A naught is. That's the true value of the book to Apollo. Uh, but she can solve this equation and see that uh, Apollo should be bidding 90% of his true top dollar value A naught. Now Daphne does not know Apollo's true value, but she's a Bayesian. So she can believe that it has a triangular distribution on $140 to $200 with a peak at 170. Uh, so Apollo should bid 90% of his true value. Uh, Daphne believes that his bid is going to be uh, a random variable with a triangular distribution supported at $126 to $180 with a peak at $153. And if Daphne's true value for the book is $175, then she works out that her maximum, the bid that maximizes her expected utility should be $161.67. So that would be how Daphne as a level two thinker would model Apollo as a level one thinker who is modeling her as a non-strategic level zero thinker. It's a toy problem, but we've worked it out. I'd like to talk for a moment about more than two bidders. And um, here we have uh, Bonnie who is bidding against Alvin and Claude. Uh, we can imagine that they're both non-strategic and there's really no novelty in that analysis. She's going to make the bid that maximizes her expected utility against the maximum of their two bids. So she works out the situation for Alvin, gets the distribution for his bid. She works out the situation for Claude, gets the distribution for his bid, and then she makes the bid that is going to maximize your expected utility against the maximum of those two random variables. Uh, trying to talk about this in English is hard. Uh, and so I'm happy to share the slides with anybody. Uh, but I know that we're running a little late. And I have other things that I think are more important to tell you. So let me simply assure you that if you go through some logic, you can wind up coming up with a strategy that will tell you how uh, Bonnie determines B star, the bid that maximizes her expected utility against the maximum of the bids by Alvin and Claude, where Alvin and Claude are both uh, uh, bidding against each other and against Bonnie, and they have various beliefs about um, uh, what each other thinks. The example is probably more compelling. Uh, let us imagine that Bonnie believes that Alvin thinks her value for the first edition is a beta 1 1 and that Clyde's value is a beta 2 1. Similarly, she believes that Clyde thinks that her value for the first edition is beta 4 1 and she thinks Clyde thinks that Alvin's value is beta 3 1. 
Finally, she beats Alvin's value for the first edition is beta 5-1, and that Calvin's value is beta 6-1. So you'll note that there is no common knowledge here at all. Bonnie is not assuming that Alvin and Clyde have a common distribution over her value for the book. In this framework, we can now use Tim's bid algorithm to solve this three-person game. And we're going to be supporting Bonnie. And so here on the left-hand panel, we have um, uh, the um, cumulative distribution functions of the bids that Alvin makes against Bonnie and the bid that Alvin makes against Clyde. And Alvin needs to make a bid that is greater than the maximum of those two random variables, which is what's shown on the right-hand panel. Here is the same situation for Clyde. We see the left panel is Clyde's bid against Alvin and Clyde's bid against Bonnie. And the right panel shows the cumulative distribution function of the maximum of those two. And this is actually, um, uh, this is actually continuous. Uh, the meshing was uh, too coarse. And so it looks like there's a step function there, but really it's an artifact. It's just a very steep curve. And finally, we have the distribution for the maximum of the optimal bids against both Alvin and Clyde. And that is the distribution that Bonnie needs to bid against. And uh, if Bonnie's true value for the book is 0.95, it turns out that her optimal bid is going to be 0.7523. If you want to turn it into numbers, multiply everything by $100 or $200, and you can make it a more realistic example. But that is the strategy that we can use to solve a three-person game without common knowledge. Uh, it turns out we can do the same thing uh, with the mirror equilibrium solution concept. Uh, and again, we can work through and use bid algorithm, the bid algorithm by Tim to get a solution here. Uh, this diagram basically shows that there isn't common knowledge and it shows what uh, different people think about each other's uh, value for the item on offer. Uh, and the logic is a little irksome to talk about. Uh, it's not especially insightful. Let me move on to adversarial risk analysis in general. Uh, so we're moving away from auctions. And in ARA, you take the side of one agent and using only her beliefs and knowledge, uh, we come up with a solution, and instead of assuming common knowledge, we simply have a subjective distribution about the, uh, the beliefs and capabilities and utilities of the other people in the game. We need to have subjective probability about the actions of each opponent. We need to have subjective conditional probabilities about the outcome for every possible set of choices that the players make. And we need to have perfect knowledge of our own utility function. Uh, so the tricky one is the first one. But Daphne believes, Daphne needs to have find the probability of Apollo choosing action A from the set of possible actions uh, script A. Uh, and that's hard. She also needs to have a subjective probability on the outcome given her choice lowercase d and Apollo cho Apollo's choice lowercase a for every combination of d and a which is hard, but that's basically standard statistical risk analysis. We can do that, or at least we know how to do that. And finally, knowing your own utility function perfectly is not easy, but statisticians have been wrestling with this for a long time. And in general, approximate knowledge of your utility function is sufficient for most cases. Daphne wants to make the decision that maximizes your expected utility D star, which is found by that double integral there. And uh, um, as I said, the most difficult quantity to obtain is pi sub d of a. That is what Daphne believes is the probability that Apollo will choose action lowercase a. Uh, and I would like to show how the cognitive load for this type of analysis depends upon the kind of ARA that we're doing. And so uh, each row is going to correspond to a different level of reasoning in level k thinking. So I'm going to show you a table and displays the quantities that Daphne has to assess in order to implement a level K analysis. The first row, row zero, corresponds to non-random utilities and beliefs, which are generally not known to Daphne as they pertain to Apollo. She may know her own, but she won't know those corresponding quantities for Apollo. Uh, 
And then subsequently, the next row is what level one thinking has. That's going to consist of random variables, random distributions. Uh, and each subsequent row is going to be um, a random variable. So here's what we have. Uh, the true utility for Daphne is in row zero, column one. Uh, the true distribution for the outcomes given a choice D and A that Daphne believes is held in column two. The true distribution over uh, Apollo's uh, activities, actions, according to Daphne, is in row three. Apollo's utility function is in column four. I'm sorry, I think column three. Column four is Apollo's utility functions. Column five is what Apollo thinks is the probability of an outcome given his choice A and Daphne's choice D. And finding column six is what Apollo has as the distribution over Daphne's choices. So in terms of that table, different solution concepts require information in different cells. If you're doing traditional game theory, you require cells 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 4, and 0, 5. You assume that those are common knowledge and you find the equilibrium solution. If you have a non-strategic component, then you need the cells 0, 1, 0, 2, and 0, 3, where that 0, 3 cell, this thing, is assessed from historical data. How many times did uh, a person win an auction? How many times did a hurricane strike New Orleans? That kind of thing. When the adversary seeks a Bayes-Nash equilibrium, uh, the analysis requires cells 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 4, and 1, 5, and it uses those last four cells to infer 0, 3. And the calculations that I sort of skipped over a little bit in the auction examples generalized directly here to show how you use 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 4, and 1, 5 to produce uh, Daphne's belief about Apollo's probability, probable actions, 0, 3. If you're doing level K adversarial analysis, then you need cells 0, 1, 0, and 0, 2. And for a level 1 analysis, you use cells 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6 to produce 0, 3. For a level 2 analysis, you use cells 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3 to produce 1, 6, which you then combine with 1, 4, and 1, 5 to produce 0, 3. And you can keep ratcheting up. Finally, the mirror equilibrium approach requires cells 0, 1, and 0, 2, and then it uses a consistency condition between 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6, and 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3 to produce the cell 0, 3. And my main point here is that there's no cheap solution. Uh, if you were doing any sort of adversarial analysis in which your opponent may be strategic, you can do game theory, you can do ARA, you can do various flavors of um, solution concepts, but you're going to have to work for your answer. It's not, nothing is simple. So uh, I haven't quite gotten this back on schedule, but I, I'm, I'm gonna try. Uh, to minimize the damage. Uh, ARA allows the analyst to model the thought process of the opponents using whatever subjective beliefs you might have. And that fits in with a large body of work in behavioral game theory, prospect theory, that type of stuff. And it avoids unrealistic assumptions about rationality and common knowledge. ARA also partitions the total uncertainty into usefully distinct parts, the aleatory, epistemic, and concept uncertainty, which allows us to do subjective Bayesian elicitation, and also calculation. Uh, I've talked about auctions, and I've talked about ARA in general, but there are also interesting ARA results for convoy riding, uh, a game that uh, Emile Borel invented called La Relance, and uh, other situations. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this ARA formulation leads to new research questions, and we have an n-person game with n greater than two, and we can model all the pairwise beliefs that bidders have about each other without assuming common knowledge. So that is the strategy between ARA. Uh, let me stop sharing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you have completed, right, your presentation? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation on ARA. Now, a few questions from the audience, please. If you have any clarification instead of questions, some clarifications you can ask. Yeah. 
two or three clarifications from the audience. Professor Krishnamurthy is on. Hello, Professor Krishnamurthy. How are you? Please unmute your mic, uh, Professor Krishnamurthy. Kalyan, sir, please unmute the mic. And... Ah. Your mic is <laughs> muted. Unmute the mic. It's quite all right if there are no questions. Um, so uh, I'm happy to share the slides with anybody, and I am happy to um, uh, provide pointers to any of the literature. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor ba David, for your kind presentation and uh, wonderful uh, uh, opening on uh, ERA. So who are interested in doing research in ERA, definitely they will have a better scope. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Professor David, for your uh, uh, excellent talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Very informative and useful to the researchers. No doubt. Uh, I also uh, extend the thanks to Professor Ismail for uh, chairing the session in a very nice way and uh, concluded in time. Thank you. Now, thank us, you, Sadish. Thank you. Thank you. Now let us move to the next session. Um, Anjana? Yes, sir. Yeah, Anjana, please introduce the chair and uh, please do the help, do the needful for all sir. So, uh, greetings to all. Now, we are moving on to the technical session 21 of WSTA 2023, and it gives me great joy and honor to introduce and welcome our esteemed chair of this session, Professor Sheila Mistra. Dr. Mistra is a professor of statistics principal investigator in the Center of Excellence Project and former head to the Department of Statistics at the University of Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh, India. With over three decades of versatile academic, social and community service experience, Professor Mistra specializes in sustainable development goals, survey sampling, gender issues, biostatistics, personality development programs, yoga, naturopathy and spirituality. She is an elected member of the ISI Netherlands and has represented India in the United Nations Organization meeting on monitoring of SDG 2030 in Bangkok. She is also a member of uh, several esteemed national and international academic and social bodies, editorial boards and recruitment boards. Professor Mistra has made a significant contributions through valued research papers, reviews of articles, study materials, books, and has played a crucial role as a co-faculty in charge for the Saksham HIV AIDS counseling program sponsored by the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. She has contributed immensely to various other projects related to education, health monitoring, planning, and disaster risk management by organizations such as UNICEF, UGC, PGVS, and IAG. For her untiring efforts and a dedication to promote knowledge and research along with gender sensitization, character building and inculcation of ethics and human values, Dr. Mishra has received numerous state and national level honors and awards. Some of these include the Lokmal Sankalp Samman 2020, fifth of Fiki Flow Up Women Award 2019 for Outstanding Women in Services by the Women's Wing of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and the Bharatendu Harishchandra Puraska 2019 by the government of Uttar Pradesh for her book Bharat Bhagini Nivetita. She has also been conferred the Lifetime Achievement Award 2018 by Dr. S. P. Ghosh, among others. Indeed, we are really fortunate to have you, Professor Mistra, chairing the session today. So on behalf of the organizing committee of WSG 2023, I hereby extend a warm welcome to you and cordially invite you to chair the session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Professor Satish Kumar and his entire team for conducting this webinar for so many years very successfully, even during the COVID also. So we are lucky to join uh, through online despite of any obstacle. He has been able to remove that and he has uh, coordinated all of us from various parts of the globe. So thank you so much, Professor Kumar. And it is an honor for me to chair the session of this uh, eighth international webinar on recent trends in statistical theory and applications 2023. Uh, 
uh, the special invited session, which is going to be uh, presented by, um, yes, uh, Professor is Isnikdhanshu Chatterjee, University of Minnesota, uh, USA. Uh, he is going to speak on an agnostic Fay Harriet model for small area statistics. And uh, I would like to briefly introduce our uh, speaker today. So, Dr. Isnik Dhanshu, uh, who is familiarly known as Anshu Chatterjee, is professor in a school of statistics at the University of Minnesota and the director of the Institute for Research in Statistics and its Application. IRS, IRSA. Uh, the web link uh, is also available for those who wish to know more about him. An interdisciplinary data science institute at the University of Minnesota. He has published in top tier statistics journals, including the Annals of Statistics, Annals of Applied Statistics, and in the top tier peer reviewed computer science conference and journals in machine learning artificial intelligence and data mining, including the International Conference on Machine Learning, SIAM, International Conference on Data Mining. His research interests include statistical foundations of data science, high dimensional data geometry, Bayesian statistics, resampling methods, and applications of data sciences in multi-domain uh, multiple domain, including precision medicine, climate change, and its effect and survey techniques. So it is an honor for me to invite uh, Professor Chatterjee uh, to deliver his talk. Uh, Professor Ch Chatterjee, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Mishra. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to all of you uh, for um, for attending this talk. I know it's uh, kind of late at night in India. Uh, my special thanks to Professor Shatish Kumar you, and the entire organizing committee uh, for putting this together. Uh, this is this is great. It's, it's wonderful. It uh, leverages the current technologies, the current resources that we have to bring people from uh, all over the world uh, do technical talks, uh, which is which is really uh, encouraging and enjoyable. Uh, I'm hoping that this would spread to uh, you know more continents. Because, uh, the time zones are such that uh, even even uh, people from uh, some parts of Europe, uh, Africa, can also attend. So hopefully, uh, this would this the WSTA effort would uh, would hopefully. Uh, go into greater heights um, in the coming years. So thanks so much to the organizers. And so um, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, let me just briefly tell you in, in a minute or two uh, about this. So um, one, of the, one of the uses of uh, statistics that we see in the United States is of course in formulating public policies. And part of this public policy uh, related usage happens to be um, well tied to surveys and then using this survey data to to do various things like for example allocate food stamps so what are food stamps food stamps are uh, a support system a little bit like uh, the pds system in india uh, but in a in a different way uh, so there are there are coupons given that individuals can use and, and use them to buy food. Uh, so not exactly like the ration system, but there is a little bit of a similarity to that. So uh, that kind of a thing, how, how would you allocate these to different regions or different parts, different districts, different counties, as they're called in uh, the United States? And uh, then again, different school districts. This, the other thing that this is used for is in allocating money, the central government or the federal government money for uh, school meals. So children um, get their lunch at school. And of course, it has to be supported. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing where it happens in the United States as well as uh, in other parts of the world. And I, I know 
that in several states of India, it has been a very successful program. It has been successful in providing nutrition to uh, young children uh, and bringing them to school, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, uh, but that requires money and how does the government allocate those money? So these things um, are tied to what are known as small area estimation problems. Why is it a small area? Because think of the catchment area of a given school. Uh, there's typically very, very uh, small sized population living, living in a neighborhood of a school at least very small size compared to the size of the county or the district or the size of the state or the size of the country. So if you were to go ahead and collect data on from, from each individual school district, uh, that would be enormously expensive. That would be a really, really hard problem because uh, there are so many hundreds of thousands, so many lakhs of, uh, of uh, schools and school districts around. So of course we cannot collect data from every one of them. And even if you do collect data by whatever mechanism we do collect these data, uh, they are going to be, uh, you know, every school district is going to have maybe two, maybe five, maybe 20 uh, sized sample uh, or, or a vast majority would have no sample at all. So there would be zero uh, data points from each individual school district, so from many of them. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with the fact that for your favorite school zone, there's a sample size of two? Well, the way we deal with it is we say that the school districts are all very similar to each other. So we build a Bayesian hierarchical model. and what I'm going to talk about is related to this Bayesian hierarchical modeling that we do. And then there's some, some improvement that we have been proposing. So let's try to go to presentation mode and see if I can pull up. Uh, you can all see my slides, right? Yes, Professor, we can see it. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I cannot see the uh, the uh, Google Meet screen, so feel free to stop me or interrupt if you need to. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, is an agnostic Fay-Heriot model, and I'll explain all these terms. So this is a paper that's uh, accepted for the Calcutta Statistical Association Bulletin, uh, CSA Bulletin, and the R package relating to this is also published. It's You'll find it on CRAN, the, the standard uh, server for uh, uh, R packages. And this is joint work with a student of mine who just graduated, Martin, Martin Thompson. And uh, let, me, let me start by telling you um, about what people do. So by people, I uh, mean primarily the Census Bureau of the United States. So the Census Bureau of the United States is a wonderful, wonderful statistical organization. They collect data, they, they have fantastic people who uh, can model all this uh, data and uh, build the technology around it, not just for dissemination, which is, which is great. If you go to the US Census Bureau's website, uh, you'll find tons of data uh, for downloading for, for, for many purposes, uh, for research and um, you know, just, just any kind of an applied work. So they do that, they do their own internal uh, research, methodology development, and so on. And part of what they do is they collect data for other organizations, other government organizations. And there are, there are a couple of uh, programs that they very actively support with their um, statistical efforts. Uh, one is known as the SIP program. Small Area Income and Poverty Estimation Program. And the other one, uh, which started just a few years back, is known as a SAHI program. It's, it's related to, uh, the, so there's, there's something uh, that started in the United States just a few years back about universal health care, universal health insurance related things. And uh, that's the other thing that's supported. So how does the Census Bureau do this? Uh, and that sort of relates to what I'm going to call the classical approach. So what they use is a two-level model 
this model is attributed to uh, Bob Fay and uh, Roger Harriet in a 1979 JASA paper. Um, so this says that, again, think of a school district, a school uh, catchment area. And let's suppose you've got a sample size of two or five from them. So very small sample size. You just take an average of them. All right. So if you take an average, you'll have a sample mean. And that sample mean is supposed to follow a normal distribution. So there's something like a CLT-like assumption going on here. You are measuring something. Let's say you're measuring income. All right. You have taken a sample of size five, you have, you, and you're measuring income. So the average income of these five groups, let's call that YM. So given the true income, this is normally distributed with its mean around the true income. Now, of course, you don't know the true income. You have not taken a census. You have taken a sample of only size five from this particular small area. And uh, this variance, and I'm, I'm actually going to use the precision not notation. So the variance of this normal, uh, one over dm, uh, that is known. Why is that known? Because you've collected a sample of size 5. You could at least plug in the sampling variance in there. So that's what is typically done. So looking at the average of the five, the income of those five households, and that follows a normal distribution with a sample uh, variance estimator plugged in here. And then, so the linking model, this is where we relate the various small areas, the various school districts or the school zones. All right. So they all follow the same pattern. So at least within a given state, there is a commonality of, uh, you know, government policies. There's a commonality of um, people's habi habits, people's preferences, people's food habits, people's languages. In the case of India, uh, there's, th there's a lot of commonalities. So what we try to do is we borrow strength from all the small areas together. So we say that this true mean for the little mth small area happens to be, of course, a function of whatever covariates are there, and the common variance. So what this does is that this ties up all the small areas together in a common link. So this normality comes from some kind of an assumption about the central limit theorem kicking in, which is sort of uh, more, more a matter of convenience rather than anything reasonable. Because you know with a sample size of 2 or 5 or even 20, you do not do not really have a central limit theorem kicking in. Uh, and especially for you know skewed uh, random variables like, like income or something. Uh, and this is a linking model. And this, this sort of, uh, this model is assumed, this happens independently for all choices of small areas. So let's say in the state of Kerala, if there are uh, 30,000 school zones, all 30,000 of them share this common uh, framework. So the observed data happens to be you know, the vector of incomes, the vector of averages of these incomes for each uh, school zone, and then the unobserved random vector. So these are the theta. That's really the primary quantity of interest, because that goes on to determine how are school meal coupons distributed? How is the funding for the school meal going to be distributed? Are you going to put more money into this deprived zone or that deprived zone or that the third urban zone. So these have different characteristics and all of them need money. But given a limited budget, that has to be sort of proportionately di divided. So that's based on our understanding of this random vector theta. Now, remember, this is a random vector, cannot be consistently estimated, right? Uh, two unknown parameters, the p-dimensional parameter out here uh, that goes with that uh, linking with the covariates. So that's beta. And shy, the variance uh, at the linking model, this is unknown. Now, this precisions, d1, d2, d, so what's the precision? Precision is 1 over variance. For one-dimensional random variables, it's just the uh, 1 over the variance. So this precisions, d1, d2, all the way up to dn, these are known. That's the classical model. So 
this is where we start. This is a classical model, as you can see. So this is widely used. Uh, we know that this is very fundamentally used in the United States, and this has been very successfully exported, if I might use that term, to Mexico, Chile, and a bunch of African countries um, who, who are all using this kind of a model to build their government data. Uh, at a certain point of time, uh, we were thinking of using the MN Rega data from India, uh, the, uh, the rural employment guarantee data set, uh, and, and using the small area model for that, but then the data set disappeared. So uh, that's another story. So let's not get there. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, Let's, let's just uh, continue with the development of the model. So everything is normal, right? I mean, why given theta was normal, theta itself was normal, you could write everything down as a 2n dimensional normal distribution with, with this. So it's a very well laid out parametric distribution. A little n is high, little n is large. So this is large, but then there's so much structure out here and this matrix is IN denotes the identity matrix. So it's it's really fairly simple model. I'm just writing it uh, just because it helps me write the, uh, you know, I'm writing it in a matrix notation so that I could write these three lines. Uh, you could pretty much easily write down the, the posterior distribution of theta given Y. So theta vector given Y vector. That happens to be a n-dimensional normal distribution with something that in the small area literature, because many small area people are not Bayesians, but they do use empirical Bayes techniques. Uh, so they use uh, a terminology that comes from a frequentist perspective. So theta given y has a mean that is also the best linear unbiased predictor, um, whose formula happens to be this, mu plus v21, v11 inverse y minus mu but this mu v, these terms exist here. And the conditional variance or the posterior variance happens to be these. These are, again, very simple formula, very traditional formula. And our goal is to predict theta. And of course, we are going to use the posterior distribution. So guess what? What would be our point predictor? Our point predictor would, of course, be the, uh, you know, the posterior mean, or as, as, as it's mentioned in the frequent, frequentist way of doing things is the blob, the best linear unbiased predictor. That has unknown parameters. You know, mu has beta sitting in it. The Vs have shy sitting in it. So the blob has to be estimated by, by E blob, the empirical best linear unbiased predictor. Again, these are things that everybody knows. Uh, very likely you teach this in your, in your uh, master's programs at least, if not the undergraduate program at various levels. So very standard. Um, normal computations. So this is what people tend to use. Um, so just this gray box on the top of the slide, uh, that's just to recapitulate what's there in the previous slide. So the quantities of interest, just to uh, recollect, happens to be this posterior distribution, with this for a posterior mean, that for a posterior variance. Uh, these are notations that Traditionally, small area people have been using. Uh, so they've defined bi as the variance. Uh, so it's di inverse divided by di inverse plus shy. So that's just the variance of the sampling level divided by the total variance. That just allows them to write the blob and this conditional va uh, variance. So, so the posterior mean and the posterior variance sort of as a linear function of both beta and of B and shy. So it's just a notational convenience. But these are these are traditional notations that are used. These are traditional things that people tend to work with. So we've just have it here. Uh, but again, everything happens to be uh, fairly, fairly routine at this stage. Uh, when I say it's routine, I don't mean it's easy because when you're doing this for uh, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of school zones or even districts, 